writing. Mm. That's me. I left it. I left it yesterday. So do I we know where she is? I don't know. Have you talked to her? Have you talked to Felicia? Oh, okay. Then we'll just get started. Yeah. Oh, here she is. It's been a transplant and automobile. Good morning. Uh, apologies for the delay. I will um, simply say there may be others who come in a little bit uh, later. There were three breaks in the track between Davis and Sacramento. So if you're planning on taking the train between Davis and Sacramento later today, I suggest you call before you go. So uh, Uber, Lyft, cab companies, and everybody we knew in Davis that we called to see if they had left the house yet. Um, we're on alert this morning, so my apologies for being late. Um, uh, as you know, in workshops, we frequently uh, open with uh, statements for the record, so forgive me if I read a little more of this than I normally would. Nice to see you all. Um, good morning. We're now going to begin the workshop regarding the working draft scientific basis report on the phase two update of the 2006 water quality control plan for the San Francisco Bay slash Sacramento hyphen San Joaquin Delta estuary, otherwise known as the 2006 Bay Delta plan. I'm Felicia Marcus, the chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. With me today to my left, our vice chair, Fran Spivey Weber, to her left, Doreen Diadamo, to my immediate right is Tam Dodak, and to my far right, Stephen Moore. Assisting the board are Diane Riddle, manager of the Bay Delta and Hearing Section, Chris Foe, environmental program manager, Matt Holland, chief of the Bay Delta Sacramento unit, Karen Nia, senior water resource control engineer, and Samantha Olson, senior staff attorney. I'm going to 
provide some introductory contextual remarks followed by anything the other members uh, would like to say. And then we're gonna turn it over to staff to provide a healthy overview of the working draft scientific basis report and the board's process related to phase two. And that'll be about an hour just to give folks a sense of time, but it is important for the purpose of this hearing to lay out um, what it is that staff is actually uh, working with. We're then gonna follow with brief comments from the fisheries agencies, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the National Marine Fisheries Service, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and presentations from other parties who requested additional time to speak in advance, and we will then take public comments. If you'd like to make a comment, please fill out one of the blue cards in the back of the room and submit it to the clerk at the front of the room. Depending on the number of the people in the room, I may condense the comments and timing somewhat right now. I think we have the number of folks in the room for a healthy conversation, so I won't have a need to do that, but if uh, other folks uh, file in, uh, we may need to cut down the public comment time as well as the panel time. We do have an overflow room in case all of a sudden people who were stuck on that train or other forms of transportation uh, come into the room. And if we do have elected officials uh, who come to speak, we may, we know of one, but we could have others. We will take them when they come into the room so they can get back to the people's business. Some general announcements. Um, I know some of you can do this very well and have demonstrated your capacity to do so, but I will do it for you today. Um, please take a moment to turn off or mute your cell phones. Uh, even if you already think it's off or muted, I, I suggest that you double check it if you want board member Doduck to respect you, pay any attention to you or laugh at your jokes anytime uh, into the future. Also look around and identify the exits closest uh, to you. Uh, if you hear an emergency sound, assume that it is. Uh, take your stuff and your friends and proceed out uh, down the stairs, not the elevators. We meet uh, at the corner of 10th and J if you want to wait with us to know when to come back. Um, uh, obviously, you can go wherever you want. If you need help, uh, somebody somebody will assist you either in getting out of the building or to help get you to a protected uh, area. Um, the hearing is being webcast and recorded. When speaking, please use the microphone and try and get close enough that you know it's carrying in the room and across the airwaves. I suspect there are a lot of people listening uh, over the webcast and they will be listening over the recording. Uh, so please use the microphone to get so close that it pops, but go ahead and um, speak slowly enough that folks can, uh, can understand you and please state your name and affiliation clearly when you start. All right. Conduct of the workshop. This workshop is being held in accordance with the State Water Board's Notice of Opportunity for Public Comment and Notice of Public Workshop dated October 19th, 2016. The purpose of this workshop is for the State Water Board to receive oral comments on the working draft scientific basis report in support of the phase two update of the 2006 Bay Delta plan. Phase two is focused on new flow requirements for the Sacramento River, its tributaries and east side tributaries to the Delta, changes to Delta outflow requirements, new and modified interior Delta flow requirements, and new cold water habitat protection requirements to reasonably protect fish and wildlife while considering other needs for water. The Working Draft Scientific Basis Report is an initial step in the process to update the Bay Delta Plan as part of Phase 2. The report identifies the science that will be relied upon to consider potential changes to the Bay Delta Plan in phase two, in considering what if any changes to make to the Bay Delta plan, the State Water Board will also evaluate and seriously consider environmental, economic, and other effects of potential changes. There'll be additional opportunities to comment on those matters in the future. This workshop is focused on the scientific basis report, however, and not those other issues. It's not like our formal process for commenting on proposed draft or revised regulations. It is an extra opportunity for early engages to help us draft the draft. 
The scientific basis report was released as a working draft in order to receive early additional scientific input and recommendations from other agencies and the public before the report is submitted for formal peer review in compliance with regulatory requirements that staff will discuss. In addition, the working draft report is being reviewed by the Delta Independent Science Board for their comments. Following this workshop and those comments, a refined version of the scientific basis report will be developed and sent for peer review and further refinement. After all of that, it will be released for further review with the draft environmental document and any proposed changes to the Bay Delta plan sometime next year. So this is an early part of what will be an ongoing process and conversation, and we appreciate your joining us for it. For Matt. The workshop will be informational only. While a quorum of the State Water Board is present, the board will not take formal action at the workshop. There will be no sworn testimony or cross-examination of participants, but the State Water Board and its staff may ask clarifying questions. The State Water Board very much appreciates the input of all of those who will present today and is very interested to hear your comments and to receive your more detailed written comments. However, to ensure a productive and efficient workshop in which all participants have the opportunity to participate, oral comments may be limited to three minutes per speaker unless you already requested more time. More detailed comments, however, can then be submitted in writing by the December 16th comment deadline. We do not have a court reporter for this proceeding. However, this meeting is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website. If parties would like to obtain a copy of this proceeding, they may contact the board's clerk, Janine Townsend, following the conclusion of the proceeding. Thank you again for your participation today. We understand the gravity of this matter and know that our decisions will have far-reaching implications. And we take our role in your input very seriously. Um, before we turn it over to staff, did I feel like I missed something? That we, t we took out the panel. You got, you'll describe the, what the panels will be? I thought I had that in here. Did I? I didn't go through them. We have a few panels. You know who you are. <laughs> There's some with the, from uh, Sac Valley and Sacramento will come first. Um, then we have what? So I can I can maybe Are you go, over go through that, that? Real quickly. Yeah. So after the staff presentation, we're planning to have the fish agencies come up, um, right. the Department of Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Marine Fisheries Service, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service come up for brief comments. Following that group, we're planning to have the Sacramento Valley Water Users and the Water Forum come up for some comments. Um, followed by, um, we also have a brief presentation from Stockton East Water District. Right. And the San Luis Delta Mendota. And San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority, correct. That's right, and we have the Bay Institute for a short but longer than three minute. Yeah, comment. I think um, they're actually just submitting a blue card. Right, but if they want five minutes, I'll put it in sooner so people know and that we're I, all in the... I just had a question on PowerPoints. Right now I've got f a total of four, just wanting to make sure that that's all uh, that, that, we, is, that we're that going to have. That is all of them that we received in advance. If anybody else... We did, yeah, we requested that folks submit, that we sent out a Lyris message last week asking that folks submit them in advance. So hopefully we've gotten everything today. Thank you. Great. Sorry. I remembered it going through the whole thing, but I was, yeah, right. I thought I was going to give a preview of it first, which actually I think is a good idea. So any other members like to speak before we start? Great. I'm looking forward to it. Take it away, Diane. Okay. Thanks for that. Great. Good morning. Again, I am Diane Riddle. I'm the Environmental Program Manager of the Bay Delta and Hearing Section. With me today are Matt Holland, Chris Foe, Karen Nia, and Samantha Olson. They'll all be helping with the presentation today. So first, um, it, I'll go over the staff presentation um, so you know what's to come. First, I will provide an introduction and overview of the phase two planning process, just to orient everyone where we're at in the process. It's been a while since we've had a public meeting on phase two. I want to remind people where we're at and how we got here today. 
then we will, I'll talk a little bit briefly about the report and uh, Matt, Chris and Karen will go into more detail uh, regarding specific issues in the report. Specifically, Matt will talk about the science that was used in the report um, as well as Delta outflows. Uh, Chris will talk about the tributary inflows and Karen will talk about cold water habitat in interior delta flows and then I will swing back around and talk about timeline for next steps. So again, the primary purpose of this workshop is to receive public input on the report. We're very interested in receiving that input. We've put the working draft out early in the process such that we can get that input and uh, refine the product that we're developing before we send it off to peer review. Um, so we're very interested and appreciate all the input that we've, we're going to receive today and that we'll receive by the written comment deadline on December 16th. Again, I'll be pro we also wanted to provide everyone with an overview of the planning process and the report. Um, and again, as Felicia mentioned, we are early in the process. There has been a, a bit of process before today, but there's, there's still much to come. Much of the substance is yet to come. The actual draft regulations and program of implementation and environmental impacts assessment are all yet to come. And there will be public processes in which um, which the public is able to comment on those on those products. So just a little bit of background. Um, I think most are familiar with this already, but just to orient everyone on the Bay Delta plan. The, the Bay Delta plan is, is that. It's a plan that identifies the beneficial uses of water to be protected in the Bay Delta watershed. The water quality objectives that have been developed to protect those beneficial uses and primarily in the Bay Delta plan, those are flow and water quality um, objectives. And the Bay Delta Plan identifies a program of implementation to achieve the objectives. What is it that the board is going to do to implement the objectives? And what is it that other parties should do to implement the objectives? The plan also includes a monitoring and evaluation program to evaluate success and help inform adaptive management and future decisions. So last time we updated the Bay Delta plan was quite a while ago in 1995. So it's, um, it's time, I think, for us to take another look at the plan. We have been looking at it for a while, um, but we're really, I think, in earnest looking at the plan at this point in the process. So, and I'll go over a little bit of the implementation of the Bay Delta Plan just to, just to familiarize folks because we're gonna be talking about this a little bit more in the presentation. So the plan itself, uh, the 1995 plan, which was the last substantive update, we currently have the 2006 Bay Delta Plan, which made minor changes to the 1995 plan, was not self-implementing. Um, instead, it was implemented through Water Right Decision 1641, adopted by the board in 2000. That decision accepted a series of agreements to implement portions of the Bay Delta Plan and primarily assigns responsibility to the Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation for imp implementing water quality objectives in the plan. Since that, the plan was last updated and implemented, um, there have been a series of species declines, and those are the issues that we're really focusing on today. Um, what changes may be needed to the plan to um, address those species declines? So now I'll go a little bit into our updating process of the Bay Delta Plan. We're pursuing a phase process to update the Bay Delta Plan. The first phase of this effort is focused on San Joaquin River flows for the protection of fish and wildlife beneficial uses and Southern Delta salinity for the protection of agricultural beneficial uses. We're referring to that as the phase one process. That's a separate process from phase two, but related with some common elements that I'll go over. The phase two process is a process that we're talking about today and what we're focusing on in phase two again are requirements to reasonably protect fish and wildlife beneficial uses and what the science report identifies are four particular issues including delta outflows, Sacramento and delta east side tributary inflows, 
and cold water habitat to complement those flow requirements as well as interior delta flow requirements. What phase two is looking at is protecting fish and wildlife through their migratory range from the upstream spawning grounds through to the delta and out to the ocean. Some common components between phases one and phase, phase two are a strong emphasis on adaptive management through a vegetative water approach using unimpaired flows. I'll get into that in a little more detail and hope, hopefully address some of the comments we've received to date. Um, integration with non-flow measures. We understand that this isn't all about flow and that non-flow measures and integration of the flow and non-flow or flow non-flow related components is very important. Another common component is encouragement of settlements. There are various efforts underway to come to agreement on how to implement the Bay Delta Plan. The board is very interested in um, robust and protective agreements. Um, and also, as with all of the Bay Delta planning processes, the board will need to consider balancing in both phase one and two processes, looking at protection of the beneficial use in the context of other competing uses of water. So this is just a um, depiction of the phase two project area. It's a fairly large area, so it doesn't depict the upstream areas. Chris will have a map, a map later in his presentation that provides um, a map of the tributary areas. But again, just to show this, we're talking from the upstream tributaries out again to the ocean. So I'll go over, just to provide some background on how we got here today, um, uh, the previous events have informed phase two. So again, the last time we've updated the Bay Delta plan was in 2006. At that time, we didn't make any significant changes to the plan. However, we did identify um, the fishery declines in the Delta, particularly the pelagic organism decline, and since then there have been other fishery declines that have been identified that require review. We then, as a result of the direction provided in the 2006 plan, conducted what it, we refer to as a periodic review of the Bay Delta plan, in which we look at the plan, we look at the science, we, tr we determine what issues should we be focusing on as potential updates in the plan. That 2009 uh, report identified delta outflows, interior delta flows, and related requirements that should be considered for a potential update. Uh, also in 2009, um, the, water action, the Water Action Plan, um, or the Delta Reform Act, was adopted, and um, which directed the board to update the Bay Delta Plan to help achieve the co-equal goals identified of Delta ecosystem protection and a reliable water supply. Following that, as part of the Delta Reform Act, the board was directed to prepare a report on the flow needs of fish and wildlife if fish and wildlife were the primary purpose for which um, flows were being developed. The board adopted what is called the 2010 Delta Flow Criteria Report. One of the major findings in that report is that while there isn't perfect understanding about flow needs and the mechanistic relationships between, behind those flow needs, there is sufficient scientific information to support the need for increased flows to protect public trust resources. Also informing the phase two process, we've had two notices of preparation. The more significant, more focused notice of preparation was the 2012 notice of preparation. We have reviewed the comments on that and we are incorporating them into the process. It has been some time, but they certainly are informing the process as are a series of workshops that occurred in 2012, 13, and 14. Um, that the board held and the Delta Science Program held. Matt will go into those in a little more detail. So I'll just, so now that I've talked about um, how we got here, I'll talk a little bit about where we're going. I'll talk timeline at the close of the presentation. So um, again, what we've released is a working draft uh, scientific basis report. We uh, plan to update that report based on the public comments that we receive here today and the written public comments that we receive on the report. We're also conducting a review with the Delta Independent Science Board. We intend to incorporate and address those comments in a revised draft of the report. That revised draft 
will then be submitted for peer review pursuant to the requirements of the public health and safety code that requires the board to have the scientific portions of rules that it considers reviewed by an independent uh, blind peer, through an independent blind peer review process. So after we, we receive the um, comments from that blind peer review, we will then update the report again. That version of the report will then be included in with the draft substitute environmental document or staff report. Um, we're still looking at exactly how to organize our products in a, in a way that's the most logical and helpful um, that we'll release for public comment once again. So folks can comment here today and then in the context of the draft regulations, which I think will be very helpful for folks, the next version of the report um, that's that the public sees will have those draft objectives, the program of implementation. They'll have the opportunity to comment on the whole package, those objectives uh, and the science and the, envir the draft environmental impacts assessment. So we'll put that out for public comment, then we'll produce another version of the report, what we hope will be the final version of the report, um, with proposed changes to the Bay Delta plan. That package will then be brought to the board for um, consideration uh, to adopt the Bay Delta plan changes and certify the environmental document. So now that I've talked about the process, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the purpose and needs for the update. Matt and Chris and Karen will get into the science a little bit more, but just I wanna provide some overarching comments about um, why we're conducting this update. So again, as I stated earlier, the Bay Delta ecosystem is in a state of crisis and the board is looking at what are the obligations it has to establish water quality objectives to address those ecosystem concerns. Specifically, as I also mentioned, there haven't been recovery of fish species since we last um, significantly updated the Bay Delta Plan. That's not to say it's the cause of the Bay Delta Plan, but it may indicate that the Bay Delta Plan may need to be uh, reevaluated. So um, again, the existing regulations, we'll get into this in a little more detail, are, are not protective based on the science, um, even or comprehensive. Again, that gets to the issue of protecting the fish throughout their migratory corridor from the upstream spawning areas out to the sea and also on a temporal scale throughout the year. A fish, you know, if it dies at one point of the year, or it's, you know, it's lost for the entire year. So we really need to focus on the entire year and all of the areas where that fish resides. So again, getting at the existing delta outflow requirements. Um, as pointed out in the science report, um, there have been significant reductions in delta outflows. Um, on average, January through June, outflows have been reduced by approximately 60% mean annual inflows by approximately 48%, and at times on a monthly basis, delta outflows have been reduced by more than 80%. And as Matt will show you in, in the next few, uh, in his presentation, the existing regulations are actually far below the existing delta outflow because there's quite a bit of uncontrolled delta outflow that results, it's not a result of regulatory requirements, but it instead is a result of the fact that it's, it can't be captured or there's no need for the water now. Over time, um, it's possible and likely that there will be additional water development and that as a result, the, the difference between the existing regulations and the actual outflow will diminish and we'll actually see a reduction in delta outflows. So even to maintain the existing level of outflow that we see today, in a regulatory sense would require changes to the Bay Delta plan. That's not, and then there are issues with respect to whether we need more than what we see today. Um, the other finding in the report is that existing inflows are inadequate. On some of the tributaries to the Delta, inflows are reduced by 100% at times of year. Those are things we think if fish are residing in these tributaries, they may need to make it through the system. We need to have a comprehensive framework that addresses those flows as fish move through the system. Further, even though some tributaries may have adequate flows, 
they may not be regulated, in which case, you know, and again, as with the Delta outflow situation, in order to ensure that those, fit, those flows are maintained through time in the face of additional water development in the future, regulations are needed to ensure those flows occur. Uh, further, with the new inflow and outflow requirements, there's a need to ensure that there's adequate water maintained for cold water needs for salmonids and other species, particularly water in storage or the other measures are provided to provide passage for fish. Um, we understand that with increasing um, requirements for uh, environmental flows that the strain on the available water supply is is increased and that if we're to protect those cold water resources, we're gonna need to look at regulations to protect them. Um, we understand that they're very, it's a very complex system. There are a lot of individual needs within the watersheds. So we're really just looking at a narrative requirement there. Further, again, in keeping with this, um, this theme of protecting fish from their native spawning grounds through to the ocean, Another issue that needs to be addressed is the entrainment effects in the interior delta. So I, I wanna talk a little bit about why it is that we're focusing on flow. Um, so again, as Matt and, and, and Chris and Karen will point out, scientific studies, there is a convincing and large body of scientific information that shows that flow is a major factor in the survival of, of aquatic organisms. There are many benefits to flow, um, including improved growth and survival of native aquatic species, improved migration, water temperatures, improved habitat conditions, um, that all of these reduce the risk of disease, predation, um, and improve success of fish as they, as they, their survival as well as their um, health. The other issue is that the board has the primary authority over water quality and flow issues. Um, other agencies have authority over some of these issues, but it's really within the board's primary authority to address the flow and water quality issues. We recognize uh, uh, that other actions are also needed and that these flow actions need to be incorporated with those other actions and the board is um, has and we're proposing in the scientific basis report to work very closely with and use all of our authorities to ensure that those non-flow actions and also to consider the flow actions that we're taking in the context of those non-flow actions. So I think I've kind of led up to this point that the sort of thesis statement for the scientific basis report and the regulatory approach that we're recommending is a comprehensive approach to protect fish throughout their migratory range and throughout the year when fish are residing in the system in a way that integrates inflows, outflows, interior delta flows, and the cold water pool, having all of those all of those requirements working together in a comprehensive framework that informs other actions. The other issue, uh, the other Diane, approach that we're recommending. Uh, just a quick point, the question, this is interesting because one of the things coming into this that I think um, folks who are new to it find is that we end up with a hodgepodge of different requirements. So this also has the advantage, not just of a comprehensive approach, but incorporating all facets so that people actually have a, a roadmap or a sense of the whole, which can allow for really looking at the life cycle and the survival of the fish versus one lever at a time, which I, I see that as a benefit to the update. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think the other issue that we're trying to address is when we establish requirements, the there may be redirected impacts at other times of year that we haven't anticipated and trying to plug all of those holes so that we have a comprehensive framework that protects the fish and wildlife and looks at all those factors. Also with respect to balancing, understanding that you know there are other factors that need to be balanced and that this, from a balancing perspective and a protection perspective, all of those issues need to be looked at together and that's what we're proposing. And, and I, I just wanted to jump in here because I think the, particularly the second bullet, um, in, in terms of flexibility, uh, it, it has been a long time, I mean, tw have, what, 21 years or 
a long time since we last updated this report it, uh, comprehensively. And um, we can't do that in the future because there are going to be a lot of changes happening more quickly than every 21 years or 25 years, depending on when you think this will actually end. But um, so I'm assuming that there is some, that within that flexibility term, there is the ability to make tweaks where needed if the hydrology changes significantly. Right, that's actually a very good point. We recognize that waiting 21 years in the future and having a very stagnant Bay Delta plan that can only be changed through a two-step laborious process is not feasible moving forward if we're gonna protect fish and wildlife and address the effects of climate change, that we need something that's more flexible, more adaptable. Also, just the scale of the phase two project we know that there are individual needs within watersheds that we're gonna have to look at and we're gonna have to be flexible in looking at those issues. Further, we know that there are these efforts to come to agreements and that there will be some incorporation with non-flow measures. So we're trying to set up the phase two process in a framework that allows for all of those different issues to be, to be addressed, but to be addressed in a timely manner so that the fish and wildlife that we're trying to protect are, don't go extinct during the time period in which we're working on these issues. Also, um, just understanding that we know that there's more science that will and needs to continue to be developed and having a feedback loop and a regulatory structure that allows us to fold that in as new information becomes available, as changes in the environment with restoration activities or climate change take place, that we've got a structure that allows us to address those. Right, and we'll, we'll get into more detail in that in the plan update. Um, and any settlement. Right, and the, you know, the details will come with the objectives and program of implementation. It sounds like a panacea. We'll try to make it as much of one as we can. We know there you know, are limitations to that, but we're trying to do the best we can at hitting these marks. Oops. So now I'll talk a little bit about the specific um, recommendations included in the scientific basis report. Again, as I pointed out, what we're really trying to emphasize is that inflows and outflows need to work together. Um, and we're looking at, for as far as inflow goes, we're again, similar to phase one process, we're looking at unimpaired flows. But really what we mean by unimpaired flows is a budget of water approach that's developed based on the actual hydrology that's occurring at the time. So a, an approach that is inherently responsive to changes in, in climate and the natural variability of hydrology for purposes of, you know, managing managing water supply and balancing uses. Be, while we're recommending a percent of unimpaired flow, the percent of unimpaired flow can incorporate a, in this budget of water approach with the flexibility we're intending to provide can, um, can encompass functional flows and is intended to encompass functional flows. We are intending to shape and mold these flows in a way to provide the functions to protect fish and wildlife. So with respect to delta outflow, we're looking at a, something, a compatible approach with the unimpaired flow approach, which is actually the existing approach for delta outflow, an index of um, unimpaired flow, which again is used now. We're looking at what tweaks can we make to that index to pair it with an unimpaired flow so that you have the two talking together and you don't have inconsistent regulatory requirements. The range that we're considering um, is from 35%, which is on the low end um, about existing uh, flow conditions um, in drier periods, to 75% of unimpaired flow, which is which was the um, amount that was identified in the Delta Flow Criteria Report to fully protect fish and wildlife beneficial uses. Um, and again, pairing the unimpaired inflows with an equivalent uh, delta outflow index. And I think I went through the adaptive management measures. Um, again, that adaptive management, the adaptive management we're proposing would be to provide for the flows that fish actually need, um, accommodate experiments and changing circumstances. 
And again, I think I went over this this um, before, um, having a cold water habitat requirement. We're really, ag again, looking at a narrative requirement so that we're not, so that we can shape those requirements on a tributary by tributary basis to address the specific needs of each watershed as far as cold water goes. Um, to, and to, so there's a twofold reason for the cold water habitat requirement. One is to address existing issues with cold water management, and the other is to avoid redirected impacts from our inflow and outflow requirements. And again, um, pairing all of this with an interior delta flow requirement to provide complete protection of fish and wildlife through their migratory range. Oh, I make one more point on the interior delta flows. What we're really looking at is um, requirements are very similar to those that are included in Endangered Species Act biological opinion requirements. I just wanted to know we're not proposing to be inconsistent with those biological opinions, but again, the board has an independent authority to protect fish and wildlife beneficial uses and has specific authority over flow and water quality and water rights issues for which this issue pertains. So um, we're proposing that the board incorporates some of those requirements in our regulatory approach. So I think I've spoken to this a little bit, but we recognize and know that it, this is a big task before us and that will require us working very closely with all of the watershed groups who have specific knowledge and have creative solutions um, to addressing the various ecosystem concerns. Um, the report discusses and, and stresses those relationships. Um, the report also talks about the other stressors and how we intend to work with others. The report doesn't go into a significant amount of detail about those other stressors um, because that isn't the emphasis of the regulatory approach. However, those issues will be discussed in more detail in the forthcoming program of implementation. Again, um, the report indicates, and I think the board has made very clear, that we're committed to collaborating with others on, on measures to protect fish and wildlife, science, and restoration efforts. And I think, as I mentioned before, again, um, we're really looking seriously at encouraging meaningful and effective uh, voluntary agreements to create more durable benefits in the short and long term. We understand that something that the creative solutions that the stakeholders have have the potential to be more effective than the regulations that we alone can adopt. So just to, just briefly, the scientific basis report includes five chapters. Um, there's the chapter one is the introductory chapter. It's a summary of the findings of the report. Chapter two focuses on the hydrology. It provides an analysis of the uh, modifications to the hydrology um, compared to unimpaired flow conditions. This chapter specifically we're planning to refine further um, in the next draft of the report. Chapter three uh, talks about the science regarding flow and the ecosystem and includes specific species analyses as they relate to flow, survival, and um, abundance relationships as it relates to flow. Um, chapter four talks about those other ecosystem stressors, contaminants, um, predation, and other issues that we also know are very important. Um, and chapter five discusses the potential modifications to the Bay Delta plan. So with that, that completes um, my brief, my overview. I'm not going to say it's brief. Um, now I'll turn it over uh, to Matt to talk about the science we used in the report and Delta outflows. Thank you, Diane. Uh, I'm Matt Holland, the chief of the Bay Delta Sacramento unit. And I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the various scientific proceedings that have informed uh, the phase two process up to this point. Uh, I think Diane covered pretty well the 2009 periodic review and the 2010 Delta Flow Criteria Report, so I'm going to move on to um, talk a little bit about the State Water Board workshops that were held in the fall of 2012. So there were three workshops held, and the first two of them focused on the low salinity zone um, and how the ecosystem has changed over time 
and Bay Delta fisheries resources more generally. And the third workshop uh, focused on analytical tools for evaluating water supply uh, and other effects in the Bay Delta plan. Uh, the, the first two workshops are really the, the main ones that have uh, influenced this report. Um, the third one uh, was considered a lot in the development of our SACWAM, our Sacramento Water Allocation Model that uh, is, has been developed through a parallel process and will be used in our environmental analysis. Uh, and it, of course, will uh, influence other analyses that we do in, in the set. Uh, following on after those uh, workshops in 2012, those were, and those were technical workshops held before the board, um, the Delta Science Program recommended that we take a closer look at a few um, kind of high priority issues and uh, so three additional workshops were held. Um, the fish predation workshop on Central Valley Salmonids was held um, mainly in response to a request from the Department of Fish and Wildlife um, to sort out how they were gonna deal with a, a settlement that they had, um, but we were also involved in that. Uh, and then finally, the Delta outflows and related stressors workshops and the interior Delta flow and related stressors workshops were held to specifically inform the phase two process. Uh, and I, I really wanna emphasize how much we appreciate the assistance of the Delta Science Program and lead scientists Peter Goodwin and Cliff Dom in uh, running all these processes. Uh, and also all of the great input that we've received from agency staff, from the public, and uh, from the independent panel reviewers. So building on, on those uh, proceedings, the kind of scientific information that we use to inform flow recommendations really fall into three general categories. First of all, where we could, we tried to look at ecological function-based analysis of uh, desirable species and ecosystem processes. So this includes things like physical responses to flow, floodplain inund inundation, water quality, uh, and other geomorphic processes. And it also includes how fish respond to flow. So fish cue their migrations uh, according to flow events that occur during the year. They use flows physically to move around the system. Um, and you know they respond to habitat uh, that is influenced by flow. Uh, we also used more general knowledge of species characteristics and community ecology. And this goes beyond the Bay Delta uh, proper to uh, include an understanding of kind of how estuaries work. Um, final, uh, next, we used statistical relationships between flow and species abundance or migration success. And you know these are analyses that get criticized because they don't necessarily demonstrate causation. But in a complex system such as the Bay Delta or any, any large ecological system, uh, sometimes you have to use empirical data to manage. And that, that's what we're doing here. Um, finally, we used information on unimpaired flows and historical impaired flows that better supported native species. And this really reflects the premise that the species, our native species evolved under a natural flow regime. And unimpaired flows, although they're an imperfect reflection of the natural flow regime, they give a general reflection of the magnitude and timing of flows that would have naturally occurred and the flows that the life history processes of these fish have evolved to take advantage of. Um, however, we're mindful of the fact that uh, the landscape has changed, the ecosystem has changed over the last 150 years due to human influence. And so recent historical flows that have better supported fish populations are also a useful guide. Um, and all of this analysis is supported by the most current science that we're aware of and um, contains references to the literature and also updated statistical analyses performed by staff. So now with that uh, discussed, I'm gonna go on to um, discuss our Delta outflow recommendations. And I'd like to start by kind of orienting everybody to the Western Delta and Sassoon region, because this is the area at the, at the core of Delta outflow issues. Um, then I'm gonna discuss the estuarine species declines that we've seen over the past 50 years. Um, I'm gonna discuss how Delta outflow affects salinity. And I'm, then I'm gonna discuss the native species responses to Delta outflow and salinity and go on to tell you a bit more about the um, existing outflow conditions and requirements and Delta outflow recommendations that we're making in the report. So 
so um, this region, the Western Delta and Sassoon, is really important to understand if you want to understand how the estuarine species respond to delta outflow. Um, it's, it's made up of two general regions, Western Delta, which is characterized by deep confined channels, and it's not really very good habitat for native fish. And there's the Sassoon region, uh, which has sort of more shallow habitat, more variable um, habitat where wind resuspends turbidity and inflows suspend turbidity, sediments that create turbidity. And there's a lot more variable habitats connected to productive tidal marsh, and it's a, it's a good place to be a native fish. And I also really want to emphasize that um, estuarine habitat is made up of uh, two general kinds of physical uh, attributes. So there's stationary attributes, such as the configuration of the channels and the shoals and the connections to tidal marsh. And there are moving attributes like flow and water quality. So it's really the alignment of these stationary and moving attributes that make the habitat that fish need. So now I'd like to kind of go over some of the um, species declines that we've seen over the last 50 years. Um, we've all heard about long fin smelt and delta smelt. Uh, both of these species uh, have protections under federal and state endangered species acts, and both have declined by at least a hundredfold um, over the period of sampling. Uh, and you know, depending on how you, you know, if you compare the peak uh, abundance indices to the lowest abundance indices seen during the latest drought, it's more than a hundredfold. Uh, these species are in really serious seriously bad shape and they're they're potentially on the brink of extinction and it's vital that we do something to protect them. Uh, additionally, uh, Sacramento split tail and starry flounder have seen declines over the past several years. Um, these are also species that are dependent on the estuary. They're both native species. Um, Sacramento split tail, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about both of these species in a little bit more detail later. But in addition to these species, uh, I want to point out that there are other species that depend on the estuary. Native species um, such as Chinook salmon and steelhead rear in the estuary during their outmigration. Sturgeon, of course, spend a lot of time uh, as juveniles rearing in the estuary. And so although we're focused in this, pre in this part of the presentation on the species that tend to kind of reside more in the estuary, um, you need to keep in mind that there are other species that depend on good habitat in this, this region as well. So, so now I'm going to discuss a little bit more about how delta outflow affects salinity. And in order to discuss this um, and in order to understand some of the uh, results that are going to come later on, um, we need to understand this quantity X2. So X2 is the distance uh, from the Golden Gate to the location in the estuary where the salinity is two practical salinity units. More outflow pushes X2 further downstream, and so a higher outflow is associated with a shorter distance from the Golden Gate to X2, so it's a lower number. And this is an index of the estuary's response to freshwater flow. In the Bay Delta plan, we include three control points uh, for X2 at Collinsville, Chips Island, and Port Chicago. And so now in the next few slides, I'm going to um, kind of quickly show you some visual representations of where is the low salinity habitat that a lot of these fish depend on at various points in their life cycles uh, at different X2 locations. So the first location is not one of our control points, but it's a location where X2 uh, tends to be located uh, when the uh, February through June requirements are not controlling. And this is Antioch at 85 kilometers. And what you see here is you should be looking at the dark to light blue um, regions. So that uh, represents salinities between 6 and 0, um, well, 0, 0 0.5 uh, practical salinity units. Um, and when X2 is at Antioch, all that habitat is pretty much confined to those deep channels of the western delta. These are not very good conditions for native fish. Now, when we get down to Collinsville at 81 kilometers, 
um, low salinity habitat is starting to kind of intrude into Sassoon Bay. Um, and so we're getting somewhat better conditions for fish. And this is in the plan uh, what we require almost all the time during the February through June period. As we move a little further downstream, when we get to X2 of 75 kilometers, the next control point at Chips Island, um, there's a substantially greater uh, fraction of low salinity habitat in Sassoon Bay, um, and these are better conditions for native fish. And then finally, when we get down to 64 kilometers at Port Chicago, Sassoon Bay is essentially entirely uh, in low salinity or fresh uh, habitat, and this is, these are really good conditions for native fish. And of course, higher outflows can push X2 past Carquina Strait into San Pablo Bay. Uh, we don't have any regulations that require that that ever occur, but when it does, there can potentially be very good low salinity zone habitat in San Pablo Bay. So, um, Uh, so now I'd like to go on uh, to talk a little bit more about how native species respond to delta outflow in X2. And um, the discussion of the low salinity zone habitat and how it moves around in response to outflow uh, is kind of a thumbnail sketch of, of some of the information that's in the report in the flow in the ecosystem section um, that sort of demonstrates the importance of the relationship between stationary and moving habitat and how the community as, you know, on a broad scale responds to delta outflow um, and points out that this is a general feature of estuaries worldwide. Um, and this has to do with a lot of physical processes that, you know, we have varying degrees of understanding of the details of, but they're general to estuaries in that, um, you know, there, there's spatial variability in where the good habitat is and uh, the physical flows provide migration and transport flows. And in the case of the Bay Delta, they also position the low salinity zone away from export influence. Um, and so now I'm gonna go on to discuss um, how the, the, fish, the flow fish relationships that indicate uh, how delta outflows can support native estuarine species. So, um, Longfin smelt increase with delta outflow. They have a very strong uh, flow abundance relationship and they respond uh, primarily to flows uh, in the winter spring period. So this is a plot that shows uh, the response of the fall midwater trawl index of longfin smelt to January through June delta outflow. Um, the black dots and line show the pre-clam uh, period and the red dots and line show the post-clam period, so after corbula came in, um, the relationship dropped uh, in intercept, but it still has the same slope. The precise mechanism of this uh, relationship is uncertain, but it's likely related to the quantity and quality of spawning habitat in tidal char channels. Oh, why, why there's the relationship at all? Do you want to explain why the invasion of Corvula influenced it at all? Just well, we'll it's have a lot of interested people who aren't already steeped in the science, and they're gonna. That's the question they're gonna wonder. So it it primarily, most likely, has to do with changes in the food web. So corbula graze heavily on uh, anything that they can filter, um, and so they so that means they they eat a lot of phytoplankton. It also means they eat a lot of uh, smaller uh, protozoans and uh, smaller zooplankton. So uh, when there are a lot of clams in the regions where uh, phytoplankton blooms might get started, they can cause a major disruption to the food web. So to the degree that we can think of creative things that can be done to deal with clams, um, that could be a benefit to longfin smelt. This is about an order of magnitude or a factor of 10 reduction in uh, the abundance of longfin that's accounted for by clams. I'm just remembering the workshops, so. Thank you. Um, moving on to delta smelt. Now, delta smelt um, is a more complicated um, story. Uh, up until the last decade or so, there wasn't really any known response to spring outflows for delta smelt. 
but it appears in the last decade that there are and that there is a response and that's in the bottom panel before I say too much more I want to point out that the these plots are shown in terms of x2 rather than delta outflow so that arrow to the left at the bottom is showing you that you should be looking to the left for more delta outflow so where those lines are higher at the left at low x2 that's more delta outflow um, the top panel shows um, the response of uh, delta smelt to fall low salinity habitat in Sassoon Bay. Uh, and essentially the story is that uh, sub-adults uh, maturing uh, before they spawn do better if they have low salinity habitat in Sassoon Bay, and that occurs during the fall. Um, but, you know, if you, uh, if you look closely at what's going on with Delta Smelt, what you find is that they really seem to require favorable years, favorable conditions year round. And this has led to the oft quoted statement, it takes a year to make a smelt. Um, they're, they're possibly the most sensitive species uh, that hasn't gone extinct yet in the system, as far as we know. And uh, so they, they need favorable conditions whenever they can get them. Sacramento split tail is a little bit of a clearer story. So Sacramento split tail spawn on flooded terrestrial plants. And so floodplain habitat is the main uh, mechanism for, for this relationship. Uh, they, they do best when they get 30 days or more of uh, floodplain inundation. And in the current configuration of the system, this primarily happens in the yellow bypass. And so one of the proposed actions um, by other parties uh, to improve uh, the lot of split tail is to increase the frequency of flooding of the yellow bypass by allowing it to flood at lower flows. Finally, uh, starry flounder um, is a species that spawns in the coastal ocean and rears in the estuary. And so they actually use the currents, the landward currents that are generated by higher outflows to migrate into the estuary and rear. Um, they have also undergone a step decline since the uh, introduction of corpula. So this is just kind of to summarize, you know, we saw the slide before, but we have a robust body of science that shows that freshwater flow drives in, uh, freshwater inflow drives estuary function, um, supports uh, the habitat and function of the estuary, and supports native estuarine species. So now let's talk about what's going on with uh, outflow. Uh, this plot is in terms of X2, and it's an exceedance curve, which I know isn't necessarily uh, intuitive to everybody, so I'm going to take some time to walk through it. Um, so what percent exceedance means is how frequently is a value exceeded. So how, how frequently, if you look at the green line and you look at point A uh, on that green line, that green line represents what would be the distribution of X2 positions throughout the year over the period from 1921 to 2003 if unimpaired flows were observed. And what that green point says is that 50% of the time, X2 would be downstream of 71 kilometers or so. And 50% of the time, X2 would be upstream of 71 kilometers or so. So that's the, you know, the median uh, value of X2. If you move up that line to, say, uh, to the green line to the 80% location, that means that X2 would be downstream of about Martinez, around 54 kilometers or so, 20% of the time, okay? So what this is showing, the green line, as I mentioned, is what the distribution of X2 would be under unimpaired conditions over a historical record. Whereas the dark red and the gray lines, which are which sort of coincide, so they can be hard to tell apart, um, represent earlier impaired conditions. So the gray line is 1949 to 1968, and the dark red line is 1969 to 1985. And what you see is that that, that line has moved up uh, and to the right a little bit. And, and that, that means that X2 is more frequently further upstream. 
and the, the fact that that line has um, kind of has a bend in it actually means that the variability has reduced. Um, and I don't want to get into explaining exactly why that's true, but it, it's true. Um, if you if you look to the right on the line that connects points A and C, uh, you see that in that those earlier historical periods, X2 sp spent half the time downstream of about Chips Island and upstream of about Chips Island. Whereas if you go all the way to the right on at point C, which is um, showing re more recent conditions, half the time X2 is downstream or upstream of about Collinsville. Uh, and if you take, you go back to point A and then read up to point B, uh, you find that under existing conditions, X2 is about 20% of the time uh, downstream of the location where it was at 71 kilometers, where it was downstream of that location 50% of the time in the unimpaired case, and about a, uh, two third, or sorry, about a third of the time it was uh, downstream of that location in the earlier, um, earlier impaired conditions. So this is, this is a complicated picture, but basically what it's showing you is as water development has increased, X2 has moved further upstream. It's, it's distributed further upstream more frequently, and it's less variable. And it's not in the right place. Right. Have, this, have. Yeah, it's not in the right place uh, to benefit native fish. So, um, so this slide really just kind of summarizes what are the existing delta outflow requirements. Uh, in, in the 2006 Bay Delta Plan and Decision 1641, the requirements during July and December are formulated as a minimum net delta outflow uh, that's determined by water year type. Uh, during January through June, um, it's a minimum net delta outflow that's uh, common essentially to all years, except that um, in wetter years, in wetter months, um, there are additional delta outflows required. Uh, and this is, um, in February through June, this is the X2 uh, requirement that's in Table 4 of the Bay Delta Plan. In, June, in January, it's just a, there's just a, like one incremental step um, where the required outflow increases if the Eight River Index for the previous month is um, a little higher than usual. And um, this, these outflows are determined by the previous month's Eight River Index, which is really just a measure of unimpaired inflow to the delta. Um, finally, yeah. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biological opinion uh, contains what's known as the Fall X2 requirement that basically requires that following a wet year or an above normal year, X2 be maintained downstream of Chips Island following a wet year or Collinsville following an above normal year. And then in November, inflows to Sacramento Basin reservoirs of the two projects be bypassed up to that September, October requirement. So this is another um, exceedance plot, and we're... These were the ones I had trouble with. Right. And we are running a little long, so I'd, I'm going to try to wrap this up sooner rather than later. But I do want to take some time to explain how do these exceedance plots work. And this, this, is a, this could be a particularly confounding one. So um, what this shows is over the February through June period, when the X2 requirement uh, in the Bay Delta plan is operating, um, how does CalSim model the existing flows and the required flows for delta outflow? And so this, the black line shows what CalSim models as the existing outflow that would occur in each of those months. Um, and it's a, again, it's an, an exceedance frequency distribution. And so uh, there aren't any, there's not a grid on here, but if you kind of eyeball, you go to 20% and scan up, you're somewhere between 40 and 60,000 CFS. And so let's call that 50,000 CFS 20% of the time as an average for February through June. So what that's saying is that, you know, under the 20% wettest conditions, you've got more than 50,000 CFS flowing out. And recall, uh, I actually, when I went over those X2 delta outflow plots, I neglected to mention the outflow rates in cubic feet per second that um, correspond approximately to those. But the furthest downstream point at Port Chicago 
it corresponds to approximately 29,000 CFS. So, so, oh. um, so this is a much higher flow than we ever require, 20, occurring 20% of the time. Um, now, if you go down to that orange line, that orange line, um, which is the minimum required delta outflow, this is what CalSIM says is needed to meet the objectives of the Bay Delta plan, uh, including uh, the objectives to protect fish and the uh, salinity control for agricultural, municipal, and industrial uses. And the main thing that pops out is that that line is way lower than the black line. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this isn't to say necessarily that conditions are completely uncontrolled during that time. There's a lot of uncontrolled outflow that's occurring, but it, it can also be because other uh, operations are governing, uh, other requirements are governing operations. So for example, export limits may be governing op or operations, but it also can be that there's just not enough capacity to capture these high flows. And so we need to be wary of what happens in the future with additional water development. Um, so this black line might start moving down more towards the orange line. Right, so as it has. Yeah, as it has. 20 years. No. Right. Oops. Uh-oh. There we go. Which actually it. brings us to the next slide, where I added the um, historical data on. Mm -hmm. And so the blue line shows what was going on average conditions over this period from 1956 to 1999. And you see the blue line is above the black line. The red line, which represents 2000 to 2015, is below the black line. And that's not because that's, well, to some degree, it, it reflects the TUCPs. But, um, but it also reflects the fact that it's just been a dry hydrology. And so we haven't really sampled the conditions that are sampled on the black line over the last 15 years, 16 years. Um, Oh, God. All right. So now going on to September and October, um, this, um, this is when the Fall X2 requirement is operating. And the main thing to take away from this is that basically we operate very close to the line. Whatever the requirement is in this period, that's how much outflow there's going to be. And if you look at the historical data, that's borne out relatively well. We've moved down from the historical um, condition to where we are now. Um, and the red line shows that over the last 16 years, we haven't quite been up to that black line. But again, that's not because objectives haven't been complied with. It's because the um, Fall X2 requirement wasn't in effect during most of that period. Uh, and also, there just haven't been a lot of wet years. So it's hydrology, could be some other regulations, but also the fact that um, but there are just more diversions upstream in the delta as we have more and more right. people. Water development has water increased development, over time. Refuge development, yeah. Diver just more diversions. And and also the groundwater uh, pumping uh, close to a surface. Right, all of those things. And uh, additionally, the projects um, have been reoperated in response to <laughs> changes in the requirements. Uh, so that that has influenced how the water is distributed throughout the year. Also, just uh, to avoid confusion, you're going quickly, but the scale on the y-axis was different. So the MRDO looks more exaggerated here, but if you go back, it's because the scale on the y-axis has changed. Yes, that's that's correct. Um, these plots were made independently, and I didn't I didn't scale the axes the same. When you look back to 56, is that just because that's the record available? Um, I often like to look. I'll be interested in looking at the historic record when key changes in um, in development of state water project, Central Valley project happened, uh, and group uh, group the data that way according to major management changes. Sure, I appreciate that, and we will keep that in mind. Yeah, the reason that it goes back to 1956 is that's the standard day flow data set. Although there is. Um, a data set that was extended back to at least 1930, I believe, maybe 1920. So this is my last slide, thankfully. Um, and so I just want to wrap up by, uh, by telling you what the outflow recommendations are that we made in the report. 
So we recommended a numeric range um, for January, June, um, based on the Eight River Index. And it, the, the range that we intend to present to the board for consideration corresponds to the 35 to 75% of unimpaired inflow range that Chris will talk about in a little bit and that Diane mentioned. We also recommend uh, considering a fall X2 uh, requirement that's consistent with the 2008 U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service bio biological opinion and possibly considering uh, summer outflow increases to benefit Delta smelt. Um, as Diane mentioned, uh, adaptive management is really important to the way all of this works because we want to build a plan that contains the flexibility to respond to new information as it comes in and that allows the inflow uh, and outflow requirements to work together with each other. So whatever flow shaping and seasonal shifting is needed in the, inf in the management of the inflow requirement will have to be accommodated in the outflow requirement. And of course, we're still working out exactly how to express that in a regulatory framework. Um, but that, when that's released, it should make the conversation um, more focused. Right, and, and hopefully people are also making suggestions as to how to do that throughout this process. I, a yeah. prize for whoever comes out. With oh, the yes. <laughs> Certainly. Absolutely. And, and um, I often think just as a you know, water or wastewater systems engineer and how engineered the river system is, how when we talk about things like flow shaping and functional flows, we we're, let's be honest with ourselves and think about what kind of real-time triggers we can build in. That, that have widespread support uh, among the various disciplines of operators and, and fishery biologists, where we're really setting up a system. And I guess the question was be, can we structure this in a way that allows triggers that, that stakeholders develop for, say, that may be based on turbidity and, and flow triggers to do certain actions that enhance habitat investments that we've made uh, strategically through the whole watershed? Sure, I think, and I think that that's um, that's kind of part of the long game in, in the in the planning. That's that's part of why we're trying to maintain flexibility in this planning stage, so that we have the ability to use new information as it's developed, new decision support tools as they're developed, um, and and actually have a fighting chance of truly doing adaptive management. So with that, unless there are any other questions on Delta Outflow uh, from the board, um, I'd like to hand it off to Chris to talk about tributary inflow. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, my name is Chris Foe. I want to talk about tributary inflows. Um, as an outline, I'm going to start by talking about the phase two project area and its tributaries. I'm then going to discuss how the natural production of salmonids have declined and that some runs may be on the verge of extinction. Then I'm going to discuss what kind of inflows are needed year round for the migration and rearing of anadromous fish species in the delta and its tributaries. That would mostly be salmon and steelhead. And also to contribute to delta outflow to protect estuarine species. I'll then discuss existing inflow conditions and requirements and end up with some inflow recommendations. These are the tributaries in the phase two project area. The staff report recommends uh, increased flows on salmon bearing tributaries in the Sacramento Basin and also on the three east side delta rivers. That would be the McCollumy, Consumnes, and um, uh, Calaveras rivers. Next, um, the, the natural production of Chinook salmon in the Sacramento Basin is in serious decline, and a number of these species really are on the verge of extinction. Uh, decreases in average natural production between 1967 and 1991, those are the base years, and 1992 and 2011. For winter run, salmon are 88%. For spring run, they've declined by 60%. Late fall run they declined by 48% and fall run have declined by 37%. Now the natural production of steelhead have declined by 90% between 1960 and 1998, 2000. 
the commercial and recreational catch of salmon now is mostly being supported by hatchery production. Year-round functional flows are needed to provide adult attraction flows, passage for passage, holding, rearing, and spawning. For juvenile rearing and outmigration, this would be incubation, feeding, growth, multiplication, passage, and survival. And finally, um, increased outflow is needed for successful rearing and immigration of smolt as they leave the estuary. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to describe each of these functional floors more fully. Adult salmonids need year-round functional flows. Because they are either passing through the estuary, moving up the Sacramento River, or holding and rearing in tributaries, uh, and we see that one or more runs of these salmon are present in the system each month of the year. Juvenile salmon also need year-round functional flows for incubation, rearing, smultification, and outmigration. Basically, again, we have juvenile salmonids in the system each month of the year. For example, Central Valley steelhead rear in Antelope Mill and Deer Creeks, and they can be present there and in the Sacramento River for up to three years. Spring Run Chinook salmon also are in Mill, Deer, and Antelope Creeks, and they can be present for up to a year and a half in those creeks or in the adjoining river. Each tributary has a unique hydraulic signature. However, many tributary flows in the Sacramento Basin are less than optimal for salmonids. As an example, this is the combined flow of Antelope Mill and Deer Creeks at the confluence with the Sacramento River. The gray boxes are Un, our current flows and the white boxes are unimpaired flows. The horizontal line is the median monthly flow. The current median monthly flow on Antelope Mill and Deer Creeks between April and October is less than unimpaired flows. And in fact, in July and August, these creeks go dry in half of all years. The decrease in flow during the irrigation season ham blocks the upstream migration of adult uh, spring run and steelhead, and also the outmigration of juvenile steelhead. As another example, tributary flows are less than optimal for juvenile steelhead outmigration on the Calaveras River. According to Stillwater Sciences, excellent year-round flow, cool water habitat conditions exist for steelhead in the 50-mile reach between New Hogan Reservoir and Belota Creek, and Belota uh, Weir. However, diversions at Belota Weir and further downstream reduce in-stream flows and make the current median flow less than the unimpaired flow for all months between January and April. In drought years, the Calaveras River regularly goes dry on the valley floor between January and April. The lack of flow between January and April can block the outmigration of juvenile steelhead. After May, the flows on the Calaveras are naturally low, and the river often goes dry at the confluence with the San Joaquin River. However, even in these months, continuous flows exist above Belota Weir, where the juvenile steelhead can rear. A, a, a note here, Th there's an error in the scientific basis report. Stockton East Water District will make a presentation today, and they correctly point out that the Calaveras River does not support viable populations of spring run Chinook salmon, as we reported in the draft scientific basis report, and we'll correct that in the final. <laughs> 
As contrast, Butte Creek is an example of a creek with good flow conditions for salmonids. In almost all years, current flows are equal to about 75% of the unimpaired flow. These high flows should be protected. At least in part, these high flows result in the creek supporting viable populations of steelhead, spring, and winter run Chinook salmon. Oh, excuse me, Battle Creek. Yeah, just because some people may be listening and not seeing the slide. Thanks. Thanks. Now, Matthew Holland talked earlier about how delta outflow in winter and spring was important for the recruitment of estuarine species. Winter and spring flows are also important for salmon immigration from the delta. This figure, turn it. This figure shows catch per unit effort uh, at Chips Island for fall run Chinook salmon between April and June. The graph shows that the catch per unit effort at flows less than 20,000 CFS is independent of flow, but then increase regularly with higher flows. Now, a similar relationship has been demonstrated by Del Rosario and others for um, winter run Chinook salmon between February and April. Current flow is not optimal for salmon immigration from the delta in winter and spring. This figure shows that current flows are less than the unimpaired flows between February and June. Of course, this the is the time period I'm sorry, when... I'm Chris. Can I... The issues... It, 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 I'm assuming that the issue that you're, you're pointing to here is not just that it's less than unimpaired, because we're not going to go back to a time in history pre-human development, but that it's too far below, it's too far below unimpaired flow for the fish to be able to get the cues or all those, the food or the other things they need. That's correct, and I'm going to try to show that in my next slide. So the, the point here is that current flows are less than the unimpaired flows that the fish evolved to expect. This shows that during the April-May time period, the current flows are less than the 20,000 CFS needed for, um, sam for successful salmon out migration. And in fact, uh, the unimpaired flows over twice the values that we currently have. Obviously, these uh, reductions in flow are the result of upstream diversions for agriculture and filling reservoirs. So in summary, Sacramento River flows greater than 20,000 CFS between February and June are needed for successful outmigration of fall and winter run Chinook salmon. Now, spring run and steelhead also emigrate at this time period, and similar flows are likely to increase their successful outmigration. Now, earlier, Matt Holland showed that recruitment of young of the year estuarine species in fall increased when we had higher flows in spring. And here, increasing winter and spring outflows appear now to benefit both estuarine species and salmonids. There are, at present, few existing inflow requirements for the Sacramento River and its tributaries. The Bay Delta plan includes minimal base flows for the Sacramento River at Rio Vista in fall, and it also um, recognizes the joint settlement agreement between with the McCullumy River that provides minimal salmonid flows. Other streams have Federal Energy Regulatory Commission flows, biological flows, and other flow, and flow agreements and regulations. However, none of these are in the Bay Delta Plan, and most all of them are not fully protective of salmonids. Of course, many tributaries don't have any flow requirements. So the purpose of the proposed update 
is to begin to address these discrepancies in a comprehensive fashion by providing integrated flows on salmon bearing tributaries, the Sacramento River and the three east side delta rivers to provide year round functional flows for salmon and estuarine species. Finally, the report recommends a year-round percent of unimpaired flow from each salmon-bearing tributary in the Sacramento River Basin and the East Three Side Rivers. The range is between 35 and 75 percent unimpaired flow. Uh, second, the report recommends adaptive management. Uh, the concept is to set aside an environmental block of water scaled to the percent of unimpaired flow. The block of water would be used to shift and shape pulse flows to enhance functional flows for fish and to perform scientific experiments. The flow range to accommodate specific inflow needs would also be used to implement other non-flow measures that might reduce needs for flow. Finally, inflows to the delta and outflows will need to be coordinated. With that, that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Questions now or want to hold it? I'm sure there'll be a lively dialogue and we'll be asking you questions. Okay, I will now pass it on to Karen. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, thanks, Chris. Um, my name's Karen Nia. I'm senior engineer with the Division of Water Rights. I'll be covering cold water habitat and interior delta flows. Oh, how do I do this? Oops. Okay. The flow requirements that Matt and Chris talked about earlier likely will result in changes to operations and could have implications to water temperature and flow management during various times of the year. To address this, we developed a complementary measure to protect cold water habitat. Successful salmon spawning and rearing occurs at colder water temperatures and access to historic cold water spawning and rearing habitat is impeded by reservoirs. Spawning and rearing now occur below reservoirs in areas of colder water temperatures created by control of reservoir releases and, and operations. Reservoir releases must be managed to provide minimum flows and preserve supplies for cold water management throughout the season. Some tributaries have temperature management requirements, but comprehensive requirements for the entire watershed don't exist. So requirements are needed to ensure that cold water habitat is still provided, particularly with climate change and with greater demands from the proposed new flows. A narrative requirement is proposed to ensure river conditions provide reasonable protection of cold water habitat. It would ensure that cold water releases from reservoirs are maintained and timed to provide suitable downstream temperatures and flows for aquatic species, or that alternative measures are implemented to prevent temperature impacts. A narrative requirement would allow for development and implementation of tributary specific cold water management approaches that take into consideration the unique design and hydrologic characteristics of the many tributaries in the watershed. During our presentation, we have talked about outflows, inflows, and cold water management protective measures. The last component of this package, which, which is intended to provide protection for fish and wildlife throughout their migratory range, is interior delta flows. And in the interest of time, my slides are, are relatively brief, but we've got a lot more detail within the working draft report. Moving parts here. Um, operation of the Central Valley Project and State Water Projects in the delta affects Salmonis pelagics and other species through alteration of circulation patterns, which leads to adverse transport flows, changes in water quality, changes to delta habitat, and entrainment of fish and wildlife and other aquatic organisms. There are currently several regulatory mechanisms in place that are intended to improve homing fidelity of adult salmonids, improve survival of outmigrating juvenile salmonids, and minimize entrainment of pelagics and other native fish species in the interior delta. Is homing fidelity a 
a term of art. Yeah, that's the first time I've heard it. That I, I get it, but. Yeah, it's the return of the adult San Juanes back to their native tributaries. That's, that's what it's generally called. I've heard that before. That's inter homing fidelity, meaning they can smell their way back home. That's pretty incredible. All right. So yeah. You also might want to get a, just a teeny bit further from the mic. From the mic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, let's see. So the 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 requirements that are affected are the Delta Cross Channel Gate operation. Old and Middle River flow and export limits in relation to Delta inflow and um, San Joaquin River flows. The Bay Delta plan includes requirements for all of the above with the exception of the interior or the Old and Middle River reverse flows. This figure illustrates the effect of negative Old and Middle River reverse flows on entrainment of juvenile salmon at the export pumps. Monthly average Old and Middle River reverse flows, or Old and Middle River flows is shown on the x-axis. And loss of juvenile salmon at the export pumps is shown on the y-axis. So this is why, when you look at this chart, you can see why 5,000 is a yeah. number that we see a lot. Right. So the figure shows that the loss of the juvenile salmon at the export pumps increases rapidly when old and middle river flows become more negative. Other species are similarly impacted. So while the biological opinions include various interior delta flow requirements, as Diane had stated earlier, the board has responsibility and independent responsibility to reasonably protect fish and wildlife beneficial uses. The report does not necessarily propose new and different requirements than the biops, but we're looking to tie into existing working groups and other processes. The report recommends the following modifications to the interior delta flow requirements in the plan. Additional delta cross channel gate closure requirements in October that are adaptively managed based on fish presence. Old and middle river reverse flow requirements that are consistent with biological opinion and incidental take permit requirements. And additional constraints on spring and fall exports associated with San Joaquin River flows. At this time, we are not proposing any changes to the delta inflow to export ratio requirements in the plan. We're also recommending adaptive management and working with others in a more comprehensive way, employing a strategy that provides for timely action, flexibility, and integration with other planning, science, restoration, and regulatory efforts so action can be taken before imperiled species in the watershed are no longer able to be restored. This is similar to what Diane stated earlier. Um, this concludes my portion of the presentation and I will hand it over to Diane for next steps. So as I uh, mentioned <coughs> earlier, um, the public comments on the working draft report are due on December 16th. And um, after we get those and the oral comments here today, the comments for, from the Independent Science Board, we plan to address all of those, update the report, um, develop some draft objectives and a program of implementation, and develop a um, more final draft report for submittal to um, an independent peer review panel uh, pursuant to our requir the requirements of the Health and Safety Code. Um, we're hoping to complete that process in winter of 2017 so that we can send the report off for peer review. Once we get the peer review comments, again, we will address those comments, update the report, plan to include an updated scientific basis report as part of the um, environmental document package along with um, the, um, the um, draft objectives, program of implementation, including those um, non-flow actions and other parts of the program of implementation in a um, draft package for public review as early as this summer. Uh, we're doing our best to try to expedite the process such that we can accommodate um, 
various efforts to develop agreements in the watershed and to ensure that we're protecting fish and wildlife beneficial uses. Our website indicates that we will complete the process for the phase two update um, in the spring of 2018. We're looking at ways that we can do that more quickly. Um, that is an aggressive schedule and we're, we're looking for further input on you know how we can do things more quickly at a more um, programmatic level for our environmental review efforts. So with that, um, I, we can turn it now over to the fish agencies unless there are questions you'd like to ask. Um, we've got, I believe we're going to have Barbara Byrne from National Marine Fisheries Service, Matt Nobrega, I don't think we have a card for him. We were switching spots with another representative and Scott Cantrell from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I just, let me ask a quick question. We're at 1144 and ordinarily I would take the break. 1044, right. What day is it? Who am I? Why am I here? Right. <laughs> it's like the Admiral Stockdale moment. Um, the, uh, uh, sorry. What, um, I'm going to plead time zones. I was in a different time zone up until almost midnight last night. Um, the, uh, uh, we should take a break, actually. But do you want to ask a question before we take a break? Just for courtesy to folks, and then I want to give you a little sense of what the breaks are going to be, unless those three representatives can't stay an extra 15 minutes. But hopefully they're going to stay and listen anyway. I'm fine either way. My my question is more along the lines of a comment and maybe for, you know, uh, teeing things up for... No, I want, go ahead. Oh. Sure, um, that'd be great. And, and this is really uh, <coughs> just asking for some help, um, thinking how to accomplish the goals that Ms. Riddle just outlined. We're moving quickly and we need to move quickly, um, need to go through the update, uh, but at the same time, um, uh, you've, you've raised um, so some overarching goals that I continue to have challenges with as to how we're accomplishing this um, in this early stage here. Really, we're talking about building blocks. This is the scientific basis that's a building block for the SED and the program of imp implementation. And uh, we all know that um, the most artful way of dealing with all the stressors that are out there is settlements. And so I'm looking at this through the lens of how can we roll out a scientific basis that really helps to address all those other issues that we know are very important. There's a, there's a lot of scientific reports that have come out that uh, you've mentioned some in this report, but not all of them that are saying that we really need to be looking at the multiple stressors uh, that are involved. Uh, the most recent state of the Bay Delta science, you know, uh, calls out the multiple stressors. There's the flow and fishes report. I've got some quotes that I could pull up, but I think we all know that because we've looked at those reports as well, and I recognize that uh, we're looking at the one knob that we ha that the board has, but um, in light of the fact that we really are looking for uh, settlement discussions and as as the way to address all of these other stressors as a package, um, what I'd like to see is. Um, and I know staff is, we've been dialoguing about this, but this is our opportunity to talk, you know, amongst the five of us. What I'd like to see is a way to incorporate uh, those other stressors in the discussion, because all, it, it, otherwise it looks like w we're saying that the knob that we have is flow, and it's a scientific basis on flow, but um, it's, it almost, it, it's basically ignoring the current state of the science where we keep hearing from folks. It's about habitat and you know all these other stressors that we should be looking at. So w without requiring you to go back to square one and, and go through a lot of additional work, how can you best thread in some of those other stressors uh, to help uh, the the stakeholders that we're asking for, uh, you know, some some really good thinking on how to pull a more broad, comprehensive program together uh, through settlements. I think that's where um, 
including the draft objectives and program of implementation with the next version of the science report and the science report that goes to our peer review process and that it ultimately becomes the final report is critical, that crosswalk between what it is that we're proposing to directly do and those things we're proposing to work with other entities on and how those two issues work together. I think we need to lay that out more completely for folks so that they can see that. What does that look like in the regulation? What, do th what does the actions by other entities look like? I know we've heard from you all that you're interested in, in the board playing as active a role as possible in addressing those other activities and facilitating um, completion of projects that address those issues. So I think that's probably the, you know, that's a good place for that. I think bulking, we're already working on bulking up the science on um, the other stressors as part of our update to the science report even before we've, we're getting comments on that, but I think really we need to lay out better how we envision this all working together so that folks can see that and comment to us and be very clear about how we intend the adaptive management process and the implementation of non-flows, the implementation of flows working together in a comprehensive framework that informs each other. All right, so that in the, in the actual even before, but in the actual proposal, we do need to express more about how the program implementation works, why it is we're offering flexibility, because we know that these other stressors are there, it may well be that we just also need to articulate more and point to that other science, but there, there actually is a need to hone in and focus on the flow issue without overly muddying it up, because that is sort of an issue that we need to focus on, not just because it's our knob, but because it's one where there's an awful lot of contention, so it is a key variable. But I, we keep saying it's not the only variable and figuring out how to articulate that in the, maybe in the document as more by way of prologue introduction and reference will be really helpful. But um, uh, I think that's been the intention all along, so we clearly need to make it clearer, but I don't think we need to go back and do the science on everything that everybody's done, which is not what you're suggesting. No, I'm not suggesting that, but I think um, waiting for the program, it, it's, it almost decouples it. You know, we've got the scientific basis on flow because that's, what, that's the knob that we have, and then referring to uh, actions that others could take and what I'm looking for. And, you know, hopefully we'll hear from stakeholders on ideas uh, as to ways that it could be incorporated into this document so that it gives, I mean, you've got this slide 13, multifaceted approach with flow and other measures. Right. So the multifaceted um, goes into cold water and other things, but there's a lot of other aspects of a multifaceted oh, yeah, we, approach. Oh, yeah, we definitely meant those other issues. and. Um, at this stage of the game, it does look like the um, objectives and program of implementation are decoupled from the science report, but the, science, the next version of the science report, those two things come together. It's a matter that we haven't yet arrived at exactly what these regulations look like. We're looking for input on what is the world of science and, and what are we on the flow related issues and speaking to some extent on the non-flow issues without you know going too deep of a dive on those issues and allowing for the, the agencies and entities that are responsible for those non-flow issues to do the deeper dive than what we're doing giving some indication that there is a wealth of science on those issues and there is a crosswalk between the flow and non-flow measures. So I think it will all get married together um, in the next version of the report and we knew that might be a little confusing for people and we're trying to clarify that through our presentation and again, wanna state that those will all be brought together to explain how this all works together. Great, but thank you. I would also suggest, I think as um, Board Member Diadamo was saying, it also suggests that we might want to, I saw it in as better as where it was before in, in where we got in this draft report, but we can, it bears more explanation and executive summary over, there are all different ways to, to do it that we can work on during this draft phase and then even after, so it's, I mean, it's a fair point. I, yeah, but I, I don't want to lose track of the fact that um, the scientific basis report highlights that this, the scientific evaluation of flow and um, what I got from the presentation here this morning requires us to recognize the interconnectedness uh, longitudinally and also laterally among all tributaries. 
And that represents a quantum jump from the 1995 Bay Delta Plan and D1641, which placed the burden of meeting these objectives on the state and federal water projects. This is a, a, a this is what I'm hearing, and is the, the there's a scientific basis. If the native, the recovery of native species is a goal, uh, there's a scientific basis for looking at all tributaries and looking at them longitudinally uh, in order to realize quantitative measurable outputs and goals for native species recovery. So I think in and of itself, the flow discussion is very uh, weighty yeah. and, and des deserves this attention. But then also sophisticated evaluation will take into account what Board Member Diadamo brings up, which is there's a, a very uh, robust connection between uh, a, a, a more sophisticated flow regime and the investments we make and the protections we make uh, within habitat, predation, and other key, uh, and, and, and uh, pollutants, and other key uh, stressors that flow interacts with. So I, I saw that we were, I mean, to the extent, I don't wanna go into great detail, but do you believe that we're starting to talk about how flow and stressors interact better in this iteration? Right, that, that is exactly the goal, and I, I probably, you said it very well, and I probably should have said that myself, that they, they interact with one another and they affect one another, and they're, they, they're not separate, decouplable issues. We actually tried not to use the word non-flow in the report when talking about those other stressors, but just to be clear, I've used it here in this presentation, but everything affects the other issue and they all work together in combination to affect fish and wildlife and they all need to be addressed together in combination. Sorry, not. sorry to interrupt, but when you use the term functional flows, is that a shorthand for your attempt to recognize that um, flows interact with these other stressors and our management of flow can help us better manage those other stressors? Right, I, I think what we need we mean by functional flows is we want we need to achieve natural functions, and those flows interact with the environment, as Matt explained very nicely. It, and we need to be looking at those. How do we get the habitat and flow to interact in a way that's protective of fish and wildlife? And that's that's really the goal here for phase two, and and our efforts to work with other organizations and entities to come up with long-term lasting solutions is to come up with the complete package of flow, habitat, and other measures that provides those natural functions that fish and wildlife need for their protection. Yeah, one thing um, too that I know is in the in the report that you mentioned that we could, I, I know you had, you did a good job of condensing what I know is a much longer set of things that you can um, talk about it, but the, the whole issue of the life cycle along the tribs, that's why the tributaries are important, not just outflow. That whole issue is very important too, in terms of, again, looking at it from a ecosystem point of view and the full life of a smelter, salmon, or steelhead or whichever species you're looking at at the time. And biology and ecosystems are complex moving parts that are hard to boil down, I think. So I appreciate um, Board Member Moore's point that there's a, there's a density of issues just about flow to be focused on and a more sophisticated look at flow here than we've been at before and inviting folks to help us figure out how to not only crosswalk it in this, but how to then you know, towards the big prize, which is getting folks to figure out how to have a more holistic, comprehensive uh, notion of how to make it all work together, which requires people stepping up and coming up with what ifs and ideas and uh, essentially holding hands to work together over time to manage these things as effectively, but also as economically as possible. So it's a delicate dance and you put a lot of stuff out there. So I'm sure we'll hear a lot today and continue to hear more through the process just as we have through the workshop process and the like. So thank you. Is it all right with the fish and wildlife folks if we take our break first? What, it's all right? Nobody's screaming? Good, thank you, because I'm hoping you all stay anyway. So we'll now take our 15 minute break. We'll probably take a slightly lighter, uh, later lunch. I will be, I, I know I, I tend to be not an hour-long lunch person in these meetings, particularly when we don't have a court reporter contract. 
um, give you at least a half an hour, maybe 45. It'll depend on my number of speaker cards. Could I, so I want us to be able to have this conversation. So we will come back at uh, 11.15 on the red um, webcast sign, not the clocks that are on totally different times.
Lakes as a timekeeper. Sorry. No, you don't. Ha ha ha. Yeah, all right. I apologize. Hi. Thank you for joining us. We're back. It is now 1119, and we are resuming our um, hearing all. Resuming? Now I hear quiet. Great. Except for Tom. And we still haven't seen, I know we had an elected official who was going to try and stop by, so we'll interrupt. I'm just not, I'm not seeing. And then Eric, can you tell Tom that we're starting? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was, I made it go long and I apologize. So with that, let's, let's turn now to our uh, colleagues from the Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Good morning, Chair take, Marcus. You, you guys get to pick the order. We, we have an order picked. Yeah, right. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Chair Marcus and board members, uh, my name is Barbara Byrne. I represent the NOAA Fisheries California Central Valley office here in Sacramento. NOAA Fisheries, as you know, has authorities under both the Endangered Species Act and the Magnuson-Stevens Act, or the Magnuson-Stevens Act over Pacific salmon, steelhead, and green sturgeon, all of which use the Delta Estuary and Sacramento watershed and could benefit from this phase of the update to the Water Quality Control Plan. We will be submitting written comments next week. And earlier, uh, there was an urge to, you know, submit new science or tools that could be used uh, to make these decisions. We will be giving some pointers to some of the uh, recent modeling tools developed by our Science Center, particularly for management of Sacramento River water temperatures for the protection of winter and chinook salmon. Today, very briefly, I'd simply like to call out uh, some of the elements we particularly support in the scientific basis report, and I'll uh, offer one general suggestion slash concern. Uh, NOAA Fisheries supports a flow requirement approach that restores key features of the natural hydrograph that can serve ecological functions, such as providing migration cues, inundating floodplain, or, or moving sediment. The unimpaired flow approach uh, does that in a way that can capture both within year and between year variation in hydrology. Importantly, the scientific basis report concludes that year-round flow requirements should be established for the Sacramento River, its tributaries, and the Delta East Side tribu um, tributaries, and we completely agree with that. Uh, as an aside, we will be submitting comments uh, early next year that encourage you to draw a similar conclusion for the San Joaquin River Basin flows proposed in the Phase One proceedings. One of the tensions that uh, we at NOAA Fisheries often face is how to balance uh, the expected benefits of in-stream flows with the need to protect the cold water pool resources. And we are glad to see this issue acknowledged in the report with the explicit recognition that uh, at least in the interim until passage to cold water habitat is provided, that cold water and possibly higher than unimpaired flows are sometimes necessary to provide conditions suitable for fish that, because of loss of access to their horse historical habitat, are in places, particularly in the summer and the fall, where they wouldn't normally be. Finally, NOAA Fisheries appreciates the recommendations that consider the use of some of the management knobs included in the RPA action, actions in our 2009 biological opinion on the long-term operations of the CVP and SWP. Uh, while the specifics could and perhaps should differ, given that the plan's narrative goals are more ambitious than simply avoiding jeopardy, uh, we do think that OMR flow limits and measures to protect San Joaquin River flows through the Delta have merit. Finally, I'll just wrap up with our suggestion. We certainly understand the appeal of managing within an adaptive range, and in fact, some of our own RPA actions include that sort of an adaptive range, usually with some sort of trigger defining how you move within that. Uh, so, but we do caution, as we also will in our comments on the phase one proceedings, that if too many of the implementation details are kicked to an adaptive management group, it does make it difficult to determine how the proposed plan will be implemented and thus what benefits might be reasonably expected to occur. Uh, just in closing, I'll say that NIMS certainly appreciates the chance to engage in this process in support of developing flow objectives uh, and other actions to protect the fish and wildlife resources that are held in the public trust. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks. Um, you bring up that critical balancing on cold water and flow. And it was interesting to note in staff's presentation, at least to me, um, that uh, we don't really have in the current Bay Delta plan much, if any, provision for coal water management. Um, and, 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 and really have relied on the federal and state agencies for fish and wildlife uh, to guide that, but also stakeholder um, reservoir management as well and partnerships with uh, water users. Um, so, you know, it's been a, it's interesting how that's kind of an unspoken need in the current Bay Delta plan. Do you have any other comments on that? So I'm less familiar with the Sacramento River operations, but I believe that another state board order, I think the 90-5, mm -hmm. right. does does engage in that issue. I think you're right, though, that this certainly takes a more comprehensive look at it across across the valley. Right. Like <coughs> Barb pointed out, we do have um, separate water right orders and decisions that may have various requirements in them. Again, what we're looking at is a comprehensive approach that that makes sure we have that protection and that it's being coordinated with the inflow and outflow requirements. I think the last few years of temperature management during the drought have raised issues that we probably want to revisit as far as cold water management goes on the Sacramento River as well. This is a forum in which we can consider those types of issues as well. Yes, yeah, so as even within uh, the ecological goals, balancing that must occur, and then we must then think broader and w the way we have synergy with water use, human use, agricultural, and municipal use along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, Mr. Cantrell. Nice to see you at our last. See you too. Good morning, Chair Marcus and board members. My name is Scott Cantrell, and I'm the chief of the water branch for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. The department is very grateful for the tremendous work that the water board has put into updating the 2006 Bay Delta plan through a plan amendment process. It's clear to us that you've incorporated much of the input that the department has provided over the last several years. At the core of the department's concern is the undisputed fact that the Bay Delta ecosystem is in a crisis. Habitat loss and flow modifications have fundamentally altered the chemical physical and biological characteristics of the Bay Delta ecosystem. We agree with you that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the existing Bay Delta plan does not include adequate flow and Delta operational requirements to protect fish and wildlife beneficial uses. We are seeing record low abundance of native Bay Delta fishes as Matt Holland pointed out. It's also apparent to us that we need a timely alternative approach if we are to improve the ecological health of the Delta before it's too late. <clears throat> we believe the scientific basis report is considering the right factors in phase two of the Bay Delta plan update. The use of a percent of unimpaired flow from the Sacramento River and tributaries to the Delta is scientifically sound. We, be we also believe the science supporting Delta outflow ecological functions is well supported. Year round tributary inflows and Delta outflow requirements are necessary to protect Delta fish and wildlife species rearing in and migrating through the tributaries. We also support the consideration of interior Delta flow requirements and further evaluation of cold water habitat below reservoirs. We believe a range of 35% to 75% of unimpaired flow is an appropriate range and a reasonable starting point for the purpose of further modeling and analysis. In conclusion, the department appreciates that the Water Board also recognizes the efforts to secure collaborative voluntary agreements that would advance the restoration of flow and improvements of physical conditions in the Bay Delta and tributaries. The use of voluntary agreements may accelerate implementation while also increasing the synergies of both the flow and the non-flow actions through the Bay Delta watershed. The department will continue to collaborate with stakeholders to develop solutions to protect all beneficial uses of water within the ex existing framework of current management requirements and goals. Thank you.
Good morning, Chair Marcus and members of the board. Uh, my name is Matt Nobriga. I'm the Assistant Field Supervisor for Modeling and Water Operations in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's San Francisco Bay Delta Fish and Wildlife Office, and I'm speaking this morning on behalf of our field super field supervisor, Kaylee Allen, who apologizes for not being able to be here. So we appreciate the opportunity to address you today to express our ardent support for the board's ongoing update of the 2006 Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan. This update is a very important effort to consider updating objectives for beneficial uses in the estuary and broader watershed. The Water Quality Control Plan provides critical protection for the Bay Delta and for species dependent on this habitat, and it should be revisited to consider the changes that have occurred in the ecosystem since the last update. The draft scientific basis report sets a starting point for, our, for identifying relevant science and for considering water quality objectives. The Department of the Interior will be providing written comments intended to help the board ensure that the update to the 2006 Water Quality Control Plan is based on the best scientific information. We hope that the board finds our written comments helpful. Again, we thank the board for undertaking this critical effort to update the Water Quality Control Plan and express our commitment to providing whatever assistance we can to help make the process successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I just have a quick question for uh, you, Diane, uh, coming off what Ms. Byrne was saying. Obviously, today the focus will be on the scientific basis report, and there's, there's plenty there, but the issue of um, us figuring out how to balance the desire for flexibility and adaptive management, which we know we want and that you could, can be better than anything we can set by calendar, et cetera, using our authorities, and there being enough guidance in it and meat in it that there can be a way of making sure you actually have a successful adaptive management program and that you meet the goals is a, one of those issues that I think will be a very robust conversation that we really need very specific um, help with as we move towards the SA, SED and plan proposal phase. And I've been anticipating we're also going to get that from some of the folks working on voluntary settlements, but we also have to put it into the architecture of our plan update. So I didn't know if you wanted to comment on that briefly. I, I basically want to see that as an, uh, an, an invitation for folks to tell us how we can do it and point to the best models we can find so that we can move from more theoretical discussion or aspirational discussion to something that will really uh, work, but also help people trying to formulate these groups and be a part of it. And it's one of those things where some certainty on our bottom lines and what need to be the elements can actually make it easier to achieve um, the governance operations relationships as well as the stuff of a successful program, which can be more successful than anything we can mandate. Yeah, you're you're right. It is a it's a very fine balance between how much flexibility we provide and boxing ourselves in regarding what it is, whatever we say we're going to do in the program of implementation for the Bay Delta Plan, we actually have to do. So if we add a level of specificity, the only way we can go back and remove that level of specificity is through a, a plan amendment process, which is lengthy and time consuming and those sort of things. So we're really trying to think ahead as far as what are the various issues that we need flexibility on, but providing enough of a backstop and enough constraints such that there isn't gaming of the system that we're providing the confines and the structure needed to ensure the protection of the beneficial use. And it is, it is going to be challenging and it's challenging on phase one and we've been working through that and trying to improve the process so we're we are definitely looking for input on that we're also looking for people to think of it from the perspective of um, we'd like this to be a more durable plan we'd like it right. to last longer we'd like to give ourselves the ability to work with this plan for a while uh, how how can we structure something that provides enough structure and uh, accountability checks and balances while at the same time acknowledging that things are going to change over time, we're going to get new information, there are going to be other processes, uh, agreements and such that we want to entertain, and how can we structure something that, uh, that addresses both of those issues? Um, so we are very much looking for input on that and seriously, very seriously considering that as we develop the draft objectives and um, program of implementation language. Thanks, and that's less the scientific, this draft science report as the whole process. So anytime, every day, whatever's helpful would be great. Yeah, sure. 
Uh, one question for, for the two uh, folks representing the federal government. Uh, have you uh, been able to use climate change information from uh, on and in your determinations as to what needs to be done for fisheries in uh, in California, have, have you actually used any climate information? Uh, when we issued our 2009 biop, the biological assessment that we received from reclamation had climate change analysis. So we in evaluated various scenarios of what might be expected in terms of hydrology and reservoir storage under different, you know, warm, warmer, wetter, cooler, hotter, that kind of thing. Um, and so that uh, assessment of expected climate change impacts underlies. Um, that's one of the reasons why in the RPA we have a suite of actions related to fish passage because we expect it's currently hard to meet temperature below dams and it's only going to get harder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi. Um, oh. Somewhat just repeating our analog to what Barbara just said. So our fall X2 analysis and our 2008 biological opinion uh, did look at climate outflow projections. Uh, that was a large part of, of the analysis that underlied that RPA element. Um, you know, we're actively um, writing a biological opinion for California water fix. Um, climate change will be um, addressed in some form in that. I, I don't actually uh, have a specific about that uh, that I can Discuss That's good because, because I haven't seen it. <laughs> I don't think we can hear it. So there you go. So. Not, not today, at least. <laughs> well, the, the reason I've, I ask, uh, particularly of the two federal representatives, is I know that we are anticipating that that we will be uh, um, uh, that climate will be a, a factor that uh, is is lightly touched on now, but will be more heavily touched on uh, whether we like it or not, and um, and so. Uh, Whatever you have done uh, is something that uh, presumably will will be uh, drawing on, plus other other things that uh, that are being done even more currently. Is that is that true, f Diane? From your perspective? Yeah, we're very interested in what comes out of the other processes that are related to the Bay Delta Plan update, um, and we'll be looking at. Um, at what the other fish agencies and other organizations are doing with respect to climate change and another and a suite of different issues, any the issues associated with protection of fish and wildlife. So my question goes to uh, the earlier discussion about flexibility, sort of that tension between uh, flexibility and accountability. And um, I, I don't know that now is the appropriate time, but uh, in your comments, um, it, it, if you could. Um, help us to find um, ways to quantify the benefits. Uh, we all know that, say, habitat projects, they're not all created equal. Um, predation hotspot um, projects aren't all created equal. So how can we um, best analyze, how can the, the, the team of folks that are going to be working on adaptive management, how can they best analyze um, how to quantify the benefits and do it in... Um, a way that the broader stakeholder community accepts and uh, can move through quickly uh, without, you know, turning it into a full nether project. Um, if you want to comment now, I, it, it, sure, uh, or in your written comments. Well, I'll just start by saying I think fundamentally we need to start with very well-articulated biological goals and objectives, and I know that that's going to be one of the first tasks of the STEM group. You have to have some benchmarks of comparison to see whether you're achieving your fish and wildlife protection, right? So. All right. Thank you all very much for joining us, uh, not just today, but all the conversations before and all the conversations that were followed. We'll appreciate it. Great. Well, then, our, our first panel, which is our longest panel, is uh, Sac Valley Water Users and the Water Forum together. It's longer, but you're doing it together. Two different presentations. And you've asked for 45 minutes between the two. Correct. I will just... Uh, 
And I would like to see the, I don't know how many blue cards we have, so I don't know how many people want to speak and how many people are just listening, so I don't have any way of gauging the afternoon. Doesn't look huge. Yeah, there'll be more. If you wish to speak, in addition to the panels, fill out a card. Okay. It is the largely the Sacramento, so more time makes sense. Yes, we're trying to be efficient with your time. No, um, it's a good idea. Yes. Good morning. Uh, David Guy with the Northern California Water Association. Uh, um, appreciate the opportunity today to, to be here. Um, we are going to... I'll give him to give a little bit of an overview um, on the uh, process. Uh, we have uh, Walter Beret here. Uh, is going to talk about the hydrology, the operations, and the modeling. Um, Dave Vogel and Rob Latour, who has done some technical work for us, could not be here today. So Andy Hitchings uh, is going to kind of summarize uh, some of their uh, work. Uh, we'll talk about some of the work uh, being done in the Sacramento Valley and how we think that fits into this dynamic. Um, and then uh, Tom Goring is going to provide the water forum kind of example of, of how this works on the American River and what this uh, might look like for, for one of the uh, tributaries. So, and uh, so that's our kind of our overview. Is that, does that work? Oh, great. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a little bit of a cough here. So let me just uh, start. We appreciate the... Uh, in fact, you uh, rolled this out as a, a working draft, and uh, we're committed to, to working with you and your staff in, uh, in moving forward uh, with uh, this. Um, the two kind of pieces we really want to touch on today is uh, we do not think that the uh, unimpaired flow approach uh, works for 21st century California. We don't think it works as a regulatory approach, and we don't think it works as a measure for success of negotiated resolutions. With that said, we do think there are ways to address flow issues in a very robust robust and systematic way through a more functional flow approach, which we think uh, can work in the uh, Sacramento Valley, and we want to start uh, that conversation with you uh, today on how we can uh, best uh, do that. As far as the uh, unimpaired flow, I think the thing that uh, we would like to suggest is that the uh, science has really evolved in the Bay Delta, I think, over the last uh, 10 uh, some years. And that's the conversation that we would love to be having is how do we, I know today's the focus is on science. The science is evolving uh, quickly and there's been some significant uh, new science. I think the first thing that uh, we kind of think about is we have dedicated 1.3 million acre feet of water to Delta outflow over the last decade. 1.3 million acre feet, that's more than water than is in Folsom Reservoir or when it's at its capacity. And uh, the question I think that that raises is, has that water benefited fish? I, I suspect most people are going to say, no, it has not. And so I think the question is, why is that not uh, helping? Why is that outflow, a significant amount of outflow that has been committed over the last uh, decade, not uh, benefiting fish? I think that's a serious scientific question that ought to be uh, focused uh, upon. And Walter uh, is going to talk a little bit uh, more about that from a hydrology uh, perspective. Uh, second point is uh, there's a lot of 20-year-old science in the uh, scientific basis report. We'd love to bring the science a lot more current. Um, I think a couple of the things that uh, we think would be helpful, uh, the lead scientist uh, for the state has presented to you on several occasions, and we don't see much of that work wrapped up in the uh, scientific basis report. Um, the flows and fishes report that was presented, I think, shows that basically putting more water into the delta uh, is not going to help if it's such an inhospitable place that fish couldn't live there to begin with. And I think that's what we're seeing, is the delta is a very inhospitable place for fish. You can add a lot of water to it. Are you going to benefit the fish um, in any way? Um, also, there was a robust uh, 2012 workshop series. Uh, some of you participated in that. I know we all spent a lot of time over a year on that. Um, it's mentioned in the scientific basis report, but then ignored, essentially. Uh, there was a lot of good science on all perspectives, all good sides on that. ICF did the summary report that I think framed up some of the questions, and uh, we think that has uh, been lost in the uh, process. Um, I think. Uh, 
Board Member Diadamo mentioned the uh, State of the Science report that we saw last week from the Delta Stewardship Council. I encourage folks to read that. I encourage board members to read that. I think it's interesting to look at what the state of the Delta Science is. It's a lot of focus on nutrients, contaminants, the food web. We're going to keep coming back to the food web because we think that's the real key to a lot of this. And um, in fact, there's some who think that this uh, additional flow that has been put into the Delta over the last decade is actually hurt fish because it's moved some of the food out of the system at a time when the uh, fish need it. So that's uh, something that we ought to be uh, thinking about as well. And then finally on this, um, the, uh, I know it's been suggested that the unimpaired flow approach is a natural approach. In the Sacramento Valley, it's quite the contrary. Uh, the natural approach would be instead of shunting water down through a bunch of levees into the delta during a quick time, the natural approach would be to spread that water out over the land, spread it out, slow it down, let it function, and that's the kind of a functional flow that we want to be uh, thinking about and we'll talk about here that's, in uh, just a, a little bit. About the distinction. Excuse me? No, I'm just trying to understand what you yeah. mean. Because the word unimpaired flow and functional flows is used either interchangeably or different, so the more you can explain what you mean by yeah, we will, we will on that. Yeah, we, uh, we do not think they're the same thing um, in any way, shape, or form. I know they're being used somewhat interchangeably, but they, uh, they are not. Um, and then I think just, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but the flip side of this is there's a lot of significant impacts that an unimpaired flow approach creates, and um, that includes uh, evacuating reservoirs um, in a major way during the critical times of the year. I think the one thing we learned from the drought, or I hope we learned from the drought over the last five years, is how valuable that storage is during critical times, and that water is important for everybody. It's important for cities. It's important for farms. It's important for birds. It's important for fish, and uh, I think we really need to be cognizant of the importance of surface storage. We also need to be cognizant of groundwater. We all have a challenge to manage groundwater sustainably, and a lot of these approaches, I think, could also have some, some serious adverse effects on the groundwater resources. So I'm going to uh, stop there and uh, switch to uh, Walter Bure um, talking about the, uh, the hydrology, if I could. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so uh, a lot of the information that I'm going to talk about is information that we've presented in the 2012 workshops. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've done quite a bit of work on here. I'm just going to try to summarize it as briefly as I can. The first is looking at the unimpaired flow changes within the Sacramento Valley and um, how much water is coming out of the basin. It hasn't really changed substantially since the 1950s when you look at a percent of unimpaired flow. Also, David mentioned a 1.3 million acre feet of increased outflow. Um, 300,000 of that was um, due to 1641. And then the biological opinions really required another 1 million acre feet of additional outflow, and that's the salmon and smelt biops in 2008. Um, in addition, we've done a lot of work on evaluating unimpaired flow objectives and the effects on the system. Um, and what I'm going to show you is one example of 50% unimpaired flow, and I'll explain um, how we evaluated that. And, and next, you know, this is a very complex system, and there's a lot of trade-offs. And I think you're going to see what Andy and um, Tom will talk about, and David will go through some more of this, uh, is the balance between all of those are very difficult, as you know, and that's why we're here today, is because it is a complex problem. So we wrote a report and did a lot of evaluation studied unimpaired flow and percent of unimpaired flow. And this slide is something that we presented on September 6th, the 2012 workshop, and looking at the percent of unimpaired flow uh, from the Sacramento Valley. And if you look at January through uh, June, you can see that those lines are pretty close together. And th there's we've aggregated these the average between um, 1956 and 1968 is the blue line, 69 to 79 is a red line, um, 1980 through 89, so we try to break this up kind of in decades, um, and then 90 to 2003. And then you look at the annual in January through June, off to the right, those points are almost on top of each other as you look at the, 
um, average for that period. And sometimes it's higher, sometimes it lo it's lower depending upon hydrology mostly. Um, hydrology is the biggest factor. If it's very, very wet, we're taking a lower percentage. And if it's very dry, um, we tend to take a higher percentage during these, these times because you know there's not that much extra flow in the system. So adding more flow, um, when we looked at what years we would affect, it's not the wetter and above normal years that we would affect as much, it's the dry and critical years. And the dry and critical years where we would affect and have more outflow are the years that it's more difficult to balance the water we have for beneficial uses. And, and we see that in all the studies we've done and, and the data that we've looked at. Next, I'd like to turn to um, the effects that biological opinions have had on system operations. And this is, again, we presented this on November 14, 2012. And this top plot is the average annual change in delta outflow, looking at without the biological opinions and with the biological opinions. So this is the change in delta outflow due to those the salmon and smelt biological opinions. And on an average annual basis, it's roughly a million acre feet. And you know, when you look at the wet years, 1.3 million acre feet is important, but in the critical years, a half a million acre feet in those critical years is an awful lot of water. But, but isn't that the same? It's a lot of water for water users. It's also a lot of water that's important for fish, right? Yeah, so it's... I'm just trying to understand. I'm really yeah, trying it, to understand. This is an additional outflow. Um, so yeah, it, it is a lot of water for fish. Um, I think it's it's, and I I can go and spend probably an hour or two just talking about the effects of the system, and I'm trying to summarize it. But when you look at the average outflow per month, um, it kind of helps describe what's for fish and and the effects because we've had decreases in reservoir storage as a result of this too, um, and. I'm just focused on the outflow, but if you look at what happened to Shasta, and even in the environmental documentation for the biological opinions, you see effects to Shasta carryover and effects to cold water pool because of the biological opinions. So although they're designed to protect fish, there are um, adverse impacts to fish associated with the biological opinions. And, and, there, and I think that you've heard a lot of the um, conflicts between what's needed for smelt for outflow versus what's needed for habitat for salmon. And in the biological opinions, when you look at the results of the, in, in the environmental document, you see lower Shasta storage, and sometimes that's in the critical years. So there are effects from these. Hmm. And one of the things that I get nervous about is when you impose additional requirements on the system, the effects on operations and what that means to the species you're trying to affect are, is critical. So some of the things that we see um, increased um, delta outflow because of OMR requirements, and that's January through June. But you also see the fall X2 where we have an increased September flow, October and November. Um, and one of the things that we, you know, folks haven't really looked at is the effects going from D1485 to 1641 actually resulted in less outflow in the fall because of the way the system's um, operations has changed. Right. And, and that we try to capture, and this is also a slide from the 2012 workshops, the, the CVP SWP, particularly SWP, was designed to take surplus out of the system. So we have a lot of uncontrolled flow in the Sac Valley and in coming into the Delta, and the original design was to pull that water out of the Delta when we had surplus. With the biological opinions with OMR, we can't do that anymore. So really the projects have to rely on stored water and convey that during the summertime um, to, to make yield. And as a result, we have lower storages going into the fall. So we're not ramping down to flood control anymore. So one of the criticisms that we've had is we need more fall flow, but we've had a reduction in fall flow as a result of the standards that we've imposed on the system. So again, it's really important to look at the effects of the standards you're imposing and what that really does comprehensively to the fish or holistically to the mm -hmm. fish.
So we've performed evaluations of looking at um, imposing unimpaired flow um, to the system. And the example that I'm referring to here is we, we did a calcium run with 50% unimpaired flow. And unimpaired flow requirements would likely affect cold water pool and in-stream temperatures in all but the wettest of years. The, the draft scientific basis report addresses with a brief narrative objective to be further evaluated. This narrative object objective does not define what actions would be taken or how cold water pool management would be accomplished for most years. With the unimpaired flow percentage uh, requirements, actions would be needed to balance beneficial uses all the time. So, um, one thing that confused me a little bit is on, on this statement at the beginning uh, is it just says out of hand percent unimpaired flow causes problems in all but the wettest years, but it doesn't talk about within the range of percent unimpaired flow. Your previous graph showed that um, typical going back to the 50s, uh, you're getting anywhere from 50 to 100 percent unimpaired flow through the through the basin uh, as empirical. So uh, this seems like an overstatement without going into detail like we've done with phase one where we look, um, you know, specifically month to month and, and, um, and, or, and also different percentages. So if, if it were 35 at the low end of the range, how can you make this statement when empirically you've had 50 to 100 percent over the historical record? That, that's a really good question. We've actually analyzed 20, 30, um, 40, 50, 60, 75 percent of unimpaired flow. We're showing just one example of 50 percent here where we actually see significant impacts at, at 30. And, you know, I'm going to use this next um, slide to answer your question. And this slide in, in this analysis, we impose 50 percent unimpaired flow for the Sac River inflow to the delta as well as delta outflow. And 80% of the time or more, the carryover storage in the reservoirs is inadequate to meet the compliance and um, upstream objectives. And this is with a 50% unimpaired flow. If you get to a 40, it's a, a less percentage of the time. You get to 30, it's less percentage of the time. But at this level, almost every year, you need to really balance your cold water pool management and, and upstream habitat with that flow objective. And, and is it, this would be year-round, though, as folks have been talking about year-round? This is a um, January through June January unimpaired through flow June. requirement for this particular study. Okay. Thanks. And there's um, a lot of implications to this. Um, you know, the delta outflow in this study went up about 1.1 million acre feet. Um, groundwater pumping in the Sac Basin increased by a quarter of a million acre feet which we didn't look at the effects to delta outflow associated with that. And exports were cut about 700,000 acre feet in this particular study. And we did put this requirement in, in all years from January through June. And this is also the same study. And I want to point out, which is really critical, is that the unimpaired flow requirements really put out more water in the springtime. So even if you don't end up low in storage at the end of the year, your ability to capture cold water and manage it is greatly affected in almost every year except for the really wet years when you're spilling. So given that every year you're going to have to balance for beneficial uses and really focus on the functional flows, um, it makes sense to jump to the functional flows and manage to the system rather than impose that requirement that you're going to have to do something different almost all the time. What's your assumption the last bullet there cannot simply reduce summer releases to recover lost cold water? What, that, what are you assuming on those releases? That, that's a really good question. So what happens, you know, the models typically um, will run out of water and cut off releases and will not meet requirements. In these studies, we're not meeting 1641 quite often. We're not meeting in-stream flows quite often. Um, and sometimes the requirements are so great that you can't back off enough in the summertime to keep the reservoirs above minimum dead pool levels. It just shuts off everything. And in addition to that, once you've lost that cold water, 
if you, you can't cut ag enough in the Sac Valley, you can't cut ag in the springtime, there's no irrigation during that time, so it has to come out of storage. There's no, there's no other way that you can meet those requirements in the springtime because the demands are so low. So if you're trying to recover by cutting demands or diversions within the Sac Valley, um, you've already lost your cold water pool management capability for that year, and you can't back enough, uh, enough off for ag. Um, because we need that, those flows below the reservoirs for habitat during the summertime as well. So you have to have a balance between that spring flow and your summertime flow. So you just can't back off enough. Another thing, um, I was talking to a gentleman, a power guy, um, before the workshop, and when you put that water out in the springtime, there's already a surplus of power in the system. And so you're gonna, you're gonna have significant power impacts with this. So it, it balancing all of these beneficial uses becomes very, very difficult. And that's, I think, when, when David mentioned the functional flows, um, it's, I think, very critical to balance all of these. And I understand the need for um, greater flows at time, but we have to have the function with it. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it to Andy to talk about um, salmon. Thank you, Walter. Uh, good morning. Uh, as Dave, uh, David Guy mentioned, Dave Vogel and Robert Latour were unable to attend today, but we will be submitting detailed written reports of theirs with our written comments. Um, these next several slides are really just intended to uh, provide a summary of their key findings. Uh, so it's a snapshot and a preview of, of what you'll see in the written submittal that we'll be submitting uh, with, our, with our submittal. Um, and, and I'll re remind the board, I, I'm, I'm just a lawyer, I'm not a biologist, so I'm in a, a, a little bit of a strange position here, but again, all the details. talented I almost had you do the, uh, e the early admonishments. I'm really glad you did. Because we know you, you can didn't. do that, too. Thank you. <laughs> he was just happy that Tom was called out, too, so he, he's a good <laughs> company. So uh, from uh, Dave Vogel's report, he was instrumental and, and very active in the 2012 workshops. And one of his comments uh, was that uh, concern that the best available science is not being used um, necessarily in the, in the scientific basis report and that a lot of the key information from the 2012 workshops was either overlooked or ignored. Um, that a lot of the uh, information with regard to Sac River uh, Basin and Adrabin Sal Salmonids were presented, uh, that are presented in the report, it's incomplete and, and out of date. Uh, and that for many of the statements with regard to Salmonids, um, they're not substantiated with, uh, with a real supporting scientific basis. Uh, it also fails to address some of the major scientific uncertainties and the highly complex variables that are in play. Uh, there were also concerns that were, there were numerous conflicting and confusing statements concerning the terminology used of unimpaired flows and natural flows. Uh, also that there, there was uh, a, not a detailed description of uh, flow related problems on the river and its tributaries in specific spatial as well as temporal or on a time, time lapse basis. Uh, there were also concerns that it's deficient in not providing any meaningful details, details on non-flow measures that could be implemented uh, to benefit salmonids. There was also a concern that there's no uh, meaningful understanding of the redirected impacts to other species and life stages uh, resulting from the recommendations and, and Walter just touched on that would, would be the, the major drawdowns in uh, storage reservoirs. Uh, and also that um, the, the section concerning stressors on other salmon, uh, other stressors on uh, salmon is that there were the lack of what additional management actions could be implemented to benefit those uh, species. And then moving on to uh, Robert Latour's uh, comments, uh, again, he, he submitted, he will be submitting a detailed written report with our submittal and he did also uh, participate in the 2012 workshops. And some of his key conclusions were that the, the analytical framework itself of the report needs significant improvement, uh, that the flow abundance relationships are based on survey indices rather than fish population dynamics models, 
that a lot of the conclusions, they rest on correlations rather than on causative mechanisms. And that the statistical methods used to estimate the fall midwater trawl indices are flawed. Uh, he actually has a published paper on that and or that covers that uh, and that's cited uh, on the slide there. Uh, that was not, uh, as far as we can tell, taken into consideration uh, in the scientific basis report. And that the um, current strict reliance on indices rather than on survey data uh, results in a, a loss of information that relates fish presence and abundance to environmental factors. Uh, he also had a similar concern as Dave Vogel that uh, the, the conclusions don't account for the scientific uncertainty which is substantial when you're talking about survey data. So again, those summarize the key conclusions. Uh, we will have detailed reports from them that we will submit. I, I think the other thing we wanted to emphasize that uh, the Sac Valley Water User Group were prepared to engage with State Board staff and make uh, uh, Mr. Vogel and Mr. Latour available for, for those discussions and to provide any input that would be helpful. Great. And it's, it's my, uh, this is for Diane or for Matt. Um, it's my sense that a, a, a number of these criticisms, if, if, if not most of these criticisms of the report, lie in, the, in what will come next. I mean, th uh, we will be addressing some of this, if not all of it, in what comes next wh where we are trying to marry the uh, flow issues with other, other stressor issues. Is that correct or is that Right, yeah, I, I think a lot of these issues um, we did try to address to some extent in the staff presentation um, and we'll address more fully and make sure that we're being complete and, and we'll take a look at the information that um, these folks shared with us and make sure that we're understanding that and accounting for that accurately. Um, I get, you know, I think we talked about the functional flow and the percent of unimpaired flow and, and how we're envisioning those working together, not as a strict implementation of a percent of unimpaired flow, but rather a an account of water that can be managed for functional purposes. That's what we're looking at. Um, and looking at, you know, a balance between water supply uses, in-stream flows, and cold water pool management. And we'll do the modeling exercises to look at how what those impacts look like, and then we'll come to you with the environmental impacts assessment and determine, and you, we can determine, you know, what looks like the right balance, and you, of course, will make the final decision on that. So um, I don't think there are insurmountable issues there. Um, it will, you know, it, we won't have the perfect situation for any one of those one resource areas, but we'll be, you guys will be looking at that balancing. Um, some of the other issues, I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily rebut all of the statements at this point, but we're hearing what we're hearing their information. We're happy to engage with um, the Sac Valley water users to address some of these issues. Um, I think Matt talked a little bit about the correlation causation issue, and I think he could expand upon that if you like, but he went into that um, in his pres presentation and the different science that we use. We used what science is available, the best available science on the floor related issues. Uh, again, we didn't do an extensive um, deep dive into the non-flow issues and we are planning to try to um, integrate all of that together in the regulatory language. But my, my understanding is though that you did take in all of the stuff that was submitted and discussed at the workshops. It may well be that we haven't, I mean, I think this is an indication because there is some more conversation about what to be clear about what it is that we're actually not just proposing because we have time to work on that in the in the proposal but what we have in the scientific basis report that we're ask we're going to be asking the peer reviewers to look at as an adequate basis obviously some people will say as the fish agent that we're relying on best available science others will say we're not and say they've put in some other science and i think we need to be able to articulate how we've looked at all of that and put it in its place. I mean, I, I'm just hearing, which is not, it's not meant as a criticism, it's hard to get this right. You're trying to do a long enough document, but you're also trying to not make it impossibly long, but there may be a need for connecting more dots and explaining what we have in mind or, um, or even articulating the basis for how the block of water, where it comes from. 
Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I, we and we it's something we're working on right now. Actually, is um, making those links clearer and beefing up that discussion. And we will take another look at all of the materials from the workshop. Um, with respect, I didn't. The other point I wanted to raise is with respect to the additional flow that's been provided to the environment. There is this difference between the regulatory flow and the realized flow, and that even if we were not to change. It, add any realized flow to the environment to ensure a certain level of flow. There's a there's a big gap between the regulatory flow requirement and the realized flow, and that's something I think uh, we're also concerned about. When we talk about providing more flow to the environment, there's a regulatory flow, and then there's the actual flow, the difference over time, and how much flow is actually provided to the environment. So I just wanted to distinguish that those are sort of separate issues when we talk about that so, factor. So does that mean that, I, I'm not totally following that, does that mean that, for example, um, when Mr. Bray talks about the 300,000 300, acre foot example and the 1 million for the biops, that there's dispute about that or where it comes from? I mean, no, I'm not. No, I'm not about what calling it, dis it makes is a not dispute, issue. and and some of it is certainly the hydrology, um, the differences in hydrology. But there, there's a regulatory requirement for additional outflow, and then there's the realized outflow, and those are different things. And when we're talking about them, I think it's important to characterize which we're talking about. And I, I want to go back specifically to look at, I, I don't want to answer, but I'm not criticizing Mr. Bray's numbers. And I, in fact, I'm sure they're all very accurate. Um, he does a very good job at putting this material together and we value his input on these things. So we'll definitely take a look at that. But I just want to distinguish that there's that difference between there is a regulation that may have increased outflow and it may increase outflow in certain years at certain times. but. That doesn't mean that the environment necessarily experiences that same increase in outflow because the realized flow, the uncontrolled flows are still a big component of what actually occurs. It's not just regulation. Flows are not right. controlled only by regulation. There's a bunch of uncontrolled flow that happens in the system. Mm -hmm. That's the other part of what we're talking about is just to maintain you know, the level of outflow that we have now. Our regulations don't provide for that maintenance of the level of outflow we have or anywhere near the level of outflow that we have. Um, so that's that's part of the equation. Part of what we're talking about is do we need more flow than we see now? And if we want to maintain the level of flow we see now or something close to that, the regulations don't necessarily provide for that either. So looking at, and perhaps at times it doesn't make sense for the regulations to provide for that, not stating that's the case either. There are very high flow events in which it's not there there's maybe no environmental benefit at those very, very high flows or the benefit and the cost to water supply isn't worth it and you, it's a very minimal effect and you may as well take that water and that's part of the balancing decision. Right. I mean, there's a much, there's a longer operational conversation. I'm trying to figure out how to tease out where the scientific basis aspect of this is and where the ongoing conversation about how you manage it is. And the framework is, is put out here because we've done it in the San Joaquin, but we've also said that the whole objective is to have folks get together and say, what is the best functional use, taking the whole life cycle year, et cetera, into account to leverage that. The question then becomes, in some ways, what, what our backstop looks like in case nobody comes together to try and take us up on our offer, which I hope won't happen, but we have to be prepared for. So I think some of the arguments go to, what if nobody came together to provide a better way not liking what it looks like, which makes sense, but it right. And I think goal, our our intention is, is even if people to do don't account. come together, that this flow would still be sculpted under a board proposal, even if there right, weren't correct. an agreement Absolutely. to provide for functional flows. That the proposal is not that the automatic backstop is to percent of unimpaired flow. We would take a look at particularly the summer flow issues. Some of those flows are temperature flows. Not all of them are temperature flows. This is something we're refining our knowledge on, but we would certainly be taking into account what kind of flow regime do we need to maintain? How do you need to shift and sculpt the flows to provide flows at important times for particularly winter run and spring run that have 
flow needs that don't coincide necessarily with uh, the natural hydrograph high flow events because we've modified the habitat and the access that these fish now have. So what we, when we talk about providing for natural flow functions, we're talking about mimicking the conditions that these fish would have experienced under na natural conditions, which will qu require some shifting and sculpting of flows because we don't have that access to the upstream habitat right. any longer. Right. I'd like to get back to uh, the the question that board member Spivey Weber raised about, you know, the appropriate time to be looking at these balancing issues. Um, and that seems to be the case, especially if we're looking at trade-off on water supply uh, and other beneficial uses. But with respect to the issue raised by NACWA about uh, deep uh, cold water loss, loss of storage, it seems to me that there's a distinction there because if we're looking at a scientific basis on flow, and let's just take a hypothetical that you know maybe everyone could agree on, say a 75% of unimpaired flow, and running it through um, the, uh, the, the scenario, a, a, a model where it, it's just impossible even to meet the, the regulatory flows, under that high of an unimpaired flow, even if you just take water supply off the table. And in that instance, it seems that um, the scientific basis could not be justified. And so there might be um, some use in sitting down with them on the models to, to understand at what point does the system just go bust. And, and in that instance, it wouldn't make much sense to include it within the range, you know, on that on a higher end, I if that in fact is the case, that the si that the you just run out of storage. Yeah, and I agree, and I I don't know, you know, what forums. So, in the CEQA environmental review process, we'll be looking at the feasibility of alternatives, and that's part of what we'll look at is should some alternatives be screened out because they're not feasible, they don't meet our project's purpose and goals. That's really maybe the, I think the what the scientific basis report says is it doesn't say that we're gonna look at alternatives up to 75%, it says we'll conduct evaluations to evaluate flows up to that level because it was the level identified in the Delta flow criteria report and is a level, you know, looking at the science. But I think what you're saying and is probably a very good point is that we should further explain that that number is not a solid number. It needs to be refined. It needs to go through a screening process to determine feasibility. And I think that's something we can certainly update and um, reflect in the report. I don't know if the modeling exercises belong in the report or in the screening process for the said, but I think explaining that this is not the be all end all end of the range and may have and likely has and we already are aware of this significant issues but we still need to go through the process of looking at it if for no other reason than to explain to everybody your, why our delta flow criteria report identified 75 percent and why it is that that may not be part of the preferred alternative or part of the alternatives at all just to show our work on the process. So, I mean, this is the beginning, this is the science, then we're showing our work on the alternatives, you know, and that, again, it's a step rise process that we'll go through. Um, and I think, you know, we can work on exactly where it fits into the process. And, and I think we certainly do want to be clear about the fact that this isn't our range of alternatives. And we tried to be clear about that in the report. It may not have come across as clear um, to everybody as it should have. And we'll make sure we provide those links. Well, that can be part of the value of this whole conversation, too, just because it's, it's very easy to create a cartoon on all sides of something one fears unless you make it clearer. So it's it's helpful to illuminate. There'll be some places where it's that and some places where there's really a disagreement and trying to figure out how to narrow the scope of the conversation while keeping it open, I think is gonna be the challenge. So this is helpful. You I saw are you I, I saw him reaching for his button, so all right. Go. Well, I, if 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 you're ready, okay. Um, well, I wanted to just come back to some comments. So just about the science. Oh uh, yeah, Janine, you didn't turn the thing off when we started asking questions. Okay. So we'll just have to estimate adding some time. Thank so you. For this is attention. good for us to talk about you know the management implications and everything, and how that may look at the SED stage. Uh, but I was a little concerned about some statements and that were made about. Um, science being ignored and that we weren't considering the ICF summary report which we commissioned 
Um, I was wondering if, if um, staff wanted to just offer some high level response to that, just in terms of you know what information we considered. You know, this is an ongoing c concern that we have a lot of competent researchers and scientists that are saying, you know, our work isn't being considered. Um, that, that doesn't, that's not a great platform to start from in terms of moving forward at this stage in the process. So I want to create some assurance to everyone that we're absolutely trying to use all the most recent research and understanding, certainly with the, the drought just gone on and all that we've learned through that. So, but we went through a great deal of effort in 2012 to gather the current science. And it's my impression we have incorporated that, but I wanted the staff to respond to that concern. So um, we certainly made an effort to do that. Um, I'm sure that there are some cases where we missed some things. Um, I, you know, I, I think um, I think they're right that we didn't probably cite uh, Rob Luter's 2016 um, paper. It may not have been out when we were writing those sections of the report, um, or we may, may just may not have become aware that it was published. Um, what? Following on those those 2012 workshops, we pivoted to the workshops um, that the Delta Science Program recommended. And so, you know, after the 2012 workshops, Peter Goodwin and Sam Herriter came in here uh, and reported back to the board and said, um, you know, we've identified some issues that we think you should hold additional workshops on. Um, the predation issue was already under underway. That that workshop was going at that point. And um, and they recommended, I think they recommended three workshops, in, interior flows, delta outflow, and a nutrient uh, workshop. And the nutrient workshop sort of went another route through the uh, Central Valley Regional Board. Um, and the state board worked with the science program to run the uh, interior flows and outflow workshops. And so we made every effort to incorporate the information that we saw in that context. Now, you know, I, I can't really get into all of the specifics at this time, but um, we're certainly interested in reflecting the best available science. And so to the degree that we've missed things, this is an opportunity for everybody to point those things out, bring them to us, um, and, you know, tell us what you think the implications are for the conclusions that we've drawn so that we can wrap that into the next uh, revision of the report. Thanks. All right, well, let's, uh, I think, um, <clears throat> let me try to kind of summarize. You'd asked a little bit about some of the, the functional flow dynamic. I guess I would just start uh, this portion of the discussion by saying in so many words, you know, we don't think we have the luxury in the state of California with 39 million people to do mass evacuations of water storage. Um, without a real specific purpose in mind. And so we think we've got to find a better approach that, uh, that works for 2016 and uh, looking uh, forward. And so is what we uh, do think is that there is a functional flow approach where you can tailor uh, flows for very specific purposes uh, because every drop of water must have a very specific purpose, I think, in the state of California. I think we've all seen and uh, learned that. Uh, the California Water Action Plan talks about functional flows for the Bay Delta ecosystem. Uh, the Delta Stewardship Council, uh, their chapter four in the Delta Plan, talks about functional flows, I think, in a very uh, articulate and somewhat sophisticated manner. And I think Water Code Section uh, 13,000 uh, talks about the importance of thinking about these kinds of uh, concepts and the and the broad considerations that uh, need to be uh, thought about. So let me give you uh, three kind of examples of uh, some of the functional flow things that we think about in the Sacramento Valley um, and things that you've heard a little bit about over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, with respect to uh, salmon, um, we have remanaged the flows in the Sacramento Valley in every part of the system, almost every major tributary. Um, and that, uh, I think, is uh, true on the, uh, on the Yuba, on the Feather, on the American, on the Bear. Uh, the Sacramento has uh, the orders that were discussed earlier. Uh, there's agreements on Mill Creek. There's a variety, there's agreements of all sort. And they all have adaptive management provisions that I think will hopefully kick in and provide all the things that you talked about in the earlier discussion. Uh, Tom Goring's gonna talk here in a little bit about the, some of the specifics on the American. I think that's illustrative for a lot of this. But uh, let's be 
I think uh, recognize that uh, there are flow agreements on every part of the system, and importantly, all of these, almost all of these flow agreements were uh, finalized and executed since your last update of the water quality control plan. And so I think that's uh, significant. So I think there's a lot of work. These have all been designed uh, for salmon and steelhead. They all have a uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, NOAA Fisheries involved in all of these. And so, uh, and there's a broad cross section of folks that are working on these. So let's, I think, be careful about unwinding uh, agreements. Some of these took 30 years and a couple trips up to the Supreme Court. So let's be careful before before we start, uh, I think, uh, unwinding some of these. These are functional flows that have been designed by local uh, people to make this work. We obviously are looking at a broader set of salmon recovery actions in the uh, uh, Sacramento Valley, working off the NOAA Salmon Recovery Program uh, plan. And uh, there's a lot of things that we're looking at all life stages. That includes uh, migration, uh, that includes temperature, that includes um, <clears throat> uh, gravel for uh, spawning, uh, the rearing, protection of rearing during, there's a whole suite of things. You've heard a little bit about that. I'm not gonna go into all the details. We won't, do wanna keep updating you on this because the bottom line is things are getting done. Uh, there for about a two month period, we dedicated a new project in the Sacramento Valley every week for about eight straight weeks uh, of these kinds of projects. And so they're getting done, they're real. They have a lot of partnerships uh, behind them. And these actually will include some functional flows as well. I think there's gonna be some pulse flows that are going to be contemplated. Uh, there was a pulse flow uh, last year to try to uh, move some of the gravels in the upper part of the uh, Sacramento River. That looks like it helped a lot uh, with respect to uh, allowing for better spawning habitat. Uh, so there's a variety of things that we can be doing that I think are uh, very functional in, uh, in nature. Uh, the Delta smelt, obviously, is part of the state's Delta smelt resiliency strategy. Uh, you've seen a presentation on this, but uh, this year uh, some folks got together and said, let's try uh, a functional flow down through the Yolo Bypass for the benefit of smelt. Um, and four of the uh, entities in the valley uh, uh, worked on this, working again with Department of Water Resources and the uh, fishery agencies. And again, some of the uh, early uh, indications are from the scientific perspective that the results were very promising as far as the food production that comes from this. This is a uh, functional flow, the kind of thing I think that we ought to be uh, thinking more about. Kind of the consummate functional flow, I think in a lot of ways, is the way we've managed flows for birds. Uh, the Pacific Flyway, I think by most measures, is kind of the environmental success story of our generation. Uh, let's uh, think about why that is. It's in large part because we spread water out over the Sacramento Valley. Uh, the refuge managers do a nice job of that. The water district managers spread that water out through the rice lands for the rice decomposition. And I think that functional flow has really benefited the environment. It's not a lot of water, but it's a very functional flow that uh, works quite well. And I think the thing we have learned from that is that it's the energetics model is the producing the food that really was the game changer for the birds on the Pacific Flyway. And I think uh, we're now looking at a lot of that for uh, some of the fish species, spreading that water out, slowing it down over the region. Let's create some food, either the fish in the fields, if that can work in certain circumstances, like you've heard about nigiri, or producing the fish food on the fields and managing the water during the uh, fall and winter for uh, food production. We think those are the kinds of functional flows that we think are the uh, future uh, for uh, California. So I'll uh, just going to sum up a, con a couple things. Um, again, Walter talked about the, uh, the, the consumptive use has uh, been stable since the 50s. Um, we, again, are trying to figure out why there's been more water that has been pushed down into the delta, and yet the fish don't uh, respond to that in a favorable way. What else is going on? I think some of the new science reports are starting to, to look at that question in a real hard way. There'd be significant impacts on the Sacramento Valley, we know that, and uh, there's already a whole series of agreements and comprehensive regulatory requirements. Uh, we think that uh, we really hope that the Water Board would embrace a, a true functional flow approach where we uh, look at the uh, every function that uh, the drop of water would serve. Uh, I think we're all very interested in uh, pursuing that. And uh, we think this is consistent with uh, at least what we saw from the Independent Science Board on uh, November 18th, and I know they're gonna be giving you additional information as well. On that point, we really do encourage the engagement of them in an effective way, both the Independent Science Board as well as the lead scientist. And I guess the thought that occurred to me as you were asking some of these questions is, I hope that uh, we appreciate the fact that you're gonna get peer review, but I guess we hope that you get your science in a little bit stronger place before you do the peer review. I think the peer review would be a 
lot more valuable if you had something there as opposed to something that's kind of a little less uh, robust. So I guess I would encourage you to think about that in your process to uh, to build in making this a little bit more robust before you seek the peer review. I think it'd be a lot more uh, beneficial to, to you and to everybody else. So uh, with that said, if we could switch the PowerPoint. Now we're going to kind of switch to the American. Tom uh, Goring obviously has brought a lot of folks together in the American River and I think kind of give you a vignette of what this looks like from a, a practical perspective on the American system. Okay, well, while that's loading, um, can I do a time check? I know we're, you, you have a lot to do, so. Yeah, can you ten, do it in 10? Yep, you bet. Um, let me start with some thank yous while it's loading. Thanks, um, Chair Marcus, members of the board. Thanks to the Sac Valley folks for letting me sort of tag on the end here. <laughs> I feel a little bit like a free rider, but thanks. Um, and thanks to staff uh, for putting out the scientific basis report. You didn't have to, right? You could have gone straight to a, an SED. And um, we've had an opportunity to talk with some of staff um, about the report already. They appear to really want um, our, our thoughts, and we appreciate that. I also appreciate the job they're doing. They're trying to, as I understand it, come at this with a programmatic approach, um, and it's a big system. I'm gonna talk about just a little part of the system. We're a spoke in a big wheel, um, and our spoke is the American River. We've been working on um, uh, recovering our salmonid species in the American for a couple of decades now, and we've been working in earnest on um, doing that by adjusting flows. Um, it's something, you know, we, we've not used the word functional flows, but when I hear the discussion today and the, some of the discussions I've had with staff about the idea of a block of water that is sculpted to meet specific biological needs, I think we fit in that rubric, the work that we've been doing. Uh, we have, honestly, we have not given a lot of thought in our 15 years of working on flow standards on the American about our contribution to the Delta. We've focused on our local thing, right? And so I get that staff is trying to now meld work on tributaries with a need in the Delta, and I think it's hard. Um, uh, I won't give you the background on the river. Everybody knows the American River is like right out there, right? It's right there. Just go out there. Um, just some background. Uh, we, uh, when we talk about the work we've done, I think it includes the um, the water form agreement, um, uh, which uh, talks about a lot of things, including water conservation and groundwater management. But we've also been working in earnest on um, ongoing habitat improvements, a lot of gravel projects, um, remove, removal of uh, invasive things like that. We've been working um, indirectly to improve the physical facilities on the American, specifically the temperature control device and, um, and uh, 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 some devices as, not, uh, as yet not built to help uh, control temperature and, and utilize the cold water pool behind Folsom. And we've been um, sort of steadily doing a set of ongoing st scientific studies uh, for several years. I really think that we have um, ad adopted an adaptive management approach in the work that we've done. I think that, um, uh, you know, I can I can point to some of our gravel augmentation work that is much different now than it was five years ago because of lessons learned. Um, also, the flow standard that we developed in 2006 and the refinements we've been working on since then embed um, adaptive principles. They, for, for instance, the the minimum flow requirement is a sliding scale depending on how much water is available in the hydrology in any given year. The temperature management approach is redone every year based on availability of cold water um, resources in that year. So um, I'll just reiterate, I think we've been kind of doing functional flows. Um, and in the work that we've done, we, um, so we had, a, we had a flow standard in 2006. It was, it's been being used by reclamation. It was sort of adopted um, in, a bio, in NIMP's biological opinion in 2009. But since 2009, for a variety of reasons that I won't go into today, we've been looking at refining it. Because, um, you know, I, I was in 4-H when I was a kid, and the 4-H motto is make the best better. And we've been doing that with our flow standard. Um, and we've looked at some things, some refinements that show promise. We've looked at some things that didn't really pan out. Um, the promising thing, we've looked at um, a storage requirement. 
um, uh, pri primarily to provide temperature management. I really, uh, I really, my brain really resonated with um, your panel member from NOAA Fisheries who said there are times when a need for water temperature in a tributary is actually more vital than a need to have a specific flow. And we have definitely found that to be true on the American. Um, we've, we've, um, we've played virtually with pulse flows. We've had some pulse flows um, during the drought that we think were successful. And so we're definitely moving in that direction with um, our refinements to the flow standard. And recently we've updated some of the hydrologic indices um, and the minimum flow curves that we've used um, l largely to be more responsive to the actual hydrology in the region rather than an, an apparent hydrology, which some of our old indices did. Um, and we re have resculpted our minimum flows largely to be able to grab some water and save it behind Folsom Reservoir in order, to, in order to augment a cold water pool in your drier years. Areas where we've been unsuccessful, we have tried um, a, what we called an unconstrained temperature operation. We said, what if, what if we had, for purely for temperature management purposes, what if we had full control of Folsom Reservoir? And we wrote a computer program that, that optimized. It, it went through, you know, for every year over our 82-year simulation period, it, it went through hundreds of different possible operational scenarios for Folsom, and it, we were able to significantly improve temperature in Folsom. Uh, excuse me, in the Lower American River. Sort of like if, if we could, uh, if all you cared about was the American River and temperature and you could fully opt, uh, you know, optimize Folsom, we could do a better job with temperature. Unfortunately, in doing that, we had a ripple effect up at Shasta, which destroyed their cold water pool, which had an impact to Winter Run. This was before the last couple of years where Winter Run has been like the driving force in all statewide operations, right? And it was like, no, we, you just can't do it. That's too much of a disruption. Another unsuccessful approach we've used is something we've called a high spring flow approach. And this is something we developed in um, reading some of the previous work that state board staff has done and chatting with state board staff. We, did the, we, we basically took the idea of taking a block of water in the spring and dedicating it towards outflow. And what we found was that it, it was an unacceptable approach. I'll say a little bit more about why. So this is a, um, an exceedance graph. For those of you who don't like exceedances, my apologies. Um, but basically, this shows the, um, uh, the amount of flow leaving the Lower American River in volume for um, three different scenarios. One in, uh, in gray is the existing condition. The one in red is our high spring flow alternative. The one in blue is um, our most recent incantation of a, um, a refined flow standard, um, or at least the, the incantation we had about a year ago when we were doing this, um, uh, this study. And so you can see that we've dedicated more flow, in, uh, particularly in the drier years, because um, the red curve is higher than the others. And you can see a, a, a difference. That's more flow. That's more spring flow. Um, trying to do somewhat of a, an unimpaired flow approach, a, a, an, an analog to an unimpaired flow approach. Unfortunately, what you see as a result is by the time you get to June, you have significantly lower storage in Folsom, the red curve being much lower than the others. Why is that important? Well, as this curve points out, lower flow in Folsom on the right side of your curve means colder temperature, excuse me, lower flow on the left side of the curve means higher temperatures in the lower American. There's a direct correlation. If you use, if you release, and, and I think Walter was alluding to this in some of his modeling, if you release a whole bunch of flow prior to May and June, you decimate your cold water pool, and on a stream where you've got a temperature control device and you're judiciously managing that cold water for, for fisheries, it's an unacceptable trade-off we believe, for the American. And this is a, um, uh, a, uh, um, a temperature exceedance. You can see this, this is a, uh, an exceedance of temperatures in the July through September period. That's the most critical period for our over-summering uh, juvenile steelhead. And you can see that temperatures for the, um, the high spring flow are just worse there, and they're unacceptable. Uh, that's sort of our functional flow approach. One other thing um, we're hoping to comment, uh, we hope to put in our comments that we submit by the deadline, is we want to point out that the, um, the location that staff has used to, um, uh, to, to get a gauge 
of the American River's contribution to the Delta, we think um, is is not exactly the right point. Um, they have um, they, they've they've used data to show the flow at the mouth of the American River and its percentage of unimpaired flow. We actually think um, uh, it, uh, a more appropriate place to do it is just downstream of the regional sanitation plant's discharge. By doing that, you would actually um, take the flow at the mouth, deduct off two big diversions that are on the Sacramento River, diversions that are actually, even though they're on the Sacramento, are diverting American River water for use in the sort of the American River um, uh, uh, basin, and that's at the city of Sacramento and at Freeport. And then you would add, um, also add in the, um, uh, the discharge at regional sand because it's a big chunk of return flow for the basin. This is a quick look. The, uh, the lowest curve on the graph, the orange curve, is a representation of the unimpaired flow in the scientific basis report. The higher ones are the three scenarios that I just talked about. Um, the high spring flow being the highest one at the top. You can see that it's, it's higher. But also the, the lower ones, um, it's significantly higher. You know, the, the amount of return flow coming in at regional sand is quite a bit more than the additional um, discharges, and we think that we think that that's a more accurate place to gauge our contribution to the delta. You also look that with our um, the blue curve, which is the our current refined flow standard that we're working on, our percentage of unimpaired flow is almost always above 40 percent. Um, this is the January through June, the period scientific basis report said they're concerned with. Um, so there's a big big contribution already. Again, we have not had the had the opportunity to really look at how we connect with the Delta. We're just starting to do that. I think this is a conversation we want to have with staff. Um, I think this is, yeah, last slide. Um, just to wrap it up, um, our current contribution to the Delta, when you consider the sort of the correction of regional sand and the other big diversions off of the Sacramento River are between 40 and 140 percent, median of 65 percent. So it's, it's a high contribution. It's definitely within staff's proposed range. Um, and then just to reiterate, we've been working on some functional flows, functional flows for quite a while now. Um, the American River system is a highly altered system. Folsom Dam isn't going anywhere. Nimbus Dam isn't going anywhere. And so we've taken the approach of trying to work with what we've got, um, optimize um, uh, habitat and temperature and um, and I think we've, uh, we've come a long way. Just want to point out my second to the last bullet on the slide says this is supported by a broad stakeholder co coalition. What I mean there is the folks in the water forum. Um, uh, it's cert that certainly doesn't mean the other folks on the panel with me. This has sort of been an in-family thing up until now. Our biggest next step in terms of bringing an entity into our tent on our refined flow standard is the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. We've been in ongoing conversations with them. They they, they are, uh, our, um, our holy grail here would have them agree with us that this is a better way to operate the river than the way we're doing it now. Um, uh, take some of the pressure off of them to meet temperature requirements on the lower American River without transferring impacts elsewhere. And, and we're in discussions with them now. So that's, that's it. I'm happy to answer questions or, or not. Um, questions? I, I only have one, and, and it actually uh, focused on David because David mentioned several of the, a, a number of agreements that are out there that shouldn't be touched. <laughs> or maybe I'm paraphrasing, uh, but they're going to have to be touched somehow, some way. It's better if you all touch them, or you know, if the if the farmers in those agreements touch them than if we have to touch them. But that's what's happening. That's what I heard from Tom is, and it may not be, uh, you know, one thing. I know. No, no. I, I'm just saying, you know, are there, I, I think, it, I, I only know the Yellow, the um, uh, Yuba Accord. They've got a group and they've got scientists and, and they can kind of, work with their system. I assume some of the others do as well. That really is the future. It's not that you can't touch these things, these agreements. It's, it's that people get ahead of being told they have to touch it. You know, thank you. Good, uh, 
Good observation and question. Yeah, no, I, I don't think I said that they shouldn't be touched. I said, I guess I just be careful, don't unwind them. Uh, um, you did say that. I think they all have adaptive management programs. You heard from Tom about his. You mentioned the Yuba Accord. Yes, these all, all have adaptive management. They will all evolve over time. That's the the idea. They all have biologists working on them, and I think that's the uh, goal. So, yeah, I just think there's such an integral part, though, of what we can bring to this uh, discussion that, you know, there's just been a lot of collaboration, a lot of work done in those areas, and let's just uh, build off of those is, I think, the way I think of it. Thank you. Could I add something to that, Chair Marcus? Sure. Because I, you've been so well behaved today. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think it's important to note that uh, the voluntary agreements that, that I think parties are hoping to be able to find a place for, uh, if they're going to be measured against an un, unimpaired flow standard for adequacy, that's going to be, I think, where there's a big problem because I think the voluntary agreements, at least what we're contemplating, uh, involve functional flows. And if, if the litmus test is, well, the only way these are going to be accepted is if you hit this marker on uh, unimpaired flows, that's going to create some difficulty. So I think, I think there's room for uh, not unwinding the uh, agreements and other regulatory requirements that are in place. Uh, but giving space for voluntary agreements that can can find that place where we have multiple benefits protected. Yeah, I, I, th I think we're having in some ways the regulatory and operational conversation, and I totally understand that, but I do think there's a bit of us all talking past each other, because as I'm listening to you, we have said 400 times in 400 ways that we're inviting exactly the functional flow and approach. In fact, the work that many of you have done is what's inspired us to even come up with this and people are focused on a worst case scenario about what unimpaired flows means, stick with it as a cartoon and then punch it in every way they can. And so we really all have to figure out how to get to the conversation I, and, and a sense of you know, what needs to be in the framework to be able to honor and acknowledge really good work so that people are using the water functionally as opposed to creating a caricature of what we're proposing, which we certainly can do. I also think we have a track record, or better or for worse, more so at a systems level of looking holistically at flows all times of years at temperature in the biggest crisis in modern history. We didn't do perfectly as a group, but certainly people tried, people in agencies tried beyond where they've ever gone before in terms of reaching across project and regulator lines. We're kind of in the middle on that, and we tried in that tough, circumstance. So none of the things you've talked about are new concepts. You know, it's built on what you've already done. It's built on a desire to have people to come together. And so I want to make sure that we do what we can to lay out the science. But as a group, we've, we've got to be in a conversation about where we go and where we really do stuff versus staying where we are or thinking we can do it all without flow. I mean, it just going to the extremes doesn't it doesn't help us, but I want to figure out what it is we need to do to give people the assurance that we're practically standing on our head to invite people to come in and give us a better way. But that has to happen with people at the local level coming up with better ways that actually will also help fish in a way that can be uh, uh, determined. And so I, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm talking to you because I'm comfortable, I'm, I'm not, I'm just frustrated that we're, even though we're saying we want something, people are saying, it's reminding me of some of my old bad boyfriends in like high school, <laughs> you know, where you would say. For the record reflect, say, Andy Hitchings reminds of Felicia of old boyfriends <laughs> here. Uh, did, I, did I hear that right? Wow, Andy. I'm going to move to strike. Yeah. No, you know the issue of, you know that argument you have where you say, I'd really, I'd really, you know, prefer it if you didn't call you know, five minutes before you're late, and the response is, I did not kill your cat. You know, so there's there's some level of conversation where we've got to all be in the same conversation. You may have to help us with the words to use. I, I'm going to I'm gonna try here, okay? And I know... <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah, I don't want to tell you about my boyfriend. <laughs> I don't even know where he is anymore. <laughs> um, I think that there are strong views on all sides on this issue of what it is called. And I have come to the realization that the only way we're going to get out of this is that people can call it whatever they want to call it. Um, 
because the only agreement that I'm hearing is a block of water. I would rather we not use unimpaired flow, but I think that train left the station long ago. And if um, I actually agree with what you're saying, if we're locked into some, you know, some certain amount on unimpaired flow, then that's where the conversation is going to focus. But if there is enough leadway within the document that people can call it whatever they want, a block of water, then that ought to be the focus. Um, I'm guessing that the concern is that uh, you, you take an unimpaired number and back it out with whatever the time frame is, February through June, and you figure out how much that is. And it's some block that maybe folks feel comfortable or uncomfortable about. So um, it, it, maybe we just need to jump past unimpaired and get right to the conversation about the block of water and whether or not that block is needed to meet the list of functional flows that uh, the stakeholders that know and understand uh, the individual systems, and then of course looking at the bigger item on you know the delta, um, and I really appreciate, Tom, what you said about um, needing to kind of get beyond your region and have a better understanding about uh, you know, because you can look at functional flow on the American, and then um, how do you then translate that to the bigger needs of the system? And so, obviously, that's going to take a lot more than just uh, coordination with the folks in the forum. It's going to involve uh, uh, reaching out to a, a much broader stakeholder community. I would just like to um, ask uh, the same question that I asked earlier of the fish agencies, and that is, um, what can you all do to um, help, and I don't know that it necessarily needs to be in the scientific basis, but uh, it, it would be great if you have some ideas on this, and that is how to uh, better quantify um, fish benefits, and then also um, uh, uh, the ab uh, ability to make adjustments within the context of adaptive management, i.e. flow adjustment um, uh, in, as a trade-off for habitat or some other way to address a stressor. And I think that um, uh, even though the, the best place maybe to park that would be in um, the SED, but we're hoping that these conversations go on now. And so it would be great to hear folks' ideas on how to analyze and quantify those uh, benefits so as to uh, help you all in the discussions that you hopefully are having now or you will be having soon. Yeah, uh, well, on, on the American, we've done um, a fair amount of work on um, a uh, mortality model for uh, uh, for for salmon um, for fall run specifically, although it's it's the principal supply to other streams and 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 the other runs, um, but we um, you know that's not telling you anything about trade offs at the delta, trade offs outside the American. It's also not capturing you know our our listed species, which is steelhead. You know there's so there's such a small amount of scientific information. Um, on, on, on whether or not they're even present, wh let alone their response. And so we, we've actually, you know, it, it, like a lot of things, it goes in cycles. And, and at some point in the cycle, we all say, we need a better um, uh, conceptual model that connects our water management and habitat actions with a biological response. But we're, we, we've not been able to crack that nut. I don't know that anyone has. And so, um, you know, you can run calcium and you can figure out how, where does the water go? And then you can take calcium data and put it in temperature models and say, what, is the, what temperature does that do? And then we, we, so far, we've only been able to look at that, those outputs and say, these are, these are comparatively, you know, usually we're comparing a couple of runs. Comparatively speaking, these actions look better than those actions. And being able to have a third model where all that data goes in and it says this many steelhead on this stream, this many fall run, this many winter on this stream, 
I, it, it doesn't exist yet, and I think we may be a long time from having something like that. I, I, and, and Member Diadamo, I might have misunderstood your question, but if that no, was the I, question, I, that I was, think you that's got my it, understanding. But, but if, if it doesn't exist, then what else should be used that should be good enough in the short run? You know, other than, gee, that just feels, that, that one, that project feels yeah. right. Yeah, I know. I think if I'm hearing the question right, I think for all the projects we talked about earlier on these kind of these functional flow dynamics, there is some robust study that's being done around each one of those to measure the effectiveness. I think that's your question is, you know, do we have effectiveness monitoring? And so, for example, on some of these fish and food dynamics, we're working with UC Davis, working with conservation organizations to make sure that we do have a robust science program. And yeah, we'll, I think, be honest about that, right? We'll, we'll look at it and say, gee, that worked really well, or gee, that didn't work. Let's try something different. And I think that's what we're really looking for is let's let's be honest about this and uh, and adjust as we need to because we're all interested in improving fish and birds. I think that's the that's the objective I know that we have. Yeah. So um, on you know the the concern about measuring up against a percent unimpaired flow um, <laughs> benchmark. Um, we sh I hope you get assurance through this process that we are really we're strongly encouraging biological goals that are not just dictated by fishery agencies, but um, really are vetted through research scientists and um, the water user uh, funded biology studies, um, really to, to get to a joint fact finding um, uh, ideal uh, working together. So I want to compliment you, uh, Mr. Gehring, and, and all the folks uh, at the forum, because there are there is actually measurable results from from that work and the you know that getting outside of the comfort zone and looking at multiple objective planning for water resources and the lower american river is one of our good examples and as you know you're still learning and adaptively managing um, i my hope is that our science study can really take the information learned through these these efforts and think about the way of scaling up as as board member Diadamo and others talked about, and you know, that's our challenge now is take those hard won agreements and lessons learned and adaptive structures and integrating them the way the water cycle is integrating them now and and thinking of a way you know what fine tuning that and value added that our process can provide because uh, it's it's not going to happen without it. You know, and and so that so it's not just it's we're not it's not a personal thing. It's not a state water board thing. It's this is a process that's going to empower us to take all of these um, agreements and successes and some failures and scale it up into the larger system. So I, I don't want us to be held back by the idea that flow is the only thing we're going to look at. It's an index. You know, in engineering, I'm very comfortable. I always liked bioassessment tools because they're indices of biology, but they help us, you know, make decisions and have a, a decision matrix and adaptively manage. And so, flow is one index that we'll certainly look at. And it was useful to me in your presentation to give us the index. The median number is 65%. It's it's a useful piece of information. It doesn't make me as a regulator say, oh, okay, we're going to hold them to that. Uh, it's more that that's an index, and uh, it's real interesting looking at this in the San Joaquin system how the indexes are different, you know, in different systems. Uh, but we want to be respectful of the, of all the work done to date, and so I want to just in response to your concern, um, emphasize what you even heard from the fish panel today was the, the strong interest in coming up with biological goals, but they can also be operational goals, um, you know. Uh, percent gravel restoration in this reach or these systems of reaches and that sort of thing. So, you know, it's not just flow. It's not just abundance of steelhead in, in this, you know, in out migrants in these water years. It's all of these things that, that combine to, you know, a, a more of a complex uh, uh, index that takes into account many things. So, you know, I think I, I want to create, if anything, just through those comments create some assurance of, of my interest and I think our staff's interest uh, in not holding ourselves to just one narrow set of indices. Yeah, the only thing I would add, because I'm mindful of the, the time and the fact that we can have 
more conversations is we do have to figure out how to be in the same conversation. I wouldn't want to change. I, I said once, you know, we call it Bob for all I care. I just want to get the, the it, who was not the high school boyfriend, by the way, but <laughs> that was college. But anyway, the, um, is the, the issue is, the issue is that the unimpaired flow notion of trying to mimic the natural hydrograph is best science. There's something in the way it's being seen in terms of what we have in mind that's not. Because what we have in mind are figuring out how to craft functional flows of ultimately mindful of the total amount of water. But I, I don't want to, in as you know, I do believe in multiple stressors and figuring out how to manage it, but I don't want to leave the, motion, the notion that we can do it without adding more flow. Because all the stuff I've seen indicates we've taken more out than the system can bear, and that is what the scientific basis report is about, at least in part, and we do need to focus on that as well right here. So what are the questions and the issues that we need to make sure we articulate so that we don't waste a lot of time either with each other or with the scientific community because we haven't articulated what the questions are that we're asking. And this is extremely helpful for that since we've all worked together quite a bit, and if we're having this challenge in communicating, that is a real indicator that we've got a collectively, not just us, but you all need to work on it as well, and it's also what the Independent Science Board said. So it's very useful and very um, helpful, but I don't think we're going to wish away the need for more flow. I think the hard thing is to figure out how, when, and what's, uh, what's reasonable, and ultimately down in that SED process and plan process, it is our job to do the balancing, and here we're just trying to figure out how do we get this piece of the foundation there um, to understand the best science that we have right now to work on that's going to underpin a part of what we do. The, the, the challenge that I'm having with this, though, is that um, uh, th my understanding of what unimpaired flow is, um, maybe from a purist perspective, is different from, what the, from how we've described it. So I think in, uh, in actual practice, the way we've described it, or, or our staff has described it, um, it's it's a block of water. It's being held back as a, back as a block of water. If we look at like say phase one, February through June, and then we have a fall pu pulse flow, that's not an impaired flow. It's a block of water that's being used um, as a functional flows. And so I, I guess Bob could be called George or Mike or whatever, and it's it's just it's getting back to what I said earlier. I I've wrestled with this for some time, and I finally have come to the conclusion that unless we're willing to call it something else, then the settling parties need to call it whatever they can, so that they can take it back to their sure. constituents sure. and say we're comfortable. We're calling it Bob, and somebody else is calling it Mike, and. Yeah. They're they're just as comfortable with it, and, and unless I'm missing something. But I don't think that we're the the way the staff has described it is truly an unimpaired flow because of how it would be utilized. Well, right. They're not proposing that it be strict. They're proposing it as an approximation of mimicking the natural hydrograph, which I learned from the Delta Council three years on it talking to Cliff Dom and all the scientists over time and how that actually gives you the most economical way to use the water you do have because you're dealing with all the things staff said about cues, et cetera, et cetera. But you have to come up with a way to approximate the standard unless you want to go back to what it is that we tried to do in D1641 and other ones where we tried to say in these months you do exactly this and then you get into right. the other. But, but in that instance, I guess it's un unimpaired is being used to determine what is that block. Is the block this big or this big? And, and, so it's, and a suggestion it's unimpaired of when it's by a needed. Percentage. It's not totally separate from that. It's, that's why the notion is shaping of it. But people have a better way to tell us to explain it. I'm looking at Jay because he's such a good writer. You know, well... They can help us with that. I mean, if, if our biggest problem is uh, nomenclature, then we have a less challenging job ahead than I suspect we do, but it is an important piece mm -hmm. of it. All right, I'm going to suggest we break for lunch. It's possible that protein will assist us. And um, how much time do you guys want? Half hour? Half hour. We don't have a time. We got a lot more. So people really came to listen to the conversation. Yeah, cards? Okay, so that's good. So we do have time. This is working. Uh, the conversation's good. We'll have a lot more. 
And for the record, all of you said something I was reacting to, not just Mr. Hitchens. <laughs> Which is not a critique of you, it's also a self-critique. <laughs> he doesn't look anything like Bob <laughs> or Scott.
Great. Thanks very much. Uh, we're now back. It is 1.38. Um, and we don't, uh, obviously a lot of folks have come to listen and we, uh, we don't have a ton of speaker cards which will allow us to continue the conversation um, today. We have uh, a few more uh, speakers and I think uh, I'll take Stockton East next if that's okay. It's a shorter presentation and then I'll take the next uh, two together and then I will um, do each want uh, five to ten minutes and then we'll go to the speaker cards. Hi. And you have a PowerPoint, two different dates, so you've updated it, right? 12? Yeah, they, they That's fine. Oh, good. Okay. That way we'll post the right one. Terrific. Okay. Hi. Hi there. Mr. Kopp. My Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. My name is Gabriel Kopp. I'm a senior biologist and director at Fish Bio, uh, representing Stockton East Water District. And today we wanted to talk about the Calaveras River. That is the primary uh, and most reliable water source uh, for Stockton East uh, Irrigation District. So, <coughs> water district, excuse me. So, you may think that uh, the, the, the revision today that came out, that the, the Calaveras River does not support spring run of Chinook, um, what kind of killed the thunder on the presentation? It's one of my two points, um, <laughs> but it was it was good to highlight and good to identify that the Calaveras River does not support spring run chinook habitat has not historically or currently, and that's that's a key factor. But uh, what has come to light really is is a larger uh, trend and issue that we we want to both productively highlight and and help. Uh, participate in the correction of, and, and that's getting to know the Calaveras River. So if I had my PowerPoint over lunch, I probably would have retitled it Getting to Know the Calaveras River. Mm -hmm. um, there are some, some statements uh, in the scientific basis report that uh, are uh, not quite accurate, and, and really what we want to do is, is, is help with that. Um, one item that has come up is uh, an inferred connection between New Maloney's and the Calaveras River. New Maloney's does not transfer water into the Calaveras River. There's no uh, flood release transfer. There's no connection between Stanislaus River flow and the Calaveras River. So uh, any, any statement to that effect uh, is, is not accurate and needs to be looked at. Um, there also is an issue with treating the Calaveras River like a, a perennial stream. And really what I want to do today is highlight a little bit more information uh, about how the Calaveras has historically and currently operated. Because if we were to treat the Calaveras River based on its natural hydrograph, uh, it would dry in the summertime and effectively eliminate the fishery that currently resides there. So it's, it's a different kind of stream. And I think that you have a, an enormous challenge of, of designing a plan for many types of streams, but this one's a bit different. And so we wanted to help be part of that process to uh, clarify some of these issues. So I'm going to skip over the, the revision to spring run. Um, it was stated that uh, the, they were in the Calaveras River based upon an IPS 2014 report, and we appreciate that clarification. Um, in, in support of the, the, the larger idea, uh, there were historical observations getting down to bullet three here. I'm just going through these quick, but getting down to bullet three, Clark in 1929 reported that, that the Calaveras River was mostly dry in the summer and fall. This is the, the natural hydrography that you would have expected there. Mm -hmm. uh, Yoshiyama also stated that the Calaveras River is, is really not much of a salmon stream. It's not historically been. It really doesn't set up well for that. So let's look at a little bit more information about just why that is. This is the, the Calaveras watershed. And I think just looking from a course perspective, it speaks for itself. It's relatively small. It's the green, it's the green one uh, sitting in between the, the, the red and the yellow there. And it's also low elevation. So it doesn't have access to snowpack. This is a rain-fed system. So it's going to behave quite a bit differently than its neighboring streams. Now, it's, it's easy. You see it line right up with the other east side tribs. Mm -hmm. And you know, the inference is it's going to behave in a similar fashion. 
but it, it does not. Um, getting on to our, our next slide, we're, we're kind of moving into the upper basin here. This is the, the upper north fork of the Calaveras River. And you can see from the hydrography here that this is, again, a, a rain-fed system. You're seeing, as you move into those, those summer flows, um, they're not there. And this obviously doesn't support well for, for any type of uh, salmon. Um, and, and really, under historic hydrography, would not support oversummering holding habitat very well for any type of cold water fish. You move over to the South Fork, also remaining in the upper basin, you see a similar hydrography. So what is different today from the historical hydrography, kind of you know, fast forwarding? And so we have New Hogan Reservoir now in place. New Hogan holds back some of those winter flows that we would have um, historically seen go down the stream and preserves those flows for summertime release, allowing for there to be a base flow from New Hogan to the Belota diversion. And this base flow is what allows for the fishery to persist. Without it, without that multiple beneficial uses release, it's, it's used for, for diversion and irrigation and municipal uses. Without that, um, we would not have the, the fishery that is currently there. So it's, it's actually creating a positive. And it's still functioning in a similar historic format. It's disconnecting from the San Joaquin River. That's what it historically did. That's what it still currently does. Now, many people would, would look at that and say, well, wouldn't it be better if it remained connected year round? Um, this, is, this can't be a good thing that it actually is, is only going with 18 miles of quality habitat. Why not all the way to the, the San Joaquin? Well, the, the, the channel from Belota to the San Joaquin confluence is a flood control channel. We're not talking high quality habitat. We're not talking you know, uh, usable upper watershed habitat that you commonly see uh, you know, in Omicus uh, in. And what's more, <clears throat> we've seen when you maintain some of these lower river habitat types, it allows for our non-native predators to take a foothold. And by not keeping that wetted year round, we don't see as many predators in the Calaveras River. It's a different dynamic, but it actually has played out really well. So it's, it's, it's a different stream to, to, to look at altogether. Looking at storage on the Calaveras, um, it's, it's significantly smaller than the surrounding basins. New Hogan has a total capacity of 317,000 acre feet. But we, we do not manage up to that. That is, that is the maximum capacity there. And there's 100,000 uh, acre feet of unimpaired total flow coming off. So this is, this is a, a significantly smaller watershed than the surrounding areas. When you look at the unimpaired flow comparisons here, this is where I kind of get excited because you see how different the Calaveras is. The Calaveras is the, the, the yellow line, the bottom yellow line there. And you're seeing that it's really behaving like a rain-fed stream. You get that nice little bump during the precipitation months there, but then you don't get that, that spring freshet, that, that snowpack melt-off where you get that rain-on-snow event. And so it looks more like a coastal stream in its, its actual shape and form. And uh, it, it behaves quite a bit differently, but it works. When you integrate the new Hogan management into the system and then you, you manage for those summer base flows going through, you actually get a really high quality fishery there. So in wrap up, we really do feel as though the Calaveras is, is a different river. It's going to need to be treated differently. This is one of those streams where we're going to have to kind of work together to get a plan that fits for this stream because it's different from the others that we've been talking about today by quite a bit. If we were to stick with uh, you know, a high unimpaired flow just coarsely, um, it would drain New Hogan Reservoir and effectively ruin the fishery and the, and the great system that we have set up. So having seen some of these, these you know, areas where we could improve upon the scientific basis report, um, Stockton East has offered to sit down with the water board to help with these clarifications. Um, Fish Bio has been monitoring in the basin and has been the, really the sole long-term monitoring research group in the basin for the past 10 years. So we do have a, a good amount of data that we'd be happy to, to work with the water board and help get these clarifications right on point. 
And I just wanted to thank you for the time and thank being you. able to participate. I, ju I just have That's a, helpful. a hopefully, hopefully just a quick question here. Sure. Could you talk about the optimum conditions for Omicus on the Calaveras? What we're able to do is maintain uh, a base release so that in the upper canyon reaches, the, the, Cal, uh, the Calaveras is able to uh, shade and, and cool the water in the, the canyon reach. And there's, this is really getting into, the, again, the unique structure of the Calaveras. It's a, it's a very, very cool stream. There is, where, where New Hogan is, there's a, there's a dam reach, and then there's a canyon reach. And in that canyon reach, that is where all the Omicus are going to hold. And so the, the New Hogan Reservoir is able to provide a base release flow that keeps that canyon cool. I mean, we could get into all the details here, but I'm, I'm, I'm totally going to be too coarse to do a good job of it. Um, but when you look at the structure and the base release coming out of New Hogan, that canyon reach, which you don't really see in other rivers, because usually the dam is in front of the canyon reach and you, you lose access to all that habitat, that's what's in the Calaveras. Um, so it's, 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 we, we really think it's unique and special. It's odd. People, you know, they, they hear about the Calaveras and they, they don't know which stream that is or where it is, but it really is a, a unique place. And so for Matt or Diane or Chris, we can work with them. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and we've been, we reviewed the PowerPoint presentation beforehand and we're planning to address this. I think again, this, their flow regime and maintaining the flows downstream of the reservoir is totally compatible with, you know, our adaptive management approach that we're proposing. So I, I think, you know, we're happy to discuss the details with them. Um, but. Um, this is this is something you know we're happy to consider. Very good, thank you. I have John Rubin from the San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority, followed by Gary Bobker from the Bay Institute. If you want to come down and sit next to each other as a panel, you can. <laughs> I, I, in fact, I, in, I, I insist I, I like that, that you do. No, seriously, come on down and you can sit. Five minutes is longer than three. I think they should change their names to Bob and Mike. <laughs> I'm sorry. I regret that example, but you do all know what I was talking about. To be recognized as a panel <laughs> I'm saying we all have to stretch to work together to make this work. Mr. Mr. Rubin. Th thank you. Mr. Um, you can give them uh, 10 minutes, but I think they're each just going to take five. Thank you, uh, John Rubin. I am general counsel for the San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority. And uh, my, my remarks today are, are going to bring us back uh, to the the report uh, that's at issue. I think prior to lunch, we spent a lot of time talking about the results of not just the report, but a lot of additional work that we expect the staff to be doing and that you will be doing. And, and uh, there may be some disagreement or maybe some confusion, frankly, in terms of what the report is intended to do. Uh, when, when we at the Water Authority have reviewed the report, we looked at it as establishing a scientific foundation and, and, and a foundation for the decisions that you need to make as a board, um, evaluating and balancing the types of protections that are necessary from a water quality standpoint. Um, and, and in order to do that, it seems that the information needs to be um, uh, balanced, complete, um, and uh, very thorough. Um, and, um, and, and we do have um, some concerns about that that we will provide in writing to you. But let me uh, turn to the, the significant concern uh, with the report that we want to raise with you today. Um, and, and at this point, our concern is not with whether the report reflects a correct view, um, whether one view is, is right and one view is wrong. Uh, we also aren't concerned about uh, the, the objectives that you might set based upon the information at this point. Our concern is, is, is one based on, on process, and I'm not sure if the right term is, 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 is a lack of transparency, but um, 
it seems to us that we, there's a problem in the process. And, and, it, and you, you, you frankly, I think it's played out so far today. Um, we don't think the report adequately reflects differing views and the breadth of science that has been provided to you. And, and it played out today with, re, with the responses that you've heard from, from your staff that they are um, happy, are willing to consider information that's been presented today. Uh, what's troubling is a lot of the information that at least I've heard is information that has been presented to you uh, over the course of years now. Uh, frankly, the 2012 workshops that you had scheduled was a process intended to start that discussion, and, and I'm not sure if it continued. It doesn't seem like it has. We haven't been involved in a lot of that discussion. It, it's not that a ton of work went on during these, the three drought years that people were excluded from. It's just we were all, including you all, working on responding to the drought. So it's just we're picking up where we would have been three years ago, just so you know. That, does, that doesn't mean there's adequate incorporation. I'm not, I'm not um, opining one way or the other, but just that pe folks in other contexts have taken that three-year lull to assume that we've all been working on it full time for those three years, but we all were working on the drought. Just, I mean, that can just help understand. understand. Um, and, and I'm gonna uh, uh, move away for a second from my prepared remarks and, and comment on uh, two things that was presented to you today by your staff. Uh, first, uh, there was some discussion about the report uh, analyzing ecological functions, um, that the report looks at physical responses to flow, and, and frankly, we just don't see it in the report. And maybe we've missed it, um, but, but we don't see that type of analysis. And the second thing I would note is, is uh, there was a number of slides, I think two or three slides, that talked about the kind of flow abundance relationship. Uh, and here's another example where some of the information was presented. Uh, frankly, it sounded pretty conclusory to me when it was presented. Uh, and, and obviously that's okay for your staff to do, but it would be much, I think, more useful for us, maybe for you as well, if, if um, additional information was presented when those types of discussions are, are, are had. Um, a, as an example, you had a flow abundance uh, graph that was put up, um, but questions like, can abundance be improved through regulation of, of inflow or outflow? In other words, requiring releases from storage, will that change abundance? Do you think it will? If, 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 what's the uncertainty or the certainty with the action? As well as the degree of change. Uh, it may be uh, helpful for you to hear that increased flow will change of uh, abundance, but what happens if it takes a million acre feet to, to change 1%? I mean, that type of analysis, that type of discussion doesn't seem to be present and could be very helpful as, as you're doing your balancing. <clears throat> Let me uh, turn back to my prepared remarks and, and comment on, on uh, three um, areas of comment, three issues that, have, that we heard um, throughout the earlier processes that do not seem to be responded to. And, uh, I, I am trying to be careful with our remarks. We did ask for additional time to comment. That request was denied. It's very challenging, given the issues that particularly the water authority is facing and its members are facing, to uh, go through a document like this um, and provide meaningful comments, even with the time frame that has been provided. And so the, um, I do want to um, be careful. There's, it's very possible that we're missing information or that we haven't picked up on some of the subtleties in the document. But here are three areas that, uh, that we looked at um, and, and questioned uh, whether the document adequately addressed the issues. The, the first is uh, it's, it's not clear that the document addresses a comment that was raised during the scoping period and during the 2012 workshops. Uh, and uh, probably one of the most direct comments came from the US EPA. Uh, and the US EPA um, cautioned against um, the use of surrogates like X2 or flow, um, and and they 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 provided direction, um, their their perspective that the approach should address the conditions or parameters that directly affect the beneficial uses, um, and examples are salinity and temperature. Uh, they did note that uh, surrogates may be used, but when they are used, there should be a linkage to the measurable field parameters. 
um, and, and they should be related explicitly um, to the beneficial, the, how, how they're protecting beneficial uses and should be cite, there should be citation to sound science. Related to that are comments that were also raised during the 2012 workshop, um, subsequently raised uh, in a, the 2014 outflow report that came out of the, uh, the outflow workshop. It was also raised uh, recently, August uh, 2015, by the Independent Science Board related to um, use of correlations. There's a number of places where your, your staff is relying upon correlations um, and um, Cliff Dom in the 2012 workshops cautioned against it. The, out, uh, the report that came out of the outflow workshop cautioned against it and so did the ISB in their fish and flow report. And then lastly, um, and maybe most important frankly, um, is the, uh, the lack of um, alternative methods for establishing flow requirements. Today, we've, we've heard um, that the, the approach that is intended to be reflected in the report is an unimpaired flow approach, but it's really a functional flow approach. Um, again, that may be your staff's perspective. It, it may be what they intended to put in the document. It's not the way I, most of us are reading it, frankly. No. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll turn to a couple of citations just to give you a sense of at least why there's confusion. Uh, if you look at page 1-9 of the report, there's a section, use of unimpaired flows, uh, and, and it talks about uh, while unimpaired flows are not natural flows, they can uh, use, be used to provide more natural flow functions, especially uh, when implemented in an adaptive framework. And so it's not saying we're gonna set a block, it's not, that, it's not explicit, we're not setting a block, using that as a paradigm, but we're, we're, we're asking for functional flows. It's, it's we are setting a, a percent of unimpaired flow as the tool, and then we may change that in the future depending on what we learn. Um, and, and it does continue with, with the, you know, the, the, uh, a scientific basis for why they're approaching the, the way they are, and, and it says the, the report specifically fly, finds that flows are needed to m more closely mimic the conditions to which native fish species have adapted. Uh, and so you put those two together and there's other statements in here where, where the, the, the kind of the paradigm that's been set is unimpaired flows are roughly equivalent to natural flows and those are necessary because that's the way fish have ado uh, adapted over time. And so that's the way uh, a lot of us have been reading it. Maybe that's not the way staff intended it, but it, it's uh, trying to provide some explanation of why there's some confusion. <coughs> And so uh, I, I wanted to come today and um, um, turn maybe to a, 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 a solution, at least the way, a, a potential solution. Um, the Water Authority, independent scientists, academics, federal state agencies have provided comments. When you, when you read the documents, it's not Excuse me. It's not, it's not evident how those comments have been responded to in large part. I tried to provide some fairly important examples. Um, and, and I think it's critical um, for, for there to be a process that allows for those issues to be discussed in an open and transparent way, to try to reach collaboration. And I think that's what you started on in 2012, where, where there was a, an effort to bring together, identify where there's areas of agreement, where there's areas of disagreement, and what the uncertainty is associated with the science. And I think that that could uh, be a process that can be uh, undertaken that would improve the strength of the document. And I think it could be done in a way that doesn't adversely affect your schedule, the overall schedule. If your goal is to reach a, a decision by sometime in 2018, it seems to me that or the, the or schedule, sooner, actually, well, or maybe sooner, uh, but for phase two, I think at least what's been published is, is, is 2018. Putting that aside, the scientific basis can be developed. You can bring together uh, scientists on these issues, allow them to discuss what the, their concerns are with information that's been presented, try to distill that down so you have much clearer areas of agreement, disagreement, and uncertainty. And you can do that in parallel with the effort to develop other documents that are necessary to inform your decisions. Mr. Rubin, were you going to expand upon that? Because I'm not, I'm not clear as to what that process would look like. 
I shudder, even as an engineer, I shudder at the idea of pulling a bunch of scientists and engineers and modelers together in a room and asking them to reach consensus. Yeah, I, 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 um, you, I think there's a lot of merit to it. There are efforts that I can use as examples. I think one is the, the camped process that's uh, undertaken currently to try to resolve some of those issues. Uh, another example that I would cite to is, is a process that the state board followed for phase one, and in particular for South Delta salinity. I recall uh, several meetings that were staff driven. It was in either this room or uh, one of the other hearing rooms. You had a, a round table, you invited certain people with the expertise, they sat around, they talked about these issues. It, it allowed for a greater dialogue, a better understanding. Um, I, I, I guess I'm a bit afraid that some of the concerns are unfounded just because you're trying to read black and white and things can be misunderstood. I think there's opportunity where, where uh, your staff can ha be expanding the information. Uh, again, where we're focused right now is to get a document that provides you with the information that will be helpful. And, and uh, I listened to the Independent Science Board. One of their principal comments, I don't know if it will be reflected in their final comments, but it's, it's the lack of alternative methodologies for, for, for establishing a flow requirement. And your staff, I mean, the way the Independent Science Board presented it or discussed it at the meeting was you have unimpaired flow as a valid scientific approach. You have functional flows as a valid scientific approach. Uh, they had an, a third uh, approach that they talked about, but these are different approaches that can be used. There should be some discussion in this document on the value of, of those th different approaches in this highly altered system. Um, and, and I think your staff um, might benefit from further discussion, and it may be having the discussions separately, but I think that there's some downside to doing that, where your staff may be able to work through some of these issues with a s interested party, uh, but, but those that aren't involved lose the benefit of hearing that, hearing that discussion and, and understanding the, the depth of analysis or thought that goes into what's ultimately in the document. And so I don't know if that's helpful. It doesn't look like it's that helpful. Uh, uh, and would this be in lieu of or in concert with the independent peer review, external scientific peer review upon which this document will undergo? I would say it's, it's in concert or separate from. Uh, so, so as an example. And what value, I'm sorry, what value would it add in addition to the external scientific peer review that would be that will be conducted. I guess there's a, there's a couple of different things that can be added through this process. I think one is um, um, uh, uh, improved. Um, uh, it, it would improve the integrity of the document from the the water community perspective. I think that by having the engagement of the interested parties able to discuss, understand, uh, make sure their issues are heard um, and, uh, and considered, uh, I think it improves the integrity of the process. I, I, I would also like to believe that given the interest, the group of interested parties that are involved in these issues, that the scientific basis would be strengthened. There's limitations that, uh, that, the, that the peer review that you have to follow under the Health and Safety Code has. Um, and, 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 and frankly, I, I heard today some misunderstandings, I think, in terms of the unimpaired flow paradigm. And, and Chair, with all due respect, you indicated that uh, best available science supports unimpaired, the use of unimpaired flow uh, as a tool to set flow requirements. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I disagree with that, but where I do disagree is I don't know if the, 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 the scientific literature supports the use of unimpaired flow as that tool in a highly altered system like the Bay Delta. And the science that I've re reviewed, and again, I like, the, like the caveat that uh, Mr. Hitchings provided earlier, as a lawyer, I wouldn't want to uh, uh, kind of provide the word on this, but I've reviewed some science and it cautions against the use of unimpaired flow in a highly altered system. And so at least some science suggests that that's not the case when you're applying the general principles to the, to the actual uh, system here. And so I, 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 again, I, I'm, I, I see this as a separate process. It could be used before that 
independent review is done. It allows for uh, a greater buy-in in the process. It improves, it has the potential of improving the document. That's all we're thinking about. That's actually helpful. And I, it, the, you can either envision a massive process or smaller process, but point that thinking about alternate regimes at the same time and submitting them, unless it's so cumbersome as to make it impossible, is worth thinking about. Well, it, even just to illustrate a choice or to make sure your language is clear because what we saw today is people see unimpaired flow as kind of, and they build a whole megillah around it as opposed to it being, I was talking about it as a concept that works and a tool, not as the, you know, holy rule, but you have to find a tool but, to figure out how to approximate yeah, and, how and, you're going to set the standards unless you're going to try and do it to the day. And, so, and Chair but, Marcus, if, if that's the intent, again, it, it seems to me you have, you have a challenge because if, if the idea is to set aside a block of water and, and use that to serve particular functions, this document doesn't get into how those functions may be served with that block of water. It doesn't talk about dedicating water for a particular temperature within the delta, if that's the intent, or to improve turbidity within the delta, if that's the intent. And, and so if you're looking for a scientific basis for that structure, it seems to me that you get back to this question of where are the discussion of the water quality constituents that are traditionally dealt with, and how is flow going to improve those? How does that relate to all, the, all of these other stressors? And, and, and so th those are the challenges that, that we see with this, this new interpretation. Again, we read it as the approach was an unimpaired flow approach. I think that's, again, the way others have looked at it. And is there a basis for that in science? Uh, just, I, I just have to jump in just uh, uh, briefly. We're, I don't think uh, our intent is to tell Westlands or anyone, uh, any, you know, Sac Valley or whoever, exactly what to do. It's to, it's to set a block of water and then it's really the local uh, folks who are who are supposed to um, know their systems and work with stakeholders in those systems to deliver more fish or more you know better better conditions. I, well, I, it's kind of a both because we have to have a backstop regulatory regime. I mean, what we're trying to do is something more innovative, and I what I worry about is folks then twisting or taking and not. not maybe some malevolently, but doing it, either you can poke holes in anything, and what we're actually trying to do is increase flows, because the science does suggest that there needs to be more flows. In this conversation, I haven't heard anybody say the fish need less water. Well, let, There's let me, a question of how you might do it, but I don't want to get into an argument with you about it here. I probably spent too much time earlier, because I'm frustrated people talking past each other. What I do hear and what you're saying is stuff we're thinking about significantly in terms of how do we lay a foundation for giving us the ability to have the flexibility to do what we want to do in the standards without then having to draw every correlative, because this is what we hear, as if we have to have everything figured out about every drop that would go for what time, which multiple stressors, and we don't have to do that either, because that makes it impossible and wraps us around the axle, and it's very hard to not hear it sometimes as the intention to do just that. So what the way you just laid out what you think we ought to be thinking about and considering is helpful. Yeah, and and, and um, I, you're, we've had this conversation before about whether more water is needed. And, and I would not stand before you and suggest that less water or more water is needed. Uh, but I think the, the debate has to be, you know, when is war, more water needed? Yeah. Are we dedicating more water than we need at certain times and more water is needed at others? Um, and, and I would note for you, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not asking that you stop and that you wait until you have every answer. I don't, I mean, that's not going to happen um, and you shouldn't do that. Uh, one place to look uh, maybe as an example for how to proceed along the lines of as, as we have advocated is the Yuba Accord. And there's a great document and I could provide it to you if it's easier. There's, a, there's an exhibit C as part of the Yuba Accord that at least lays, I don't know if it's the right approach or the wrong approach, but, it, but it's an approach that they used uh, that was tied much closer to serving particular functions to establish a flow schedule. So, thank you. No, thank you.
And I am uh, honored to be at the panel with uh, Mr. Bob Kerr. It, it, I did talk to you about having uh, sharing my time with him. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, before we move on, though, I actually want to echo Chair Marcus's point that these are constructive uh, comments. In your three areas, and I think staff took note of that in those those areas. Um, and then on in your point, I heard you on the alternative methods. You know, the, the unimpaired flow, the idea of the natural, the watershed water account or you know annual budget um, is is within all of that um, in the highly altered system you mentioned that the ISB was looking at alternatives I, I think that we should look at what the ISB discussed and how that relates to the sort of the sliding scale of unimpaired flow that we're talking about uh, so I think that that's helpful in terms of laying out alternatives that are reasonable um, I'm not aware of this, so this is kind of news to me, and I'm interested in knowing more and how they relate and how they are very similar or different. Uh, in the end, if you look at the 1995 Bay Delta Plan now and D1641, it's based on the idea of unimpaired flow. It's just more coarse. Um, and you know, so in all honesty, it's not a new concept. So I, I just think that's constructive. We should look at that. That should be in your, hopefully in your comments, and specifically where you see a reasonable set of alternatives per CEQA and, and how we might cover some areas that maybe unimpaired flow doesn't encapsulate. Thank you. Mr. Bobker. So, you know, aren't you glad you like sat down? Absolutely. Yeah. I feel very relaxed now. <laughs> <laughs> You can set the timer. Ten. Ten. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I, I did. I. I don't mind sharing the uh, dais with John, but I'm not sharing a block of air with him. <laughs> uh, Gary Bobker, program director at the Bay Institute. Um, phase two is critically important. Um, it represents, in my view. Uh, one of the best opportunities, perhaps the best opportunity, to develop comprehensive approaches to protecting the ecosystem of the San Francisco Bay Delta estuary. And that's because it addresses flow, and flow is not a stressor. It is a master variable that interacts with all of the stressors, and much of the science of, of, of behind our understanding of flows is about the interaction between flows and physical habitat and water quality and so many other parameters. So um, that underscores the importance of this process. It is, it is not the only thing, but it is one of the more important and comprehensive attempts to address uh, fish and wildlife beneficial uses. There's a vast record uh, that uh, demonstrates uh, or documents the biological response of native fish and wildlife species to flow conditions, and that documents the physical response of habitats and processes to flow conditions. And the, the staff's um, phase two scientific basis report does a very good job. It's a solid piece of work of uh, summarizing and interpreting that vast record that the board has compiled um, in the 2010 hearings, in the 2012 workshops, in uh, many of the pieces of scientific literature and research that have been entered into the record. Um, we will be submitting written comments that mostly deal with uh, uh, maybe dotting a few I's and crossing a few T's, but uh, so far in our review, the uh, basic work and the approach is pretty, in the report's pretty solid. Um, there are two areas where I think um, there, there needs further work, and this doesn't really mean that the report needs to be redone or anything, but just as we go forward with revising the report and getting it to the SED, they're, consi they're important considerations. The first is that um, the report mostly focuses on the upper estuary, uh, and it certainly touches on a broad range of ecosystem values, not just the, um, the, while it focuses mostly on the response of specific aquatic organisms, uh, you know, it also acknowledges that there are impacts on broader ecosystem values, but generally its consideration stops kind of at the Carquinez Strait. That's, um, that, that's oversimplifying a little bit, but 
but the point is simply that um, you know we have an emerging understanding that uh, the alteration of flow in the system doesn't just affect the delta and Sassoon Bay, that there are ripple effects throughout the entire estuary out to near shore coastal waters. Um, the effect on the salinity field has been significant. Um, the effect on the sediment supply has been significant. The effect on the food webs throughout the bay and coastal waters has been significant. And we really need to consider uh, the benefits that flow provides to all of those uh, ecosystem parameters and the impacts of different flow regimes on those ecosystem parameters as we move forward. That is, is very important. This is um, the, the regulations the board is considering are for the Bay Delta estuary and the bay part of it needs to be considered. Um, can, I, can I interrupt you and ask a question? Of course. Just as, as long as Janine yeah, stops I, the clock. I, I don't ever expect anyone to say no, but I suppose you could. <laughs> don't interrupt what, me. Whatever you say, <laughs> Madam Chairwoman. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I, just as Mr. Rubin was saying, that he felt that through the, the workshops there were things that were um, raised that didn't get mentioned in the scientific basis report and that may or may not have been the place to mention it's not like we're doing response to comments but having uh, it, it, there was a sense of that is is there stuff from the workshops or for or from other things and i'll just forgive me for not remembering everything at all times that you or anybody else has submitted to help link the bay to talk more about the like the lower estuary I always think of the lower as the South Delta, but you're right, the lower part of the estuary is San Francisco Bay that we've we've left out or we should have been looking to in the same way that Mr. Rubin was concerned. I, I don't think that um, there's uh uh, there's been, I, I don't think that there's a, a presentations that were ignored or anything. I think that the implications of flow regimes on the lower part of the estuary have often been discussed sort of as an adjunct or, a, or an add-on to discussions of uh, impacts on the upper estuary. So there's, a, there's a, a, an emphasis issue for one thing. I think also that the science on the lower estuary is uh, emerging. I mean, a lot of this is new. A lot of our understanding is uh, not as well developed as for the upper estuary. I mean, when we look at the upper estuary, um, the discussion of the understanding of causal mechanisms or the emergence of very strong and persistent statistical relationships, uh, it's really evident. Um, when you look at the lower estuary, you know, you you don't have necessarily that the, the same level of data, the same, uh, uh, the signals have to be teased out a little bit more and some of the work hasn't been been done. But nonetheless, the connections are there. Um, the Bay Institute prepared a report called San Francisco Bay, the Freshwater Starved Estuary that released in October, which attempts to identify some of these emerging understandings of the connection of the lower estuary. And we'll be submitting that um, as, uh, uh, as an appendix to our, uh, to our comments. And it identifies much of the literature that, uh, you know, that we based our, uh, our findings on. Right, because that came out and it struck me as the first big thing, because I remember years ago when I was on the Stewardship Council trying to look for something readily and asking people and nobody could point me to things, at least that I could understand. They, there were a lot of, there was, that's why I'm thinking there could be a lot of science data that I don't know, but it, uh, I'm going to look forward to sitting down with John and going over that report. Well, and, and it's important to make the connection to that. Um, you know, if we're going to manage the system adaptively, we have to identify accurately the ecosystem values we're trying to protect. And uh, and this gets to my second point about, which is uh, the second point that I think needs some work is defining the adaptive management regime, because the um, the discussion of adaptive management in the the phase two report. Um, mirrors some benefits, some some good points, and some problems that we've seen in phase one, uh, and that is, on the one hand, uh, the linkage to smart objectives, uh, articulating what it is that what's your desired response, um, and how do you manage adaptively to it is extremely important. And that's why identifying desired responses throughout the entire estuary is an extremely important part of your thinking. Um, also, um, but, but I want to I get to um, some potential problems here, and that is that, you know, we, we've had the discussion about unimpaired flow versus block of water, et cetera. Um, 
there's no question that we do not have perfect knowledge. Uh, we need to respect the uncertainty. And so while, you know, there, there's no doubt that we should have some ability to uh, do flow shifting and sculpting, um, you know, in order to use the best available knowledge to improve uh, the use of the management tools. But we also need to respect the science. And you know, there is this record that establishes not just that flow conditions are important for the desired beneficial uses, um, but that uh, an unimpaired approach uh, has a lot going for it. And so um, we need to set boundaries on what we're going to do with um, uh, an unimpaired approach. Right. Um, the, the ability to sculpt, for instance, within the target desired period within a certain amount uh, of flow, I think is, is probably a really good approach. The ability to shift flows outside of the target period to other times of the year or to subsequent years, I think is opening up um, cans of worms that are very, very dangerous. Um, and so putting some, and I think this reflects some comments I think that were made by uh, NIMPS uh, this morning, that uh, you really need to put a lot more flesh on the adaptive management skeleton, um, you know, before you just sort of bless adaptive management and, you know, hope that it somehow gels through some sort of working group. Uh, and there's a lot of thought that's been offered as to uh, how to define the adaptive management decision-making process. You know, what are the criteria? What are the boundaries? Uh, what are the triggers? to uh, different pathways and the linkage back to the smart objectives. Um, and I, uh, while I don't think that needs to be spelled out in the science, the, the, the phase two report, this is a really key issue that, it, it, you know, that the discussion sort of underlines as a need. I'd like to better understand your last comment. So uh, it sounds like it's more related to phase one because phase one has been, you know, clearly is marked that February through June time frame. But um, maybe if you could elaborate, elaborate a little bit more on uh, your concern about outside the time frame. Well, and my understanding also, oh, oh, also as part of that, um, w what is your thinking about w whether it's unimpaired flow or a block of water. So if if that water is um, set aside uh, for sculpting flows, um, what if it's not used? What, where, where do you put it? And what do you hold on to it for if your focus is it needs to be within, you know, the time frame? Um, well, getting back to phase one, it would be February through June. Well, uh, so, so, so the two issues you're raising, it's not my understanding, and I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong, that uh, the adaptive management uh, use of flow shifting is uh, confined to the February through June period, and then in fact uh, flows would be available to be uh, used at other times of the year. So uh, if I'm wrong, then there's not a problem, but if I'm right, uh, that that is in fact what the proposal is, I think that that is probably not very useful. I mean, you really, you, you could wind up in the situation where you're not using flows very effectively, either during the target period or, or, or elsewhere. And this gets back to my answer. And, and, and the reason why I feel that is, is part, based in part, not totally, but in part, on my answer to the second part of your question, which is um, unimpaired uh, flow versus a block of water. Uh, I, I fall on the first rather than the second. And, and the reason that I say that is it's not an, you know, and, and so Chairwoman Marcus, please don't, you know, yell at me if I'm, if I'm saying unimpaired flow, but unimpaired flow means something. It's not, um, it is a way to mimic natural form in order to support natural function. And the reason that that's important is that, and the, and the problem with a totally functional flow approach, to get to a point I was going to make later, is that there is no question that if we understand causal mechanisms and we can design functional flows, we should do so. However, we do not understand all of the functional needs. And as someone who has negotiated several settlement agreements in the Central Valley watershed, which used functional flow approaches, I can tell you that that was easier to do when you're dealing with one species on one tributary and you're not thinking about a broad array of ecosystem values or downstream needs of the estuary. 
And when you start talking about the Central Valley watershed as a whole or the estuary, then we're really talking about, uh, it's very difficult to tease out, well, we're just going to do functional flows for this fish now and this fish there, and, 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 right. and oh, by the way, what about all these other ecosystem values? So the unimpaired flow approach to me captures much of what we need to accomplish that we can't do with a purely mechanistic approach because it's beyond our capabilities at this point. It is true. Uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with something John said, and that is that w w clearly we, w this is an altered system. <laughs> and so having, you know, uh, doing a f a, a, an unimpaired approach in an altered system means you have to be cognizant of the altered system. But you're not doing unimpaired flows at 100%. Right. Right? <laughs> you're doing unimpaired flows at some percent that you're going to figure out based on a whole bunch of considerations. So to me, the way to temper the unimpaired approach is partly to decide what your, your starting gate and, and range are going to be, uh, depending on you know, all of the considerations you have to look at, which is not the subject of the phase two science report. Um, and you have, to be able, you have to have some ability to sh flow shift. So I think you should set us up, you should say, look, you can shift up to a certain percent. That's different from having a block of water that you can just sort of uh, sculpt any way you want. Oh, and if you don't use it, what do you have to do with it? I, I just don't, I don't think that works very well. So As opposed to just throwing a whole block out there. It, I, I hear you saying you need more, we need more guidance in it that goes towards where the function is. Right. So having, having something where you're saying basically, look, we're looking, you know, antecedent conditions trigger the hydrologic regime that we're going to put in place, um, but we're going to, you know, using our our uh, emerging understanding of how the system responds, we're going to try to shift things in order to uh, either boost benefits or avoid, you know, un uh, unde uh, uh, undesirable uh, impacts. Um, we're going to start out by saying, okay, here's the amount of water, here, here's, here's the percentage that we're going to work with, and here's the amount that you can vary it. And you examine the results and then come up with recommended changes over time. And, and this gets to one, my, my last point on this, which is that, and, and we're getting a little away from the phase two report in this you know, discussion, but um, the, the timing of that is really important because when you talk about adaptive management and flow shifting, you know, the idea that you're going to go through big changes from year to year just doesn't make sense to me. What you really need to do is to implement a regime for a few years, for a three-year or five-year period, and then do an independent review of the responses you get and come up with a pretty well thought out and coherent response that says, okay, for the next three to five years, you know, maybe we're going to do it this way. We're going to we're going to uh, raise or lower the percentage. We're going to change the amount of variability that we're going to allow within that percentage. Uh, you know, there may be timing changes, whatever. But um, basing your overall regime on the results of one year probably is not a great idea. It, what I'm hearing there is the importance of maintaining some integrity with the, the, the unimpaired flow, you know, the timing of when that happens in the watershed and having a real-time management regime that can respond. Uh, you, we talk about shifting and sculpting. Isn't an important word, tri isn't an important word trigger? You know, when, when you have triggers and timing and response, then humans can approach the natural regime. I mean, and when we talk about specifics and timing, is that something that we're looking for in terms of accountability, transparency, expectations, you know, when something happens, this is required. Yeah, I think adaptive management requires you to, um, to identify triggers for decision making. And so that, you know, here's, a, here's an event, either a physical event or a biological response, and you say, okay, that suggests that we should go down this pathway within the, the roads we've built. Um, but, you know, you, you can't, f assume that you know all the triggers, which is one of the reasons why I think that building all of this on the unimpaired flow approach makes sense, because the unimpaired flow approach, by necessity, <laughs> by its very nature, builds in the sort of natural patterns to which uh, triggers occur that, you know, in, 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 in ways and subtleties and nuances that we don't fully understand. Um, 
Right. So I, I think uh, the, the, so, so, so I think I've, I've run through most of my, I've artfully managed to make all my points in responding to your questions um, uh, without hopefully ignoring your questions. Um, the, so the final point I make simply is that, um, you, you know, I, th I think several of you pointed this out and, it, and it's worth repeating and that is that uh, ho however I might, I might agree or disagree with issue, with, with statements or issues that were made by um, Sacramento Valley users or John, um, that, that a number of the issues that were brought up, and maybe this is actually true more of the, of the earlier panel than of John's remarks, but um, uh, don't really address the, the phase two report. Mm -hmm. um, this is about, um, you know, if you're doing balancing, you have to define what the bookend is that is the fish and wildlife beneficial use and what are the flow, what's the information about flow that is associated with that? And you're not making, if you, if you attempt to incorporate balancing within that, you are distorting the information. And I think the staff has done a good job of avoiding doing that. What you do with that information is a totally different thing that we're going to, you know, have we'll some. We'll fight over. I'm <laughs> sure yeah, we're going to have a robust conversation about, but it is not, the, the, the phase two report's not the place to do that. Thank you. No, I, I realize that part of the challenge, and I don't um, um, mean to be arguing, is that people are always going to bring up the thing that they worry about most to make sure that it's heard and make sure that it doesn't um, happen. And sometimes that can get in the way of actually just having a conversation. So we we'll just have to keep finding the small and other large and other fora to be able to do it. One question for you, we talked about it a little bit. You you talked about in your mind your sense of unimpaired flow versus functional, and your I would say your use of the experience in the deals you've been in or sense of a functional flow, if I'm hearing you right, because I'm now trying to understand how many different ways do people hear the phrase. We're going to have to do a glossary, probably going to have to have a long conversation about what do we mean, what don't we mean, so people don't magnify, and we don't. I don't want to overreact, or other people don't overreact. There's obviously a need for... Um, some clarity so that we can get down to having the real, the argument about the real stuff, like, and figuring out where to go, which is hard enough. But you talked about functional flows as targeted to achieve a, a smaller picture. And you made the point, which I think is a, is a good one, and the one that we have to deal with in terms of dealing with those agreements that are out there, which are fabulous, inspiring, and have inspired our whole approach, even if people may not uh, recognize it that are built around a smaller subset, more localized, even if big, and not acknowledging the need for outflow. I mean, I think Tom actually raised it the right way in terms of we have to change our consciousness about thinking about the connection to um, the larger uh, ecosystem because there's the bay itself, but there's also the value of the outflow you know, not just to create a water park for fish, it doesn't work quite that simply, but in transporting things. And and similarly, an interesting point raised earlier, that if you do big flows at the wrong time that aren't in nature, you might actually do some harm. So figuring out how to talk about those two words or coming up with something else. I want to use whatever's based in the scientific literature for what we're talking about, and then we can translate it for people, as Didi suggests. Can, can you just elaborate that on a little bit more? Because there's two different things I'm raising here. One is terminology and how many people automatically go to an assumption that that's what a functional flow is. I could see how that could be. I think of it as here you're approximating nature and then you're going to make it more functional by looking at the specifics where you are, doing other things that make less water do the same or more good because you're doing habitat or hotspot predation control or whatever it is you're doing in a that in a way only folks in a local area can do and the separate issue of it's not just about your trib even though we haven't gone up the tribs before it is about the trib because the fish lives up there it's not just what's happening at vernalis or what's happening at a certain bridge on the sacramento it's it's a both and kind of a thing and the issue of flow affects both of those so two two totally separate issues you can com you t you commented on the second, so if you talk about the first. Well, I think right. um, if I understand um, the there's a hierarchy that was identified by um, the panel of scientists that um, testified in the 2012 workshops, I think, um, 
and it's it's uh, alluded to in the report and in several other places, and that is um, that you know you you should base um, your you know your your management should be based on the science in the order of one understanding of causal mechanisms to uh, correlations that are statistically significant and uh, in the case of the bay delta there are you know strong and persistent uh, correlations over decades of time um, third uh, natural or historically impaired you know un historically relatively unimpaired flow patterns and I think that's kind of what we're talking about here is that um, the, to the extent that we can identify causal mechanisms, then you can um, hopefully develop a flow regime which addresses the stressors in those, you know, that prevent the, ca the causal mechanisms from functioning properly. And, uh, and that is the strongest, it has the strongest scientific basis and it's most likely to be the most effective for the target ecosystem value, which is usually going to be a single uh, species. Um, so it is, I think the way you characterized it is that, you know, it's, it's, it's smaller in a way in scope. And that's kind of the problem here is that, you know, we all, wanted to, we all want these functional flows to address the stressors that prevent causal mechanisms from, from uh, functioning effectively and efficiently. But our ability to do that for a broad array of ecosystem values is limited and is likely always to be. So what you do is uh, there, there's a subset of, of causal mechanisms we understand that you can design functional flows on. There's a much bigger set of persistent and strong correlations that you can use. And then there's the broader patterns of unimpaired or somewhat impaired flows that give you sort of a, a, a basic pattern for the evolutionary life history of aquatic organisms. And so what we're doing is sort of using unimpaired flow as kind of our safety net. And then I think what we want to do is make sure that that unimpaired flow approach is consistent with the kind of responses we see with the correlate with the statistical relationships that we've seen. And that is in fact the way I believe that you set the range, you know, that you set the range and the, and the percentage of your unimpaired flow is on that, that um, uh, is in part on those correlations. And you make them consistent with your understanding of the causal mechanisms and you correct the or modify the unimpaired flow uh, based on your increasing understanding of either of those uh, causal mechanisms or uh, statistical relationships. And over time, you know, maybe that will evolve into something that looks different than unimpaired flow, but at this point, I think unimpaired flow provides that broadest safety net of protection. Is that, is that relevant at all no, to that your was question? Help, that was yeah. a helpful way to take a bunch of stuff and nest it together. No, that was very helpful, thank you. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I have to go back now to Australian 50% science report and figure out how they did that one. I'm not saying that's the guide, but I want to know the framing that they used when they came up with it. But that's helpful, all three, Thanks. putting all three, nesting all three of those into one thing. All right, other questions? Thank you, that was a very helpful conversation. It was good to have you both there. I'm glad that worked out. That's right. All right. We have a, num a number of other uh, speakers who've come to join us, which we really appreciate. Um, I'm going to tell you who everybody is so you can get in, uh, in order or to just uh, anticipate. Uh, we'll set it for three minutes. Um, Jose Setka from East Bay Mud followed by Stephanie Morris from the State Water Contractors, followed by Francis Brewster from the Santa Clara Valley Water District, followed by Michael Warburton, Public Trust Alliance, right? You left the third word out. I knew that that was. But um, out followed by Chris Schutz from CSPA. Hi. Hi. My name is Jose Setka. I'm the Manager of Fisheries and Wildlife for East Bay Mud. Um, and I'm here to talk about the, uh, give some brief comments on the basis report um, and just talking on a few or three overarching points. Um, some of it's already been discussed today. I'm going to kind of 
breeze through those and kind of get to some of the meat of the argument based on what I've heard today. Uh, the first comment just based on available science and data used, um, recognizing that there's been a big gap in time, there's a bunch of new information that we can certainly add and help in terms of refining the uh, science report. And within the report, there's still some old references, dated references uh, prior to our joint settlement agreement that are used to describe the conditions in the McCollum that just mm. don't fit today. So those okay. are some of the comments. That and you'll we'll, send that all in for us, okay. Yep, we'll send, definitely uh, write all that in in written comments. Great. Um, the other aspect involves some of the data that was used to come up with the uh, flow calculations. Um, I gotta read this because I'm not a modeler, so it's my modeling friend, Dr. Bray. Um, the draft report relies extensively on simulated results of unimpaired and impaired or regulated flow comparisons when in many systems, including the McCollumy, gauge data is available. It also appears that the impaired and unimpaired flows are being calculated at different locations. A second comment similar Wait, can you, is- can you, that which two flows are being calculated at different locations? The impaired, the regulated flows and the unimpaired flows um, within the document, it's not clear, it appear, you know, I use the word appears. We need to kind of still work on that and we'll include that in our written comments. Also, uh, we believe a better representation of the existing condition would be to base the comparison on actual measurement data for both the derived unimpaired and the regulated or impaired condition at the same location within the watershed. Um, and moving to the third point, just looking at, you know, successful models to follow. Um, East Bay Mud has had the joint settlement agreement in place since 1998. It's a partnership agreement that involves uh, multiple agencies on the team, also many stakeholders and NGOs. And one of the things that we've worked on is, in, you know, applying adaptive management through both flow and non-flow measures. Flow measures involve things like functional flows and shifting blocks of water um, from one season to another. Uh, non-flow measures include reservoir management, to maintain temperature controls downstream cold water, and also gravel enhancement. The key is looking at ways to measure whether they're effective or not. One of the effective, uh, one of the measurements that's used often is the CVPI doubling goal. For the McCullough River, that goal is 9,300 fish. Currently, we sit at about 8,973. So we're, we're pretty darn close to that. The other aspect is in terms of dealing with adaptive management is having that flexibility this drought has been extremely challenging for many um, systems. On the McCollumy, we had to really, you know, step out of our normal operating window to achieve the goals that we were looking for. During the five years of the drought, in essence, we had over 12,000 salmon come back each year, and even in 2015, which was the most challenging year. To do that, we had to really implement that adaptive management component of the JSA and step away from our normal operating, again, with the help of our partners, Sometimes with the help of you, some of the changes we had to make required state board approval to do. And we were able to effectively do that. So as we move forward with this process, I think it's important to make sure that number one, that flexibility is built into it. I know there's concerns by the agencies, but if we can um, have the right sideboards in place, I, I think we can move forward with that. The second part is to make it clear in terms of the process. You know, right now the JSA is part of the existing Delta plan. How are these voluntary agreements going to be, lack of a better word, approved by the state board? Is it gonna be through that process or some other process to make sure that once we've come to an agreement as a, as a core unit, in our case, it's through the partnership, how are, we going to move, how are we going to move forward with that? And the last aspect is just ask for engagement from board staff with our partnership group, similar to what you saw with the SAC Water and Uber Accord, et cetera. There's a lot of information we have. We can't get it all on paper. What we did during the drought in terms of reservoir management, we're still working on writing all that up because that was a challenge and, and we were successful at it, but we kind of have to go back and say exactly what did we do and how we, we, we accomplish that. And that's it. No, you know. thank you. Thank you for that invitation. And that is true. It's not all it's not all written down. And so thanks for that invitation for staff to come meet with you just as the Calaveras, the East Stockton folks did. That that that's great. And I, I would like to ask Tom. This is not a you. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, 
uh, ask both Tom and Diane, uh, this is not a new request that we participate in processes that are, you know, go on, are, are monthly and quarterly and, and uh, every year. And we really don't always have the staffing a, that is able to do that. And so, um, what do, I mean. I, I would recommend, we can dedicate a day to have staff come down and talk about whatever aspects of it's this plan or some other plan with the folks that are doing the work on the ground. It's not just East Bay Mud, I'm talking about yeah, the partnership. We have our agency partners that participate on a regular basis be there at the table also and kind of go through whatever it is that we're working on or that you're working on mm -hmm. and, and kind of give it our input and see what we can come up with. So, so you're suggesting not being there at, for every single solitary meeting, but ever so often? More than welcome, but <laughs> absolutely. You know, to yeah, have no, some focus it, meetings on speci right. uh, specific topics that you're, you're working on. That it, is that something, uh, Tom or, or Diane, is that something that we can do? Yeah, we're happy to, th that would be great. I mean, that's actually the most efficient way for us to have a kind of detailed discussion on one day. We're happy to go and meet with watershed groups and um, hear from you and have a dialogue with you about what we're thinking and what we're doing and make sure that we understand your watershed well. Um, I know on the modeling front, we're doing a lot of that. We need to kind of go there on the biology front as well. Um, the, the first front was with the modeling work, but uh, yeah, we're absolutely happy to do that and appreciate the offer. Thank you. Thank you. No, appreciate the time, always do. Stephanie Morris, followed by Francis Brewster, followed by Michael Warburton. Hi, Stephanie. Good afternoon. Uh, Stephanie Morris on behalf of the state water contractors, and I'm making these comments for the state water contractors and our 27 member agencies. Uh, the draft report addresses issues that are critically important to California, to our economy, to water users, and to the state water contractors. And we are going to be working with our member agencies and providing detailed technical comments um, by the deadline. But given the short amount of time we have today, I just wanted to highlight a few points. Uh, to us, the state, the purpose of the scientific basis report is to provide the decision makers and the policy makers with the science to inform their decisions to help you carry out your responsibilities ultimately in balancing um, your decision. And we think that this report fails to do that. First and foremost, the report really reads like an advocacy piece, choosing a conclusion and then building a case to support it. Importantly, it fails to incorporate all the available science, all the peer-reviewed and relevant science, and it fails um, in a lot of ways, we think, to discuss scientific uncertainty. And we feel like the scientific uncertainty is important. And I'm not saying that to say we shouldn't act because there is uncertainty. That is certainly not what we're saying. But as a decision maker who has to balance um, a decision and look at uh, all of the aspects, it's important to understand where there is uncertainty, and we just don't think that the report does that. Um, additionally, it seems to be a disconnect and possibly some of the confusion between the proposal and the scientific support provided in the document. And what I'm talking about is that the, this unimpaired flow concept. The actual proposal that's presented uses a percentage of the unimpaired hydrograph as a metric for calculating a pool of water that would be available for adaptive management. And this approach does not match the science used to support it. The report goes on and on and on about natural flows. And however, um, in two important ways, the unimpaired approach doesn't match this natural flow uh, uh, approach. First, um, the adaptive management uh, doesn't, well, I'm, I can't say that there's enough information for us, but it doesn't appear that it would match a natural flow um, hydrograph. And secondly, the unimpaired flow is not representative of actual historic flows in the Delta. And this is something that was presented in the 2012 workshops and um, there's peer reviewed um, scientific uh, basis reports that we, that I'm sorry, that have been published on this very subject and it's not even mentioned at all in this report. So the difference between unimpaired flow um, and and what a, a natural flow in the Delta would have looked like. Give me a, a short form on what you mean. 
Sure. So unimpaired flow is another one of those ones where people use both terms in different ways. So. Well, and that's why I I kind of disagree. I don't think we can call it Bob and Mike at the same right. time. No, I we like have calling to be it talking something. about the same concept. And unimpaired flow, you know, is is a technical. And I think I can blame DWR, and I think they've tried to back off for this as a presenting. It's a modeling tool. Unimpaired flow is you unimpair the dams, and the water just flows out through the system. But the natural um, hyd hydrology isn't that way. And the, the, the peer-reviewed and published reports that are on it talk about how um, what it looked like historically in the delta and what kinds of plants were there and the floodplain habitat so that you're not just releasing the water from the dam and it's just going out to the ocean right. as unimpaired. It actually was moving in a much different way, which is creating habitat, creating food in a very different system. And I think there's a disconnect here. Um, importantly, I think the draft report fails to incorporate the significant review of outside experts, specifically the flow and fisheries in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta by the Delta Independent Science Board in the August 2015, uh, in August 2015, and the workshop on the interior delta flows and related stresses by the Delta Science Program in July 2014. The expert panels provided important guidance regarding the types of literature that should be relied on, as well as the importance of disclosing the uncertainty associated with analyses as part of um, applying, I'm sorry, as part of an application of best statistical practices. The report does not follow this guidance. The report also fails to identify and discuss um, a significant body of science that's relevant to this issue. At the same time, the report references analyses that have not been finalized or peer-reviewed, such as the preliminary summer outflow analysis, analyses that are being discussed in other forms. The report also relies on analyses that um, have, have been specifically criticized by the peer review panel, panel. And I'll just give a, one specific example quickly in my time. Um, the phase two report, uh, draft report, relies on the, the Bay Institute NRDC 2010 analysis um, as evidence to support its results. Specifically, you can see that on page uh, 3-11. But the outflow panel report reviewed and commented on that specific analysis, and the outflow panel used that analysis as an example of poor statistical practices. Um, the outflow panel specifically stated in their report on pages 35 and 36 that the model also provides a direct link between flow and the probability of population growth. On a negative side, we feel the strength of the relationship has been oversold because there is no consideration of uncertainty in model predictions. And the phase two report, while relying on this, fails to um, discuss and address this direct criticism. So. In short, we think that there's a lot of work to do, um, and I, I just really want to emphasize, I'm not saying that the one science paper, I, I don't think that this is supposed to be one is right, one is wrong. It's supposed to give the basis to look at as a decision maker and evaluate what the state of the science is. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can you did you have a citation on the page that um, the outflow uh, report is cited in the Bay Institute's report yes. is cited. What it's, page? It's page 35 to 36 oh, in this report. Okay. And then going back to, um, and, and I I wasn't here in 2012, so maybe it was discussed at, at one of the workshops in 2012, but I think that it merits some additional discussion on what you were, you, you were saying that it does matter if you call it unimpaired flow or something else because of um, the system being a highly altered system. And so could you explain what you mean on a highly altered system compared to a system that's not highly altered? And would you, do you think that unimpaired flow would make more sense in a system that's not highly altered? I think that the, the science reports that, um, and again, with a caveat, I'm an attorney. Mm -hmm. I really should have chosen better in my profession, but, um, uh, the science report that I, the way I read it, the that are cited for um, in your draft document, are are examples of where it works on an, a system that isn't highly altered. And here we have a highly altered system, and it's just not the same. So I and I, I guess there's also a disconnect because you're saying, okay, we're going to use unimpaired flow, but the whole basis is natural flow, and 
we don't, and then you're going to manage it adaptively somehow, which is not entirely clear at this point. So how do we know? Because in this report, it doesn't talk about other stressors, other stressors, and how those are impacted, and doesn't put forth all the si set forth all the science. How can you then decide based on that? I don't think that's a complete picture for you. Right. Okay. And then um, in the delta, I guess what you're saying is since 95% of the habitat is no longer there, it's a channelized system. So a certain amount of volume of water, uh, unimpaired flow or whatever, a, 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 a large amount of water is not going to serve the same function under the current system as it would have served under the historic system. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly it. Sorry, I wasn't very clear. But that could cut both ways, right? It could be you need more water because it's highly watered to replicate the functions. Or, or less. I mean, it could it I think could it goes back to what John said, or Mr. Rubin said, is, you know, it may be more, it may be less. I'm certainly it, not it, standing here. This hearing, here. you can say, John, it's just in the water rights hearing, you have to say, Mr. Yes. <laughs> it could be more, it could be less. It depends on what um, function you're trying to, what function you're trying to do. When you look at some of the projects that we've done, like the one they did last year, where they're flushing water through the Yolo Pie Pass at a certain time to create food, that's a smart use of water. We, right. We're seeing good results. So I mean, that's not necessarily matching a, na a natural hydrograph, but it, it's um, looking at a particular, particular function, saying, we want to look at this issue. Are we creating more food? How are we going to um, measurably see if we meet that objective? And then that's where adaptive management comes in. Yes, that worked. No, that didn't work. Right, right. I mean, there, there's a, a the, the duality of the both and in that, but I, I understand the point. I mean, one of the challenges we have, and somebody in the 90s who I really respected in the Bay Delta work said part of the challenge, and you've identified it in the natural versus um, unimpaired, is your view on this, and it's not just unique to the Bay Delta, but there have been so many alterations at so many different times, um, is it depends on when you think history begins, right? Right, are we and talking then, and project? Each of them is a double-edged sword, no matter when you pick, and our challenge is to figure out what's the most sensible, responsible, reasonable thing to maximize all beneficial uses. And so the more help we get with folks helping us figure out where the best place to do that, the more likely we are to get closer than not. I mean, ultimately, that's that's where you have to go. But before you get there, I think this report, the, the purpose is not to say one way is right, one way is wrong, but at least to identify what the state of the science is and identify the uncertainty so that you have a tool where you can make those decisions in the future. I think that's helpful. And I, yeah. I would just um, ask you, I, I know that um, it's been some time, but I did see a PowerPoint um, that uh, in a meeting that you and I had um, on this issue, and I found it to be helpful. I don't know if I can dig it up, but um, I would suggest that you maybe include that in your comments. It will be included as well as the there's peer review and published um, articles on that exact issue now, so we will include that. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Ms. Brewster, followed by Mr. Warburton, followed by Chris Schutz. Hi. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Marcus, members of the board. My name is Frances Brewster. I'm a senior water resources specialist with the Santa Clara Valley Water District. We are the water resource management agency for Santa Clara County. We provide water supply, flood protection, and environmental stewardship for Silicon Valley and the 1.9 million residents of Santa Clara County. The county relies on water from the Delta for over half of its water supply. And in fact, these imported water supplies pr provide over 90% of the water that we use at our three drinking water treatment plants. The district is aggressively working to reduce its reliance on these imported water sources through an expedited pot potable reuse program and ambitious conservation targets However, water supplies from the Delta watershed will remain a, pretty, a very critical part of our water supply portfolio, which is why we're very interested in these proceedings. <laughs> We've not completed our review of the scientific basis report yet, but believe that the State Board needs a lot more information uh, than what has been provided so far. And there's 
several important and legitimate concerns raised previously by stakeholders, as well as by your own independent experts that still need to be addressed. And I'll talk about a few of those. First, the report mentions that we do not fully understand the mechanisms behind the flow relationships, or at least many of them, but suggests that the relationships themselves are strong enough to proceed. This approach, I think, needs to be reevaluated. We need better information about the mechanisms behind these flow abundance relationships to ensure that the flow that we provide is actually benefiting the target species. We need to know this to minimize impacts to other beneficial uses, and we need to know it so we can assess whether the action is working, and if not, we can adaptively manage it. A second area, the report pre presents many of the flow relationships with far greater confidence than the science merits. It's important to know the level of certainty uh, or confidence limits of the various flow relationships in order to properly balance the beneficial uses. The Delta Science Panel that the State Board commissioned to report on Delta outflows and related stressors also emphasized this point. In order to make an informed decision, the board should be provided with an estimate of the potential magnitude, the level of certainty of expected benefits, as well as the potential costs of, to, to other beneficial uses. And I realize that last piece comes later, but, but you know, the scientific basis report should give you a, a sense of the level of certainty and, and the magnitude of potential benefit that you might be able to get from these flows. Finally, the report needs to reconcile. No, no, you can keep going. I'm sorry, I should have said it at five. The, the report needs to reconcile the functions, the functions that natural or historic flows provide, with the functions that a percent of unimpaired flows in this highly altered system could provide. So I think that's the piece you, you keep asking for clarification on. Natural flows, you know, in the in the historic unaltered system. When we had big rain flows, they would spill out over the landscape, pick up all sorts of nutrients and food that would then slowly drain back into the system. There were some reports back in, in the 2012 workshops that have since been published that talk about, you know, under those natural conditions, outflow was actually pretty similar to what it is today because those flows would slowly drain back into the landscape. If we now need to look, we may not know the the direct relationship between species abundance and flow levels. But if we look at those natural flows, those historic flows under which the species evolved and think about what functions did those flows provide and try to mimic that with the flows going forward, this, what I think people are trying to describe to you as functional flows. So those flows created food. That's one thing that they did. So how can we create more food? And I think, you know, the, the recent um, North Delta food web augmentation that was part of the Delta Smelt Resiliency Strategy is a perfect example of how we can do some really targeted, didn't take a lot of water, but we saw a very strong food signal coming from that action. So in, in conclusion, we urge you to request that your staff provide all of this important information. But we really hope that they'll do so through a really open and transparent process. We have several examples of very successful collaboration now uh, on the science basis, where agency, resource agency staff, regulators, academics, NGOs, and stakeholders are all working together to understand the science and narrow the disagreements, including the CAMP or the Collaborative Adaptive Management process in which I co-chair. We have a wicked problem here. <laughs> But we also have a community of really smart people, many of whom have been thinking about this problem for a very long time. Let's find a way to use all these smart people to find solutions together. Thank you very much. Are other questions before we? Thanks. You know how much time you're putting in, too. Mr. Warburton. And you could set it for five. I'm sorry, I just went to three by default. Um, I originally came here <clears throat> to get some sort of clue uh, if we'd be talking about um, 
Bob, George, or Mike. I'm sorry. I and didn't. I've gotten the idea that the general sense is that everybody should be able to talk about them in whatever names that they want to use. And um, I think it's really, really important that we just assume that whatever science is discussed or adapted is going to be gamed. That's what people have been doing for generations. And to think that it's not going to be gamed is just not worth uh, the time. And another word which is really important in science is credibility. And when you can talk about everything with any name that you want, you want to at least know what sort of bounds uh, are around it. And um, before I uh, started and went to law school, I, uh, I, I was an expert on uncertainty. Uh, I, I wrote a whole book about uncertainty, uh, uncertainty on a Himalayan scale. And it was to give advice to international agencies involved in managing the Himalayas, uh, some thoughts on how to go about doing that. Um, and we decided that a really big part of this is how you're going to manage uncertainty. <laughs> and the thing is that adaptive management has to be explainable to the public. And, and, and the terms and the categories that you're using have to make sense. And there's a lot of progress in science. Um, it's in the area of institutional analysis that um, you know, what's the difference between a problem that contains some uncertainty and structural uncertainty that contains the problem? <laughs> and when you have different people and different interests involved in the same resources, they think about them differently. And you've got to identify when you're talking how you're thinking about something. And um, there's a lot of science in institutions and, um, and how institutions work with scientific uncertainty. And uncertainty isn't just out there. It's actually a positive thing that's created by institutions so that they can be viable. And the way I have experienced this is, well, arguing in front of another commission, the Public Utilities Commission, for seven years now. And um, there's in all these filings, there's, um, there's what's called a statement of facts. And by God, those statements of facts are mutually contradictory. And it doesn't seem to bother anybody. They just don't read them. OK, and you, then you get the impression that, oh, the Public Utilities Com Commission doesn't care about facts, because it's just a section that's in all the filings that's never read or discussed. But that can't be because they put out these things called findings of facts and conclusions at law. And um, if facts don't matter, you can't do those things. And um, I think we can get together here, and but just talk about uncertainty and not just say, oh, we've got this, we've got this, and then we've got uncertainty. The uncertainty has to be part of the discussion. And articulated. And our, yeah, and how we're talking about it. 
And I think that would help. In no, thank you. And I heard science. that a number of times today. It was a good point. Now I want to read that book. <laughs> Mr. Schutz, you're now going to clarify it all for us. Chris Schutz with CSPA. I'll do my best. Um, I'm going to start from the sort of narrow couple of comments about the document and then maybe go back to some of the broader things that I think Mr. Bobker did a really good job of articulating and expand on those. First, um, I think that the, the report is, is comprehensive and it is trying to be comprehensive and that's one of its merits. It's looking at the whole system. Um, the one part that I see missing from this and phase one is Friant. I don't see it in there. And, and we keep, that's, that's the child that we keep proposing to get to someday, but always seems to get lost. And so um, you know, we've got exports, we've got flow, uh, hydrodynamics in the delta, we have delta cross channel gates operation, we have inflow, we have outflow, we have a lot of those pieces that we're gonna get picked up, east side streams, but Fryan isn't in there. So I think that's something you need to figure out where that's gonna go in this whole framework. Um, the citations and the documentation in the document I think are very good. Um, I was pleased to see some of the really older material. Um, I realize the value of newer as well and there's a lot of new citations in there. But for example, the, the, the documents from Romberg talking about flows within the bay that, that was sort of submitted and came up during the Delta flow criteria report. I think that's some of uh, that process. I think that's some of the place that you can look for um, for more information as well as the more recent document from the Bay Institute. Um, you need more nodes on the Sacramento in my opinion. Um, you've identified Benbridge and Freeport as two places where you look at the hydrology in chapter two. I think you need to add Keswick and some place upstream of the feather. I would suggest um, Wilkins Slough as probably having the most historic gauge data because that's gonna be important. Those things are gonna be important in helping you all make decisions. Um, it's important to understand how much of the flow at Bend Bridge is unregulated flow. It's also important to understand how much of the flow at Freeport is coming in from the Feather, the Yuba, and the American, and therefore how much is coming out in that stretch between Ben Bridge and Verona. Um, going to some of the more general issues, I think one of the things in talking about functional flows, that tends to get confused with as being the same as something having a direct effect or a direct impact that you can see on a one-to-one -one basis. And I think part of the, the understanding sometimes of some people when they're talking about it is that um, if you don't have some kind of direct effect, and I think Chair Marcus was sort of referring to this and also board member Moore, then it, it's, people will even say that it's not science. And that just isn't right. Um, and, and Mr. Bob Kerr, I think, did a really good job of explaining some of the um, the, the, the unknown parts of function, and he also did a good job of, of saying that, that we, it, there are, when you're dealing with multiple places and you're looking, it's hard to just say, we wanna have something that's functional at point A or point B for species A or species B. Um, you can't just do that, and this systemic approach um, which is captured with unimpaired flow is really an important thing. I tend to come down maybe even more on the side of unimpaired flow than Mr. Bobker. Um, uh, I wouldn't call it so much a safety net as, as something that really captures a lot of functions that, um, that are really important in the overall system. Um, one of the things that, that I think people have ignored um, in terms of that flow is there isn't much habitat left. A lot of that habitat left is its Sassoon Marsh and getting fish to that habitat is a really important function of outflow. Um, 
Yeah, we started the day on that in the staff presentation, and then it hasn't come up in terms of that connection. Right. I do agree somewhat with Ms. Morris that when that that the report describes all these reasons that a natural type of or unimpaired flow regime is good, and then it moves away rather quickly from that um, from that approach. When I read the Delta Flow Criteria report in 2010, the thing that keeps coming up, one of the key themes that keeps getting lost, in my opinion, is variability. And that just goes away when you start engineering blocks of flows. I, I come to that not only as a person who's been studying hydrology for 15 years, but as someone who's been a fisherman for close to 60 years, and recognizing that things change day by day on rivers and it's important to capture those. I do think that the unimpaired approach, when you get down to times of scarcity, probably has less value, both because the function is not as great and at that point, you're, di you're, you're basically competing with different uses. Um, and, and so, if, if you're going to modify the approach, I wouldn't do it through an adaptive management approach. I would do it through setting some kinds of limits um, in your proposal as a starting point uh, with, uh, of getting to the more, well, we need this to get fish out of the system, we need this to make sure there's enough rearing habitat, those more direct effects that you know about, and that tend to become more important, frankly, at at specific flows. You're not really trying, in many cases, to do a great job with fish. You're trying to avoid um, crisis. And, and so I will recommend more of this in the phase one process. Um, we have a number of comments related to specific issues on this report that we'll be submitting. Um, mostly they go to places where you've generalized and we might have slightly different views about some of those generalizations or slightly more uh, specific comments or, or thoughts about some of those things. But overall, we thought the job, uh, the, uh, the report does a pretty good job of, of characterizing the scientific basis. So That's helpful. Thank you. I, I have one question. It, okay, did I hear it correctly that instead of using a block of water, you would, uh, your preferred approach would be to identify the things y you want to get done, like moving a fish through to Suisun Marsh or whatever. Is that Actually right? Actually not. Actually oh. more on the lines of mimicking the unimpaired flow and operating to the unimpaired flow. Um, and that's an operational problem, and you have to be able to define how to do that. And I completely respect the uh, operators who are going, how am I going to do that? And I think you have some responsibility to articulate it. But um, I think that that um, capturing that is going to give you a lot of benefits. And and then again, every system, every river, and every development on every river has its issues. On the Yuba, you can't release a lot of water between a certain level and a certain level until you get spill on Anglebright. So you have to figure out a way to do the best you can and try to work within the constraints of the system. In some cases, you may need to make facilities modifications, but in other cases, that's just not reasonable. And, and so you have to operate within the constraints of what you have and try to do as well as you can. So everything has its challenges. I do think that at, to a certain point, you all have the responsibility to try to articulate how you would actually achieve what you're proposing to do. Well, yeah, and on that point, I thought you brought up two good points for us to think about on, on the variability. That has come up in the phase one hearings. You know, and, and it relates to my points about trigger and real-time management and your point about you know human limitations and operations and mimicking those spiky um, natural hydrographs. So that'll be an ongoing issue for us, you know, to try to draw bounds around. So I appreciate that. And but what I heard, uh, Board Member Spivey Weber, was I think a pretty constructive suggestion, 
which was, you know, when I bring the engineer mind frame, you know, we, when we specify pumps, we have operational ranges. What I was hearing was the unimpaired flow concept may have an operational range, and in critical or dry years or both, or super critical conditions, there may be a, a reason to divert from uh, strict unimpaired flow to determine a block volume of water and to go into a management mode that's very targeted and strategic and tributary specific about getting fish out, getting rearing, critical rearing habitat for that particular tributary, uh, you know, specific needs that the locals know about. Um, am I hearing that right? That that's the concept, and I think that's the right one. Um, and I think that that's the point at which adaptive management actually has a lot of value because you're really down to the nitty gritty. And it's a way better way to do business than to have me come up and, and harangue you all during the TUCP processes um, and, and have things done on an ad hoc basis every year. Right. It's better to set up a framework, um, know who is going to administer the framework, have enough buy-in to make it credible, and um, go forward with that. And, and unless you get into something that's really, really a problem, and then um, stick with it. Um, and, and I think that, that the unimpaired system, is my personal opinion, tends to fall apart when you have sequential, when you have drought sequences. And, and we've heard a lot of folks say, well, we can't do it ever because in, during drought sequences it falls apart. No, I don't agree with that. But, but you need to make special provisions and they need to be thoughtful for those drought sequences. Right. Agreed. Thanks. Very helpful. All right. Um, what? That was helpful. Thank you. All of it. So a lot to think about. Are there? We've asked questions, or I, you know, I do think there are things. Hopefully, you all found this valuable too. I think we got a lot of good insight both into what we should consider in preparing the draft further for the for the review, but also it. it substantively, but also in terms of how to explain things, but also a f fair amount of follow-up in terms of sitting down and talking with people to at least be sure we're talking about the same things as opposed to talking past each other, which is always the case, but I think more so here than in not anything, but many things. So the, it's particularly helpful later in the day. Um, comments from folks now in addition to what? You've already said, or we have our homework to go back. I, yeah, I have a a whole list of questions, but we can we can sleep on that, distill it, and then just uh, talk. Is there anything that you all would want to add before we close today? Just to say thank you again for all of the valuable input to the extent people raised um, issues with analyses that we should be considering. Please be sure to provide us the references to those and the sources um, so that we have those and we can take a look at those and and, uh, and shoot us an email if you'd like to meet and discuss in more detail and we'll be happy to sit down with you and talk about specific issues. It's a helpful conversation point with more to come. All right, do we have a closed session on the agenda? Do we have a closed session? I didn't think we did today. All right. Is it worth reminding folks of next steps um, in the phase two process? Sure, next steps again, <laughs> comment. It's very funny as a bookend. We said it like 14 times at the opening. So yeah, go ahead. So comments due December 16th. Um, then we are expecting the uh, Delta Independent Science Board comments uh, at the beginning of the year. We're gonna fold in all the comments that we've received and produce a revised draft that we will submit for peer review, hopefully sometime this winter, a more refined draft that responds to those peer review comments, all of the other comments we've received will then be part of our staff report um, environmental document package that we release for public review this, we're planning on this summer. Um, and that's, that's, that's about it for next steps. We have a lot to do. We do, but this conversation will make it better. 
All right, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>